If you click this video out of morbid curiosity about the length, yes, it is real. I want to get the length argument out of the way first because unlike the original episodic format slowly boiling the Kaguti, here I'm asking for your time up front. Nobody is going to watch a video this long. It always amazes me when people complain about videos being too long when people are perfectly willing to review bomb the second season of The Boys because it didn't come out in an 8 hour bingeable format. I have actual objective evidence of people sitting through at least 6 hours of this in one sitting as its original rough series. They didn't even subscribe, which I thought was weird because part 7 wasn't out yet, but that's their prerogative. I have a limited amount of time before the average person clicks off, so I'll just say this. YouTube rolled out an actually useful feature that they'll probably depreciate in two years' time for no good reason where you can see the sections of the video you're watching. And this video isn't just one long stream of consciousness from beginning to end. I put a lot of effort into building a balanced structure so instead of one really long video it's more like a bunch of shorter videos put together. These serve as places to stop and take breaks should you decide to watch the visual aspect of this video and that brings up another thing. I have a timestamp on screen currently which will take you to the part of this introduction where I actually start talking about the game. In case you're already sold on watching this and you want to skip the parts that are just about the video itself. This is the only time I do this and that's because with videos like this I tend to listen to them while I work more so than actually watch them. And it can be really annoying to be told to click a timestamp because it means alt tabbing back into my browser or pulling out my phone and it's usually gone by then. I made this entire analysis with the thought in mind that more people are going to listen to it in the background than actually watch it. As such, it's fairly light on visual editing and a lot of work has gone into making it a balanced audio experience so you don't have to mess with the volume slider. It was also written to rely on as few visual examples as possible, but they're still present if you decide to watch. These examples include written versions of names due to Vardenfell being full of people such as Hilarin Ramoran, a Radoran counselor residing in Aldruin and Lord of Nisus. The other main type of visual examples are item descriptions and character sheets, all of which have been sourced from the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, which is objectively the greatest wiki to ever exist for a game. Okay, well, the video is only long because you are an unskilled writer and or are dragging it out for a watch time. Oh man, you got me there. I actually wrote in my first draft of this introduction over a year ago that I believed that there was a certain degree of inefficiency in my work, that my enthusiasm for the game was blinding me to certain flaws in my script. I no longer believe this to be the case. Since I wrote those words, I've gone through an extensive redrafting process. Before I would record parts, I would read through the 20 to 30 pages of a script and work on it. Then even as I was recording, I was reworking the script, adding better examples and cutting fat. When I sat down in my editing software, I would often realize or fact-check information, and even then I kept a list of topics I didn't cover and points of improvement for the series. This was all on top of, again, an exceptionally sturdy outline that originated before I even started playing the game as nine index cards on a whiteboard planning out my general playthrough, and later imported into the software Plotter. Plotter was intended to be used by authors for the purposes of planning out novels. Well, the scripts ended up being novel length, so fair enough. Then, when the original seven-part run was done, I sat down and watched it again, taking even more notes and making even more improvements. This is all a rather roundabout way of saying that the level of quality assurance in this video would be a massive surprise to current Bethesda administration. There. There's your buggy Bethesda game joke. So no, I'm not dragging this one out. Then how could the video possibly be so long? Because Morrowind is an exceptionally complex game, because I clocked 107 hours as someone who routinely plays the game just in the initial playthrough. Because another reviewer, Lore Runner, spent 28 hours doing a comprehensive live stream presentation on the game, and while I disagree with some of the points he made, I have to genuinely respect the planning and presentation that went into that series. It can show how much of an ordeal it can be to cover the game if you're doing anything above surface level observations. Now that we're done talking about the video itself, let's begin addressing some common arguments that are made during discussions of Morrowind to help save some time in the comments section. Skyrim slash Oblivion is better. The world is bigger. And so much easier to lose time in. Of the three Howard games, Morrowind is the smallest in terms of land area. However, Vardenfell's design is so much more complex than Cyrodiil's or even Skyrim's. Which isn't a criticism of the game per se, more so an observation in the geographic difference between temperate forest and volcanic wasteland. Bethesda also had fewer employees when they were designing Morrowind and it was their first time doing a handcrafted open world. 
As to the latter games being easier to lose time in, that argument is hit and miss. Steam would back that claim up until you remember most of my time spent in Morrowind was either on my physical copy or, more recently, in OpenMW which doesn't log hours on Steam like Skyrim will. And well, is losing time really an argument of quality in the current year, given the number of games released that are effectively Skinner boxes designed to keep you playing in the hope that you'll shell out a little extra cash for microtransactions? A lot of people have lost time in Candy Crush, and I don't exactly see that game making a lot of people's top 10 GOAT lists. That said, the point of this series is not to rag on the later games. Much. I do occasionally point out when Bethesda made an idea better or worse in the later games, but this video is squarely focused on Morrowind. Daggerfall was better. Morrowind diluted the formula down. Well, contrary to what it may seem, I'm not against games changing, just against games getting worse and concepts being unexplored. Morrowind did take the series in a different direction, and that direction left the Daggerfall fans behind. If you hold this opinion, then it should please you to know that you share it with Douglas Goodall, the man responsible for writing the bulk of the game's quests. You could make the argument that Oblivion did the same thing, that this is justice, but honestly Oblivion is just a more accessible and poorer quality version of Morrowind, whereas Morrowind was a largely different product entirely to Daggerfall. It is a shame you don't see more games like Daggerfall, considering the advances in procedural generation, and I wish Peterson, LeFay, and Lakshman the best of luck with the Wayward Realms. You are just being nostalgious. These are just the memories of a six-year-old boy who hasn't played the game in a long time. When I was six, I was playing Doom, Harry Potter, and Jedi Outcast 2. In that order. I played Morrowind when I was older. In fact, I played Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim for the first time all within a five-year time period of each other. Also, I'm actually providing evidence to my points, not just a bunch of subjective anecdotes. But, hey, do you really want me to prove that this isn't just nostalgia? Fine. I'll play what is objectively the worst version of Morrowind in order to prove how good this game is. I will play the 360 version. Yes, Morrowind came out on the original Xbox back in 2003, then when Microsoft made the big backwards compatibility push they released an emulated version of the game onto the 360. It actually plays worse than the original Xbox copy since emulating the OG Xbox is weird like that. No quick saving, no godly user interface, played on a controller with a low draw distance, low frames, and in 4x3. I'll be putting some tasteful custom banner ads to fill these black bars. Why do this to myself? because that's how good this game is. If I can enjoy this, you can enjoy all the luxuries of a vanilla PC copy. Well, mostly vanilla. Play an open MW unless you're an absolute purist. And I genuinely recommend you don't go crazy with mods your first time. Speaking of. If you mod Skyrim and Oblivion, you can make those games better than Morrowind. Yeah, wow, a modded copy of Skyrim might be better than a vanilla copy of Morrowind. Consider me awestruck. And if you work really hard in Unity, you could theoretically make a game even better than all three. I know I just recommended using a quasi-mod to play Morrowind, but that mostly falls in the realm of what I consider acceptable as a reviewer in terms of modifications. I use mods to fix convenience issues with games, especially older ones. Where I draw a hard line is at mods that try and change the design philosophy of a game. Like for instance, I would never use a mod that changes the hit chance of weapons because hit chance is a part of Morrowind's design. It's inappropriate to judge games based on the modded experience, especially since you could just as easily make an experience worse with mods, considering the hassle involved in keeping mods for Bethesda games cooperative with one another. And this is besides the fact that I don't even need mods to enjoy Morrowind. Skyrim? Well, I'll need the unofficial patch and script extender, of course, then alternate start to skip the long tutorial, sky UI to fix the UI, ordinator to fix the stack. What even is patrician tier anyways? You are useful, Strombot, because you ask all the questions I need you to. I consider patrician tier to either be exceptional games in all categories, or exceedingly excel in specialized categories. Gameplay, story, sound, aesthetic design, world building, and everything specialized therein. Patrician tier isn't a 10 out of 10, however. They aren't 99s either, since many patrician games usually have flaws that prevent them from being perfect. They are good games that tried something new or did something established better than the norm that deserved to be commemorated, studied, and emulated. Honestly, my hope is that one day someone makes a true sequel to Morrowind. I don't want to say it's the greatest game of all time, I want to say that it paved the way to a generation of great games that learned lessons from it. But I can't say that. So with all that to do done, let's get started.
Morrowind is an open world game, and the world of Vardenfell is just as much a character in this story as any other, if not more so. Morrowind is, however, deceptive in its name, perhaps as is tradition in the Elder Scrolls series where Arena was anything but, Daggerfall was just a city and a whole country, Oblivion was a dungeon, and Skyrim wasn't an Elder Scrolls game. Oh, that's clever, that's very clever. The broader province of Morrowind has been stripped away and the focus has been placed on the island of Vardenfell. Although unlike Arena, this time the lack of a name change is probably down to the fact that Morrowind is a better game name than Vardenfell. There's a certain love video games have for islands. They are areas where invisible walls do not need to exist, where there is no boundary or limitation that players will hit while exploring. Vardenfell as a game world is tight. Strip back the view distance or look at any map and realize that just over the crest of any hill is a rapid change in scenery. You can go from low-level civilization to high-level volcanic nightmare areas in less than a few hundred meters, but the terrain of Vardenfell is its greatest asset. I have seen some theories made on this before, that the slow movement speed, plus the low view distance, makes Vardenfell feel bigger than it actually is. Well, the slow movement speed isn't always the case, and one of the more common modifications I see people using strips back the view distance limit, so I don't think there is merit in this argument. No, the reason Vardenfell feels like a big place, despite its small size, is that there isn't any wasted space. Ever play a game where you land on a planet that's procedurally generated and it's like any other spot on that planet? You quickly realize that the area isn't actually that big because the entirety of the planet can be summarized in that one spot. You can't go in any direction for very long without eventually running into something, and oftentimes that something may be related to another quest line you aren't actively doing. It's interesting to play one character in Pass a Ruin, only to get a quest to visit it on the next character. It's this compacted level design that makes Morrowind feel larger than it really is, not the illusion of movement speed. The Bitter Coast region is the first region that new players will start in. As such, it's occupied by what are generally the weakest creatures on Vardenfell, like mud crabs, quama foragers, and scribs. It's a swamp alongside the island's southwest coast, and its geography has not been conducive to the construction of settlements. There are three towns in the region, Sidonin, Hala'od, and Narmak. Sidonin is the starting town, which we'll go into more detail later. Hala'od and Narmak are both fishing villages with diverse populations of outlanders an affectionate term for non-Dunmer not native to Vardenfell. They're also both hubs for smuggling activity on the island, given that Vardenfell is currently under a quarantine for the blight and corpus disease. This smuggling activity is reflected in the region, with many caves being occupied by smugglers. The swampy soil have not stopped Daedra worshippers from building ruins in the area, although the fate of Boethia's long-lost shrine is an indicator of these ruins' futures. North of the Bitter Coast, the West Gash forms a shelf along Vardenfell's northwestern shores. It's a maze of ravines and jagged terrain, the lack of farms in the area suggesting the land is not as fertile as other regions. This region is host to towns such as Nisus, Kool, and Aldvalathi, operating as trade hubs between traders from the coast and Ashlanders from the interior of the island. The area is home to many outcast Ashlander bandits, and its proximity to the channel that leads towards Skyrim means a fair few of the structures on the coastline seem to be built more militaristically, a sign of the prior wars between the Nords, Dunmer, and Kymer during the days when the land was named Res Dane. It makes sense, then, that the factions that primarily operate here are more militaristic in nature, with the Imperial Legion recruiting a Nisus while House Redoran protects its settlements, and the Tribunal Temple keeps the roads safe for pilgrims from predators like Nixhounds and Kaguti. Naturally, a part of Vardenfell's volcanic ecosystem are the fertile lowlands at the base of Red Mountain. The Oscadian Isles forms a breadbasket that supplies the island. This is one of many things I appreciate about Morrowind, the fact that it painstakingly shows where the region's food supply comes from. And it isn't just the odd farm. Large-scale plantations operate in the area, such as the Dren Plantation. Khajiit and Argonian slaves working the field is a common sight in the area. It should be no surprise, then, that the abolitionists keep their headquarters in this region. The region is populous with giant mushrooms providing shade and peaceful netches can often be seen floating around, as well as the odd guar grazing in the area. The region's host a Pelagiad, on the road from Sidonin to Balmora. It appears to have originally operated as a way station for Imperials to travel from their dock to Moon Moth Legion Fort, and further into the interior of the island from there. Pelagiad now, however, is a community of farmers and traders capitalizing on a popular route. 
Saran borders the edge of the Isles in Malaga Moor. It's a walled city of Halau affiliation. Saran is notably the home of a pleasure house and serves as a launch pad for excursions into the ash wastes to the east. Opposite Saran, Ebenhart sits as the head of government operations in Vardenfell, housing representatives from the Great Houses and the Duke Vadem Dren, and of course across the water from Ebenhart, the great city of Vivek, home to the titular god of the tribunal. The eastern shore of Vardenfell is Azura's coast. Its name likely attributed to the open shrine to Azura at its apex. Owing to its treacherous terrain, the coast is scarcely populated. It's a series of small islands and reefs with a guarantee that the odd island large enough to host life will host life. Since Vardenfell's waters are plagued with slaughterfish and drow, navigating the area by swimming can be dangerous. This appeals to the isolationists in Telvanni who leverage the region's dangerous nature to protect them. As the Telvani once said condescendingly, you can fly, can't you? The Zafirbel Bay is an often forgotten region of Morrowind, as its geography is fairly similar to Azura's coast. I actually forgot this area in my first draft, and the only reason you're hearing about it now is because both the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages and the Elder Scrolls fandom wiki do not consider it to be an actual region distinct from Azura's coast. Well, it's marked on the physical game of the year map with the same text that all the other regions are. Running along the eastern shores of Vardenfell, the bay is primarily occupied by the Telvanni with settlements at Sadrith Mora, Tel Mora, and Tel Arun. The Grayslands form the northeastern shore of Vardenfell. Despite their fertility, the area remains in the hands of two separate major Ashlander tribes, the Zainab and the Ehumesa. While one of the younger Telvanni lords has taken up residence along the coast at Tel Vos. The Grayslands are bordered to the west by a perfect north to south mountain range along the Foyada, a geographic feature formed by lava flows during the eruptions of Red Mountain. The area claims the largest diversity in wildlife, with a range from Nix Hounds and Guar to Elite and Kaguti. The area also has more dangerous residents, with Daedra openly wandering the surface as there isn't really anyone here to stop them. The lack of access to the region is reflected in its ruins, with sparse Chimer, Dwimmer, and Daedric areas. And filling out the final shore of Vardenfell, the northern shore of the island is restricted by an archipelago named Sheogorad. These are the backwaters of the region, a remote area with little value claimed by few people. Its only settlement at Dagon Fell being a community of the miserable. The land is difficult to farm, and the waters are rough to fish. There is little of value for lawful residents, making the region a haven for the various sects of Daedra worshippers that inhabit it. And speaking of undesirable areas, the Ashlands. Existing in the shadow of the volcano, the Ashlands are in a perpetual state of being covered in fresh coats of ash. Since the land is not particularly valuable, it is primarily home to the Ashlanders whom subsist in it. Bordering the Ashlands is Aldrun, capital of the Great House Redoran, forced on the retreat through years of trouble until their backs were up against the Red Mountain. What lives in the Ashlands? Daedra and their worshippers, vampires and their thralls, Sixth House cultists, necromancers, the undead, rogue members of House Telvanni. The Ashlands are really a home to anyone uncommon enough to be able to survive in an area where food doesn't grow, where sea access is limited, where trade routes change constantly due to ash storms, and where everyone is in a constant state of warfare with everyone else over what resources do exist. And this goes doubly so for Malagamore. Malagamore is all of those aspects that made the Ashlands untenable if the Ashlands also happened to be a giant maze network full of lava pools that was even farther from civilization. If the people lived in the Ashlands because it was remote and isolated, but still close enough to civilization to buy their groceries, people live in Malagamur because they outright hate civilization. That's likely why it has been named after the Daedric Prince Moleg Ball. Malagamur sits between the Ascadian Isles and the Grayslands. There's only one settlement here, Molag Mar, which exists solely for pilgrims to prepare for pilgrimages up to Mount Cand. It's a dangerous area only for the bravest, aka highest level characters. Red Mountain is Malagamore, but vertical, full of monsters, fenced off from the rest of Vardenfell by a giant wall, the Ghost Fence, and constantly in the midst of a giant blight storm. What's a blight storm? It's an ash storm that spreads blight. 
The area is full of sixth house cultists and corpus beasts, with the primary structures in the region being Dwimmer. Red Mountain is, thusly, the most dangerous of the regions. I have ordered the regions of Vardenfell in order of how terrible they are to be in. Naturally, the last of these regions is Vivek itself. Vivek is a large city, separated into nine cantons. The Foreign Quarter, Halau, Redoran, Telvani, the Arena, St. Olmes, St. Delvin, the Temple, and the Palace of Vivek. These cantons are then separated by bridges from one another. These cantons are large structures with multiple layers. Atop them is a plaza, usually host to manors and wealthy businesses. Below that is the Waste Works, with more average businesses and commoners, and below that, a Canal Works, with services like the Temple or Tombs, and finally sewers, full of criminals. Vivek is unpleasant for several reasons. The first is that its large scale, at the time it came out on PC, and to this day on Xbox, posed a technical challenge for the game, which is surprising considering it's just a series of static cantons with the complicated parts going on inside the city itself. Barring the framerate issues, there are still problems. The interiors of the cantons can only be reached from the second level. This means you need to run up to the giant ramps just to get inside. You didn't have to run around to the outside of the second level to reach the plaza, or in the case of the foreign quarters, around the canton, up another ramp, around the canton again, and then up to the plaza. Worse still, while the core four cantons, Redoran, Arena, and the two saint cantons are connected at the second level, the foreign quarter, Halau, and Telvani are not. To travel between these cantons, you need to go all the way to the bottom to cross. Some cantons are connected via a gondola system, however these gondolas only connect the lower levels of the cantons. So assuming you arrive at Vivek to go to Halau Canton, via boat or strider, you arrive at the northernmost point of the city, have to run around the foreign quarter bottom, cross a bridge onto Redoran, run around it, cross another bridge onto Halau, and then run up the ramp and either enter the waste works, or run around the second level and enter the plaza. The words I'm looking for here are wasted space. You may have noticed if you were looking that the exteriors of Vivek are not ornamented. Seeing NPCs on the outside of the cantons are rare, and there are no market stalls. In fact, it can be difficult to tell at any point in Vivek where the hell you even are. This is only natural. Like I said, the city barely runs on the Xbox and barely ran back on the day in PC. I have a sneaking suspicion the plazas were originally intended to be exterior cells, but had to be closed up due to performance issues. God bless if you decide you want to use the merchant services in Vivek. There's no advantage over just going to the people you know outside the city. Most of them are oddly poor, they have a limited selection, and it's hard to just stop and go, I want to go to the Alchemist, and figure out where the nearest one is even supposed to be. Like, in Balmora, where's the Alchemist? Probably near all the other businesses. In Aldruin, where's the Alchemist? Probably near all the other businesses. In Vivek, where's an Alchemist? Maybe it's in the Waste Works. Maybe it's in the Canal Works. Maybe it's in the plaza. Maybe it's in another canton. This isn't just an issue of me not knowing the city, it's an issue of the city being poorly laid out. And everything looks the same. Since everything is made out of the same adobe material, the principal colors of Vivek are brown and orange interiors, with dark brown exteriors. While most of the game uses the same principle of using cookie cutter pieces together to build interiors, nowhere did I feel the downsides of that design philosophy more than Vivek. Is this the studio apartment of a down-on-his-luck gay popper, or is it the secret hideout of the head of an, a criminal organization? So you know, the NPCs just play coy like, tee hee, don't worry player, we get lost too. Like, that's the excuse of a defeated designer. It's not funny or cute when the end result is such a dreadful city, and if it was known at Bethesda that Vivek was such a terrible end result, of what was an ambitious idea, then why are there still so many quests that entail navigating it? It's a shame too, between Vivek and the Imperial City over in Oblivion, I think Bethesda became scared of trying to create large cities. So they went the inverse in Skyrim and had its capital be smaller than Balmora. To that I say, big cities don't need to be full of ornamented symmetry or repetitive architectural design, which create most of the problems people have with playing in them. Most big historical cities were chaotic messes that were poorly planned out. Create a capital city like that, instead of assuming the city planners of Tamriel share such clear, common values. Part of what makes Vardenfell feel alien is the unique wildlife inhabiting the island. Trade in your standard wolves and bears for a land full of strange creatures. To start, we have a host of two-legged creatures. Gwar are the beast of burden of Vardenfell, operating as pack animals. 
Wild Guar are fairly rare, probably because they have canonically lost fights with mud crabs. Elites and Kaguti, on the other hand, are not domestic animals. Elites are omnivores, foraging alone while Kaguti are pack hunters, plaguing the roads. And speaking of plagues, Vardenfell is full of large rats carrying the diseases endemic to the region, split into common and blight. Okay, fine. Cliff racers. Everyone loves the meme. It's a perfect combination of factors, from the sound they make, the fact that they're surprisingly hardy and can do a lot more damage than you would think, and that they live in every region across the map. I believe the idea was that cliff racers were meant to be an enemy for players bypassing the roads with levitation and flying over mountains, hence their hardiness. But they weren't tuned right and ended up harassing every passing traveler in startling numbers. But I don't think they're bad enemies, largely because they're one of the few creatures that it isn't a waste of time to hunt. Their plumes are both valuable and light, whereas most creatures either drop hides or meat that are both heavy and almost worthless. It's actually surprising to me how worthless it is to hunt creatures outside of their applications in alchemy, which is admittedly one of my weak points. Cliff racers having a valuable drop means I'm never really mad when I get attacked by a flock because I'll always be walking away just a little bit richer. Honestly, I find random animals stopping me from resting more annoying than cliff racers, since cliff racers at least make themselves fairly obvious to find. This leads into Vardenfell's other resident flying creatures, Neches. Basically just flying jellyfish, their friendly nature means you don't really have to fight a whole lot of them, although there is the odd quest to do so. This leads into the aquatic creatures. Mud crabs and slaughterfish will be nothing new to Elder Scrolls regulars, although they may be surprised by how big the mud crabs of Vardenfell are. Especially the dead mud crab whose shell makes up the capital of House Redoran. Slaughterfish are the common aquatic nuisance, not really posing much of a threat even at low levels and with high numbers. Drow, on the other hand, pose a substantial threat when underwater, which is fitting given their mysterious nature. Drow are the true descendants of Aldmeris but they can be soul-trapped, so more likely they're just Daedra LARPing as water elves. Shock are giant fire beetles, which are always worth fighting because they're guaranteed to drop their valuable resin. Lastly, Nyx Hounds are large insects that feast on blood and are fairly easy to beat. Morrowind's OST was composed by Jeremy Soule, who has had an interesting career in the game industry. Did you know that Morrowind's OST lost an award to a Medal of Honor game? We've been listening to Morrowind's soundtrack in the background and it creates a great ambiance, but after 100 hours of play Morrowind, I have had to turn it off. The soundtrack is divided into two sections, explore tracks and battle tracks. This is honestly the best way to refer to them. See. When Morrowind's Collector's Edition came out, the soundtrack was remastered complete with new titles for all the tracks. Most people know this song as Nerevar Rising. Well, it was originally titled Call of Magic. Hmm... How about this one? It's called The Road Most Traveled, or MX underscore Explore underscore 3. Or, as it was originally titled, Main Theme. No, I'm not sure why the Explore tracks are MX underscore Explore, but the Battle tracks are MW space Battle, and yes, Battle Track 6 is missing. Did you know that Explore 7 was named the ending theme? I have a theory, and this isn't based on anything real, that Morrowind's OST was probably a slap job that was later reformatted into a more functional soundtrack after Morrowind didn't flop on release. I say this based on some context that will become apparent later in this video about Bethesda's financial state during Morrowind's development. Now to be clear, this isn't to say it's poorly composed, just that Jeremy Soule composed it and then sent Bethesda the files and let them format the soundtrack hence the strange names and odd formatting. I mean, one of the song's names is Trick Suspense. Then when Morrowinds was successful and people were buying the soundtrack, Soul quickly realized this and came in with some much needed name changes. Not that it matters anyways, since I'm sure the average person who knows this soundtrack probably knows the Dragonborn version. Onto the soundtrack proper. Call of Magic is fairly well known since elements of it were later lifted for Skyrim's theme.
handle the exploration tracks first. Dark Cavern sounds nothing like a dark cavern. Peace at Last has a defining melody. The main theme, confusing, right? This part has always stood out to me. Separation features a beautiful string piece, which is fitting given the elvish setting. While there are guar skin drums, and you will be hearing drums in the battle themes, the explore themes give that proper feeling of exploring a world much older than you are by letting the rhythm of the player's footsteps as they adventure serve as the percussion instead. Rise to reality thus starts with a dominant horn piece. It would be interesting to know how much Jeremy Soule knew about Morrowind at the time he was composing the soundtrack, because while it would be nice to say this is a theme for the Imperials, I can't. Love Lost shows how well the soundtrack flips between a couple instruments to an orchestra and back again. This element to the soundtrack is important because what you are hearing can't be allowed to overpower what you're seeing. Morrowind's music sounds magical because each chord is leading you through the progression like a road going through a hilly countryside. This is the reason I didn't use music from the ESL Morrowind soundtrack, because this song is called Escadian Idol. And you can say, well, that's taking it out of context. Okay, here's some more. The word idol, I mean, you could probably guess what it means, but if you can, it means peaceful, picturesque. Every time we get peaceful, the composer takes another 50 milligrams of Ritalin and shoves another layer into the song. The theme isn't allowed to sit with the player before we're pushing in another complex idea. You're overworking it. You're trying to make a movie score for a video game. Sorry, I literally got off track. Ending theme has this playful little part. That persists through the song. I 
I don't get what about the song made them title it Indian Theme. So we go on to the battle themes, which the game switches to whenever an AI detects the player. Interestingly, Desperation features a reprise of the main theme of the game. Unity, which is an odd name for a battle theme, is the answer to Rise to Reality. You like horns? Well, horns are the sound of battle. Traveling fanfare is fairly similar to the previous two tracks. It should be stated that Morrowind was very primitive in terms of how it incorporated music, as Bethesda didn't use any adaptive music solutions, instead opting to switch which mp3 file is playing contingent on whether the player is in combat. So if a fight lasts longer than two minutes, then you need to play another combat mp3, meaning there's a lot less room to change things up between songs. Which makes choices made interesting because it ends with a fade out, which can leave an awkward silence in the music. Still a good piece though. Trick Suspense has probably the most aggressive percussive piece of the soundtrack. Break the Cycle is the seventh battle track, which should upset your brain. It actually has a fitting title due to this section. That's almost a reprieve of an exploration theme in the midst of a battle track, but it doesn't last. Forever There was retitled Drum Beats of the Dunmer for a good reason, because I can imagine the banging of the Ashlander guar skin drums in the background. This leads into the game's special tracks. Introduction plays during a beginning cutscene, which makes it unusual to listen to without hearing Azura's voice. Darkened Depths play during another cutscene later in the game. and the Prophecy Fulfills played at the end of the main quest. They don't really add anything, they just serve a utility function. Finally, there's a short piece that plays every time you level up.
There's also a death track in- No, please, it's not my fault! Now that the world has been introduced, we can talk about transportation. There is no simple one-click fast travel option in Morrowind, which was in fact the exception since the games before and after rely on it. In the case of Daggerfall, because the world was so large. In the case of Oblivion, because Bethesda was afraid kids on the Xbox would get bored. Instead, transportation becomes a major concern in the world of Vardenfell. Every quest, once received, requires the simple thought process. How do I get there? What do I need to get there? And what will I need once I'm there to avoid needing to come back before I'm done? So let's introduce some of the ways of getting around quickly. Silt Striders are the first pillar of Morrowind's transit system. They are large insects with hollowed out shells that are ridden inside. They fill the bulk of the transportation needs from the West Gash through the Bitter Coast and into the Ascadian Isles, ranging as far as the northern village of Cool down to Malagmar. While you ride in game time passes, usually only a couple hours, and it counts as resting time, the Caravaneers can serve as information hubs for the areas you arrive in. They have an independent disposition to their local factions, meaning you can't alienate them accidentally. Boats are the second pillar of Morrowind's transportation system, circling the entire island and hitting all major fishing villages and ports, save Sidonine, the boat system is robust, but is also time consuming and expensive to boot. Still, some remote areas like Dagon Fell can only be reached via boat, and most of the Telvanni settlements are connected only by boat. Like the Caravaneers, the ship's captains are independent of faction affiliation. The Mage's Guild serves as the third pillar. In five cities, a mage will facilitate instantaneous transportation. These cities include each Great House capital, Balmora, Aldruin, and Sadrith Mora, as well as Vivek and Caldera. While robust, they do carry a downside. The Mage's Guild, as a faction, can be influenced by membership and deeds in other factions, and can be alienated into higher prices or even denial of service. To give an example, House Telvanni and the Mage's Guild are at odds, and membership in House Telvanni may require you bribe, admire, or charm the guild guides into providing services again. Since transportation is instant, you also don't regenerate health or magicka, which is another downside. That said, the Mage's Guild is the only fast travel service in Caldera, and also can bypass several boat trips when heading out towards Sadrith Mora. The fourth pillar of transportation, teleportation magic. The mysticism skill, may it rest in peace, had a few handy spells that were actually really important, even to non-spellcasters. The first two are Almsavi and Divine Intervention. These spells teleport you to the nearest shrine of their relevant god, Almsavi to tribunal temples and Divine to imperial shrines. Now, while the nature of the spell sounds like it should be reserved for emergencies, it shouldn't. Once business is finished and you are townward bound, interventions get you back to civilization quick. On the western half of the map, Omsavis are better. Divines tend to take you to Moonmoth and Buckmoth forts, which, while near Balmora and Aldrun respectively, both those towns have their own tribunal temples. On the flip side, divine intervention is very useful when operating in the eastern side of the map, since it can be used to quickly get to Wolverine Hall in Sagerth Mora, and from there, basically anywhere on the map. These spells are also available in scroll form, and even as amulets, for those who can't muster up the skill to cast the actual spells themselves. However, the stars of the show are Mark and Recall. Mark, when cast, sets a marker where you're standing, Recall then teleports you to that marker. This greatly expands your options since you can mark stuff like merchants, quest givers, or master trainers, and quickly return to them. Propylons are a neat idea, but in execution are only really a reward for the sort of people that read the wiki or who install the Master Propylon Index plugin. We will be discussing the Master Index plugin in more detail in a couple hours when we discuss all of the downloadable content. Each Dunmer Stronghold has a Propylon Chamber with two teleporters. If you have the index that corresponds with the teleporter, you can use it to travel to the next stronghold. The strongholds form a loop, but if you are missing any of the indexes, then you're forced to stop. The indexes, however, are rare. And I suppose the original idea was that they would serve as both a reward for long-term players, but also an option for vampires and criminals to get around. 
The index's locations are rather obscure. Only a few of my characters I played for this video ever actually found an index. The most one character found was two. The Master Propylon Index converts a Mage's Guild NPC into a quest giver who will point you in the right direction for all 10 indexes, and as a reward, will give you a Master Index. This turns Caldera into its own hub where you can go to any stronghold. However, this itself is only circumstantially useful. If you need quick access to one of the Ashlander tribes or a fast way out of a remote area back to civilization, I guess. Okay, now this is a tangent, but in the Dawnguard expansion in the Forgotten Vale, there were these teleporters that could quickly teleport you around the area, but you needed to unlock them. Now I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. Maybe Bethesda will go back to incorporating diegetic fast travel. Then Fallout 4 came out and basically killed that notion. Travel in Morrowind is itself interesting. It's not just running or walking around an area to go do stuff. Along the way, you can encounter unexpected quests, like lost pilgrims or naked Nords that have been tricked by witches, etc. You'll have to contend with monsters, like cliff racers, or unexpected contractions of diseases from cliff racers, or even just taking the time to explore a dungeon of cliff racers you find along the way. How you get there takes a good deal of planning. If you are tasked to go from Balmora to Ald Velothi, you could just walk out the door and start hiking. Or you could stop, take the guild guide to Aldrun, then Strider to Cool, and walk a much shorter distance. I think you can get most anywhere in about 10 minutes provided you know how to take advantage of the fast travel. There are exceptions of course, like the Ashlands or Malagamore, but most of the time this rings true. So why do I consider this superior to a fast travel system, if in the end fast travel is more convenient and lets me get to the meaty action faster? I will tell you in story form. I was contracted to take care of a bounty. He'd been spotted near Telmora, but this was old information. I find out in Talmora that his hideout is in a remote part of Sheogorad, so I now need to plan to go up there. I need water walking and cure disease potions, I need to decide if I should pay boat fare to come to Dagon Fell, or if I should go there from Talmora. After a short hike, I'm at the spot, only the bandits are not. The cave itself leads into an ancestral tomb inside which is a vampire. This is not an enemy I'm prepared to fight, but from my perspective, it's possible that my target is behind the vampire, and so I need to fight her. This is a tough fight, and the tension builds as I know that while going back to town is a possibility, that would entail preparing and performing the journey all over again. I could set a mark, but then I would lose the remote master trainer I have it set to. Even though I can save at any time, that doesn't lessen the tension any because it just means I'll either be wasting my time walking back up or wasting my time save scumming until I kill her. Let's compare this situation with Oblivion or Skyrim. First of all, it's very rare that I would be put in a situation where I wouldn't be able to attrite an enemy down anyways. But assuming this isn't the case and the enemy poses enough of a threat that I need to return to town, it's as easy as one button click. Then when I'm ready, I can instantly be back at the dungeon, because not only can I teleport back to town effortlessly, I can teleport to anywhere on the map as well. Any tension that is created as a consequence of having to repeat a journey is lost because at any time, I can just fast travel to safety. Further, tension can't be built up in the first place because I could have just fast traveled up to a nearby point on my first trip up there. This also applies to housing and quest givers. What's the point of carefully selecting a place to live out of if, at the end of the day, I can instantly fast travel there? What's the point of planning how I do my quests so I can complete multiple objectives while in the same region if I can always just fast travel to my objectives instantly? It's not even like in Daggerfall where there are time limits on quests, making the act of losing time a consequence in of itself. The world is always willing to wait for you. Oh, a hermit living in the middle of nowhere is the only person who can train you in marksman past skill level 70? Well come on stupid, just use a nearby cave as a fast travel point to get to him. I could go on, but I think I've illustrated my point. Diegetic travel systems in Morrowind helped Vardenfell feel like a real world because you understand how it was that people get around. I'm not demonstrating my mastery of the systems as some Freudian way of self-admitting that I secretly long for fast travel. I'm demonstrating it because I want you to understand that this is a game that rewards you for learning how to navigate in this space effectively. Travel is an unspoken part of every single quest we'll be doing in Morrowind. Before, during, and after every single story point, I will be making decisions related to travel that I won't be telling you about, but will play a part of the story. Editing can cut out what is otherwise a massive part of the roleplaying experience of Morrowind, hence why it deserves its own section up front and center.
This is where they want you. Head down to the dock and I'll show you to the census office. Dedicating an entire section of one of these parts to a single town may seem somewhat unnecessary, as though I'm artificially padding out the length of the video. However, in this case I'm only doing it because of all my playthroughs, they have this one point in common, Saida Neen. The game starts simple enough, with a cutscene of Azura hinting at the plot, and then you awake to a shirtless man asking if you're okay and acquiring your name. After this, you're led onto the top deck, where a guard asks where you're from, selecting your race and customizing your character along certain preset faces and hairstyles. You're then led inside, where you're processed. You're first asked about class, where you can fill out a questionnaire, select from a list, or create your own. You then select your birth sign, are shown your character sheet, and asked to confirm the information, before being given documents and sent onwards. In the next room, you're given the option of swinging a free iron dagger around his practice. Craftier players can loot the place, or even use the lockpick on the table to unlock the chest filled with a small amount of gold. Outside, you're told to take a magic ring out of a barrel, introducing magic. Once inside the final room, you're introduced to dialogue. Dialogue in Morrowind is almost entirely text-based. Beyond the odd quest, most NPCs have a stock vocal greeting based on race and disposition, but 99% of the dialogue is performed in this window. Morrowind is a lot of reading, and I know that bothers some people, particularly the people that play while sitting on a couch with their brains turned off. I think if you're committed to watching the series, you probably are not this sort of person. Now, I know reading can be difficult, but believe it or not, there are some good reasons it is superior. Dialogue is split into topics. You can then ask about a topic, and the NPC will elaborate on it. Wait, did you say that text-based dialogue is superior? Well, that can't be true. Well, it is, and here's why. First of all, text-based dialogue is friendlier to a low-budget game. Modern Elder Scrolls may be a top-dollar production, but back when Morrowind was coming out, it was a risk that Bethesda took to save the company from an eternity of producing shovelware title after Battlespire and Redguard underperformed. And although it looks like a lot, it really isn't. 400 words is just over 3 minutes of speech. For instance, since I started talking about this tutorial, I have said about 400 words. I believe most people see a disparity between how long it takes to read the written word versus listen to it. I can't knock listening versus reading entirely, considering you are listening to my words, not reading them. But while you may look at the dialogue on screen and say, yeah, fuck all that, consider that something that is written is not limited by the reality of it being spoken aloud. In fact, a great deal of the strengths presented in Morrowind's storylines owe themselves to the detailed explanations one can receive. I can't help but think that Morrowind is impossible to remaster for the simple fact that Bethesda would have to change so much just to make the dialogue all fit on any hard drive made by man, because naturally something Bethesda would try to do in a Morrowind remaster is voice acting. However, there is another reason, and it has to do with logistics. It is not just a coincidence that stuff like directions to the quest location disappeared around the same time voice acting came about. Oblivion's voice acting was a nightmare for Bethesda because it meant that everything had to be written with the idea in mind that it had to be spoken aloud, saved, and take up file space. So no longer could you have quest givers explaining how to get to a spot because they likely couldn't afford much more than the bare essentials when it came to voice acting. Quest markers were as much a consequence of laziness on the part of players as it was a consequence of laziness on the part of Bethesda. This was one of the reasons I was horrified at the prospect of player voice actors in Fallout 4. Not because being spoken for bothers me, but because it meant that there had to be a severe limitation on what the player could now say. I mean, Bethesda's developed games hardly ever provided more than four options in dialogue, but now they really couldn't if it meant paying a voice actor for the extra words. Just as I said that 400 words was three minutes, 400 words of written dialogue was now three minutes of voice actor pay, assuming they didn't flub up the lines in the process. You can't afford to have voice actors talk about the latest rumors or little secrets or advice or give directions to somewhere specific, or someone in particular, or casually elaborate on topics because that costs money, and that is money that could be spent on hiring expensive voice actors for set-piece quests. Once outside into Sidonine proper, we're given a small stipend and directions to go to Caius Casati's house in Balmora. Now, of course, you could just beeline it there, the silk strider in town goes straight there for much less than we got, but let's talk about short form tutorials. There are two kinds of tutorials, long form and short form. A long form tutorial gradually introduces all the mechanics, how they work, and makes sure that there is nothing that can surprise the player because the developer is afraid they won't see it, they won't engage with it. Short form is then naturally less insulting. 
Morrowind's tutorial does not take you aside and teach you about magic, because not all characters are going to use it. Likewise, it doesn't force you to use security because some players might see stealing as a bad thing. When it introduces the plot elements, it doesn't have a dragon swoop down from the sky to save you from an execution. It just tells you, hey, the Empire is releasing you on parole provided you complete these conditions that can be easily ignored. It doesn't have the Emperor get assassinated by Mehrun's Dagon cultist as he hands you the amulet that is protecting the world from invasion by demons with the instruction to find a priest at a priory and help him find his illegitimate son. It's just like, explore this port town and get used to how things work. And it does so in a way that isn't going to hurt you in the long run. Sidonine has barely anything to do with anything after you leave town, so hurt feelings get left behind. Speaking with people, you can meet Fargoth, who mentions he lost his ring. Sure enough, the one you found is his. And returning it to him gives you a disposition booth with both him and the town trader, netting better prices. While at the trader, you can meet a Nord who wants to collect Fargoth's debt, who tells you you can watch from the watchtower to see where his hiding spot is. Then you can take the money and leave. This teaches some good lessons. It teaches you that doing good things in the world, even for unimportant people, can get you bonuses. It also teaches you that sometimes, the best quest reward is the one you don't turn in. Another quest inside Anin starts after you find a body in the swamp. Turns out it's a local tax collector. If you're honest and turn in the money he was carrying, you'll be tasked with solving the murder. If not, you keep the money, but end up with a net lower reward. Asking around, you find out the tax collector was in a relationship with a lady in the lighthouse who says that he got in a fight with a guy and asks you bring her ring back. You can confront him and he will admit it, giving you a choice. Kill him and get paid, or spare him and get nothing. And the choice is yours. Then, should you kill him, you get the ring. But remember, sometimes the best reward is the one you don't turn in. You can leave Sidonine with over 1500 gold provided you do things right. Quests teach lessons, while introducing ideas in a safe manner that isn't going to affect your faction reputation down the line. Sidonine is the second best tutorial I've played in an RPG. To me, it can be a fast affair done quickly before I get into the meat of what I really want to do, or it can be done slowly by a new player learning the ropes of the world. As for the best, well, it rhymes with Spudgrings. Getting to Balmora can be done three ways. Go north and follow the river, go south and go by Pelagiad, or take the Silt Strider. Each one has its own benefits. The Silt Strider is the fastest, but costs money. North can lead you by some valuable loot. South can take you by some interesting quests. Once in Balmora, you'll be directed to the Corner Club to learn where Kaios Kasadis lives. In there, you'll be told about certain opportunities that will come up in Part 3. And finally, once you meet Kasadis, he says those golden words. Go out on your own. Look for freelance work or trouble. Then, when you're ready, come back, and I'll have orders for you. For open world games, this is such a simple thing that is so often forgotten. In so many of these games, I wonder, when am I supposed to actually engage with the world? Because so often they drag us quest to mission with the utmost of urgency. I'm the sort of person to do what is the most urgent matter first, you know, a reasonable person. And so often I can burn through an entire game before looking back and realizing, hey, wait a second, when was I supposed to actually engage with the world? So, word of advice. If you're making an open world game and put some measure of effort into making the world interesting, please give people an opportunity to step off the train and play tourist for a little while. Let's talk about character creation, since I went through it seven different times. Both for Morrowind and in general, really, I see lots of people spend tons of time agonizing over every detail of character creation and worrying if they have created the perfect character or if they need to stop. Just stop. Here's how you create a character in Morrowind. Step 1. Create your character. Step 2. Find problems. Step 3. Recreate the character, having addressed the issues. For example, if you think your movement speed is too slow, take the birth sign the steed that makes you faster. If you think your character is too fragile, reconsider your race. If you find out you like maces and not swords, set blunt as one of your skills. Just identify a problem you have and see if you can fix it. Morrowind's intro is so short it can be redone fairly quickly. In fact, if you already know what you're going to do, you can be out in the world adventuring in a matter of minutes. And it's not the end of the world if a character isn't perfect either. If you decide later down the road you want to use a different skill, all it costs is money to train that skill up to a usable level, and there is plenty of opportunity to make money in Morrowind. Morrowind has 10 races that you can play as. Each race has certain specialties and weaknesses, and these can vary from gender to the gender as well. 
For elves, there are Altmer, Bosmer, Dunmer, and Orsimer. Altmer are mages, Bosmer are thieves, Orsimer are fighters, Dunmer are a bit of a mix of everything. You can be iconoclastic, making an Altmer barbarian or an orc wizard, and you will experience some short-term difficulties, but nothing that kills it in the long term. For men, there are Bretons, Imperials, Nords, and Redguards. But Redguards aren't actually at more in dis- Shut up. Bretons are good at magic, Nords and Redguards are good at fighting, Imperials are good at conning people, not quite the RPG triangle, but then again Morrowind was more about accurately reflecting these people to the lore and their cultures than it was about balance. Lastly, there are two beast races, Argonians and Khajiit. Races are distinguished in a few ways. Attributes change to favor certain specializations with certain races, and some magic-oriented races get a bonus to their overall magicka pool. Races also see bonuses to certain skills again relevant to their specialization. So a Bosmer who selects Marksman as a major, or Khajiit with a major in Acrobatics, or Redguard with a major in Longsword, will all have the highest of net relevant skill at the start of the game. There are also resistances to consider. Some races claim a substantial resistance to disease. Others see resistance to spell effects. Using fire on a Dunmer, or frost on a Nord, doesn't work because logically they come from those climates. Altmer, on the other hand, boasts a substantial weakness to certain kinds of magic rather than a resistance. Another factor to consider is disposition. Members of the same race as you will have a slightly higher disposition towards you. Remember that the average person is a Dunmer, and you can see certain advantages in playing one. Gender can also be a factor. Your attributes can differ based on gender, although it tends to be balanced so you're actually just trading one attribute for another with the counterpart sex. There are also certain quests that go differently based on gender, but I don't think there are any quests that differ outcomes based on race. Each race has abilities catered towards their specialization. Imperials have an ability that makes them more persuasive, while orcs and redguards have abilities that help them fight. Simple stuff like that. I usually forget they were there by the end of a playthrough. So yeah, one simple way of making a decent character would be syncing their choice in race and class to what makes sense, like, you know, orc wizard. Birth signs are another part of character creation. This is basically a mix of the starter gift and modifier idea from past games. Originally, I was gonna spend a few minutes listing all the signs, but it was kinda dry and boring, so I'll just highlight a few. The steed makes you run faster, the warrior and the lover can boost your chances with hit chance, the mage, apprentice, and atronach increase your amount of magicka with increasing downsides the more magicka you get, you'll do better in conversations with the lady, and with the ritual you'll get a massive daily healing power. Which sign is objectively the best? Well, the Atronach is a bit broken, and I'll demonstrate why later. It's honestly hard to say because all of them, besides the Atronach, become very circumstantial in usefulness past level 5. Morrowind isn't the sort of game that makes later playstyles impossible due to early bad decision making. Bad decision making mostly just impacts how quickly you'll reach the inevitable power threshold, not whether or not you'll cross it. But if you are somebody who has a serious stigma against Morrowind because it's too slow or you dislike hit chance, there are baked in solutions to the problem to help you out. So I did the little survey that tells you which class to play and I got Monk. Sounds about right. The survey is a personality test that tallies your responses and compares them with the stereotypes of the class, so fighting heavy responses get fighting heavy classes. But since it's mostly moral choices, I don't really put too much stock in it. You can also pick from a list of presets and, I mean, the classes are going to operate about how they sound, but you have to think about it. Like if you pick knight, you have to use the weapons knights would use, or you're in for a rough time. This is why the class creator is the best option. Although it's also obviously the option that requires a bit of knowledge about the- No, no, it doesn't require knowledge about the game. If you want to use swords, put Longblade in the major skill box. All skill names operate basically at face value. Specialization corresponds to the three archetypes of RPGs giving skill buffs in those fields. Attributes are again fairly self-explanatory. You don't really need to understand the nuances of how the skills and attributes work to craft a functional class that will work for you, provided you stick to the skills you select or train the new skills you have at a trainer. But I will give some handy advice. First off, Always take Speechcraft and Mercantile. This is because these two skills will be useful regardless of playstyle in the completion of quests and acquisition of wealth. With 8 skills left, I generally have a hard time picking enough skills per playstyle. No, really. 
Endurance is handy in generating some extra health per level early, and personality can help with the early game gold grind. The rest of the attributes will raise up as you level, and they aren't really a concern from any other standpoint. So I hope you see that creating a character isn't really a big deal in Morrowind. In fact, because the great houses are exclusive to one another, to see all the content you have to play multiple characters, barring that one glitch that lets you join two houses. New game is a prevalent option in the main menu at all times because Elder Scrolls is meant to mirror your tabletop gaming experience where you don't just stick with the one character. Unlike the later games, which were made literally with the design philosophy of avoiding players feeling the need to restart because of the character they created, which is absurd. Because even if you make a bad character, it's not at the end of the world in Morrowind. There's training and a difficulty slider. If you've made it this far, and you feel tempted to play Morrowind, I can give you three template characters that will make the game fairly easy for new players. Each template follows one of the three archetypes. The first is a warrior who uses the most common weapon and armor, with a long blade of 50 and an agility of 65. As long as you use a sword, you'll be able to hit monsters and with a strength of 50, do some decent damage. Endurance and personality have also been selected to help with gains and conversation. The second is mage. Again, endurance and personality have been picked over intelligence and willpower, resulting in a smaller magicka pool, but also a less fragile character. With bases touched in all the early game magical skills, this class shouldn't have issues in the early game with casting magic. Breton, plus the apprentice, gives you a large pool of magicka to work with. The third is a thief. Focus has been put into marksman and light armor. This is the most fragile of the three, but an agility of 75 and a marksman of 50 means that you aren't going to miss shots with a bow, and short blade has been selected as a backup weapon. Sneak and illusion are also selected to make stealth-oriented playstyles work. Playing outside of these archetypes is easily possible, but I recommend playing inside them for your first time just to get a handle on how skills work before trying anything crazy like orc wizard. I will say up front that thievery-oriented playthroughs tend to be my least favorite when it comes to Morrowind, partially because a little bit of thievery is expected in all playthroughs, and a little bit because thievery just doesn't quite work right. Despite that, both my Thieves Guild and my House Hulagu characters actually ranked as my more favorite playthroughs that I did for this series. Steals your wallet, a Khajiit thief, took his stipend, and figured the only real goal worthy of life was the acquisition of cash cash money. Up front, Steals Your Wallet is a bit distinguished from the other characters, as a beast race. Or, as we say in 2019, as a furry. Khajiit better than lizard. In particular, I find it funny that since all characters start with shoes, and furries can't wear shoes, that Steals Your Wallet came to Vardenfell with one of his few possessions, being a pair of common shoes he can't wear. This isn't the only limitation placed on furries and scalies, however. Another is the inability to wear closed masked helmets, due to the structural limitations of the Khajiit and Argonian faces. Perhaps a note on beast races is the fact that Vardenfell has institutional slavery. Although outlawed in the Empire, Vardenfell and the broader province of Morrowind were never actually conquered by Tiber Septum, instead signing an armistice. A great many things were holdover of the pre-Empire Morrowind as a consequence. One of these was slavery. Now while technically any race can be enslaved, including native Dunmer, the ones you'll generally see being used for slave labor are the two beast races. I should note that it is impossible to be enslaved, unless you spend time in an Imperial Corrections and Rehabilitation Center. There is an abolitionist questline, and you are able to free most slaves you encounter. While there are sometimes different quest paths based on your character's gender, it does not seem to matter much your character's race. You can join and become a leader in most xenophobic factions as an Argonian. Steals your wallet, true to his name, enlisted with the Thieves' Guild. Now, while other, later games would establish the Thieves' Guild as an ancient establishment, Vardenfell is quite different. As I said earlier, Morrowind was not conquered, and so the Imperial Thieves' Guild has only recently entered the scene on Vardenfell. Now, what is the function of a Thieves' Guild in Imperial society? After all, what government could support the existence of a faction devoted to crime? Well, generally, the Thieves' Guild operates within certain rule sets to only really bother those with excess, not the broader public. They serve as a watchdog against other, less nuanced criminal organizations. And of course, they pass on profits to imperial authorities in the form of bribe money. 
Vardenfeld's local criminal organization is the Kamanatong. I've heard them described as a mafia-esque organization. I would say the Kamanatong is closer to a cartel. Mafias tend to operate on crimes like protection rackets, extortion, and blackmail. Like the Thieves' Guild, whereas cartels operate on smuggling, corruption, monopoly, and robbery, the Tong is also politically motivated against Outlanders and the Empire, and, curiously enough, forms the backbone of the Imperial-aligned House Halau. So while the early quests of the Thieves' Guild will have you performing general contract crime, later quests typically involve taking steps to protect the Guild from the Kamana Tong and uncover intrigue that can be used against them. Crime in the Elder Scrolls has largely been unchanged since Morrowind, probably the greatest of later games changes being that each county would have its own bounty and witnesses could be bribed or killed. The first of crimes is theft. What are you doing? The value of your bounty being established by the value of the item stolen. So for example, an early game quest involves stealing a Redoran Master Helmet from Minor Erebar of House Redoran. A Redoran Master Helmet is worth 3,000 gold. If I were to walk up and take the helmet, I would receive a 3,000 gold bounty. Ah, uh, another pointy-eared king of... It is worth noting that murder is a 1,000 gold bounty, meaning that I am now as wanted as a serial killer, with just one crime. It is actually considered less of a crime for me to murder Minor Erebar and his guard and just take the helmet with zero witnesses than it is to just grab the helmet and run away. Theft translating value into the bounty isn't always consistent, however. At one point, I stole a soul gem worth over 50,000 gold, but did not get a 50,000 gold bounty. That crime spree did end up at a 19,000 gold bounty overall after looting an enchanted merchant and an alchemy merchant of all their valuables. So how does one get rid of a bounty? The obvious way is to just pay it off. Turning yourself in can even get you a lessened price, usually around 10% off, and worth noting as a guard is charging to arrest you, it is possible to spam the dialogue prompt and have it count as turning yourself in. However, you aren't often able to sell items for their full value, so if you steal a 100 gold item, you get paid 50 gold for it, and then have to pay off a 90 gold bounty, you have clearly lost money. One perk of the Thieves' Guild are certain NPCs who can make bounties go away, at a cost of half the value of the bounty. Constantly resolving bounties this way does eat into your profits quite heavily, so it is better to steal stuff and not be detected. I simply say all this as a way of assuaging the idea that you need to constantly save scum and avoid bounties at all costs, like the later games. In part, this is because every guard in 5 miles will not attempt to arrest you for bounties under 1,000 gold. Stop. For some other crimes, there's trespassing, which is actually not trespassing like the other games, but just trying to break into an area. As long as you aren't caught breaking in, you're free to hang out in people's houses. I would like to add in editing that since interior NPCs generally don't move around as a rule, shopkeepers who have merchandise around a corner will often have a guard in their shop watching said merchandise. This was a quirk notable of Balmora, Pelagiad, and Caldera. I don't recall many instances outside of those areas using this technique to detect crime. Other shopkeepers would just keep all their merchandise in view of them. The problem with this, which gets into the early game exposure to crime, is that you have an immediate response if you try to steal from these shops, and I don't really think the town would appreciate one of its merchants getting a full-time town guard dedicated to preventing theft because the merchant was too lazy to watch their stuff. Sleeping in an owned bed is a fun one, especially when you do it accidentally trying to pick up something off the bed. Stop. You violated the law. Pickpocketing has a lot of nuance in how it gets counted as a crime, but do not worry because steals your wallet will never successfully pick a pocket in his entire career. And neither will you. Because of a mistake in the code, the skill checks for pickpocket are so punishing that there is only a 56% chance maximum of successfully picking a pocket. And that is only when you're at a high skill level. Value plays a heavy factor as well, so certain gold values are impossible to pickpocket. Pickpockets never really worked in Elder Scrolls. In reality, it's generally seen as a low-level crime, but is so reliably caught at low levels in-game that I would think most people would just avoid pickpocketing entirely, beyond the odd gimmick here or there like reverse pickpocketing. So while Oblivion onwards would fix the odds of a pickpocket, they also made the penalties for pickpockets so high in the form of hyperactive guards stop, stop, as to stop. make the venture completely unworthwhile for low-level criminals, but worth a laugh for high-level ones, which is just bass action. Backwards. I'll get into the other two crimes of assault and murder later. For now, let's talk about some Thieves' Guild quests. 
Balmora is the logical place for most players to embark on their careers in the Imperial Guilds, being the first town they're sent to after all. The player is even directed to ask at the corner club the Thieves Guild hides in for directions to Kasadi's house. The first three quests of the Balmora Thieves Guild rather elegantly display some of Morrowind's problems with thievery, however, and very quickly, I might add. The first quest of the Balmora Thieves Guild is to steal a diamond from Nalkeria of Whitehaven, the local alchemist who is quite wealthy. As the first quest of the Thieves Guild, this is quite a challenging proposition for new players, as the diamonds in question are directly in front of her. Now, some people are going to say some usual arguments for how these quests should be done, generally involving magic. I ask you then how new players to Morrowind fresh off the boat are supposed to figure these things out for this quest. The reality is that this quest is a trap, and teaches important lessons that work for the rest of the game. The first lesson is that quest givers generally do not care that you specifically give them what they ask for. A diamond is still a diamond to Habasi, she does not need a specific diamond. And the second lesson is that purchasing a diamond from Nalkaria is a perfectly acceptable solution for the quest. Worth noting, and this is something I'm learning as of now, there are diamonds upstairs above her bed in a locked chest. This information is not relayed to the player, and while it is my fault for not exploring, plenty of people have fallen for the trap that is this quest. Me personally, I just purchased them while selling contraband I stole from the Mages Guild, so I made a profit anyways. The second quest of the Balmora Thieves Guild is to acquire a key to Nerano Manor. There are two keys in question, one on the manor's owner, Andres Nerano, and one on his manservant, Silvor Trandell. Either can be pickpocketed, if such a thing is possible. I actually saved Scum for about 15 minutes just to see if it was, and not once did I actually succeed in stealing the key off of either man. Both can be killed for the key. While there is no extra consequence for killing the manservant, killing the owner does have some consequence, since it's hard to get use out of a key when the owner is no longer alive. However, legally killing Sovor is difficult because generally the only option available to players is going to be taunts, which at this level take an exceptional amount of time to actually work. You can also convince Sovor into giving you the key, either with admiration or with bribes, but again, since the player is new, admiration may not work, and bribes may quickly surpass the rewards of the quest. The third quest of Balmora's Thieves Guild is to acquire Dwemer artifacts off another Khajiit, Razid. Razid cannot be convinced, and his tricky position makes cleanly stealing the artifacts in question a difficult proposition. In attempting to do so, I earn a bounty for defending myself from Razid. These three quests expose a massive fault in the thievery playstyle, that being the extreme difficulty of leveling thief skills naturally. Sneak only levels when you sneak around NPCs who can detect you. Since you aren't going to often be doing this, because trespassing of the later games hasn't been implemented yet, and there is no need to sneak around non-hostile NPCs, I never once saw sneak level up outside of trainers. Sneak can be leveled relatively quickly by successful pickpockets, but again, such things may not be possible in mortal lifetimes, since you can get 1 50th of a level for every successful pickpocket. And you can't level sneak on enemies very well, because the second they detect you, you aren't going to lose them. Leveling speechcraft organically will typically involve ruining dispositions with a lot of people, or spending a lot on bribe money. Illusion magic can be a solution for hybrid classes provided you cast the magic in question quite a bit. Using trainers is an option, but I should stress these are the newbie quests, they don't pay particularly well, and getting these skills high enough to be functional is more costly than the rewards given by the quests. Thus I view the early game Thieves Guild quests as likely the worst aspect of the guild. It does get better, much better in fact, but this early part is very weak, which is a surprise given the extra effort the Thieves Guild seemed to receive compared to some of the other factions. So what can be done? Unlike the later games, there isn't one path to completion in the guild. If you find yourself unable to complete a quest, you could always find a new job in a different guild hall. The Aldruin Hall is about as forgiving. It starts out innocuous, the local mage's guild is out on a Vegas trip and is apparently empty. We need to grab an enchanted Tonto and while we're there, we can help ourselves to anything we find. Only the guild hall isn't empty, someone was left behind, and he immediately assumes we're a thief. Unlike later installments of the guild, there is actually not much of a penalty for killing people while on the job, with exceptions where killing someone might complicate future work, like with Andres Nerano. This is because the Thieves Guild understands that sometimes, in a B&E, things happen, and the job still needs to get done. They prefer murder not be the first solution that members think of, but more of a reactionary measure taken. Unlike a later guild, who had exclaimed that they don't allow killing because they aren't the Dark Brotherhood. Second, never kill anyone on the job. This is not the Dark Brotherhood. There's something not right about you. 
Maybe you should go. Security is another thief skill, but it does not suffer the issues the other skills have. You only need a security level of 40 out of 100 to unlock any chest in the game, provided you have a master pick. Anything beyond that just means you open stuff in less attempts. Of course, lock level 100 is fairly uncommon, with the average lock being closer to around lock level 50. So this ended up being the only quest where I ran into the lock too complex message, since I quickly got my hands on some master picks and outleveled all the locks. I suppose I should mention the lockpick levels. They follow the levels of Apprentice, Journeyman, Master, and Grandmaster. Grandmasters are uncommon, so I'd use them for the special occasions. Lockpick quality translates to effectiveness, another factor in the equation that is lockpicking that was cut from the later games in favor of a more universal pick. Lockpicking is not done through a mini game, but rather by clicking on the lock while holding the pick in your hand. So it's done in real time, which means should you lack the skill in lockpicking and consistently fail, it means you have to take into consideration guard patrols and the like. This is another way that skill levels differentiate the masters from the apprentices. There are also traps, but they all have a standard level, so any probe in the game can break them. Magical classes can, of course, use alterations to unlock chests. For the spell Open, its level directly translates to what it opens, so an undersized spell will open all locks up to level 50. This may seem more effective provided you have the magicka and aptitude to cast such spells. Traps can be bypassed with magic provided you know the spell Telekinesis, since activating the trap from a distance will cause it to miss. Traps can range in effectiveness, sometimes they instantly kill you, Sometimes they just cast a low-level burden effect. There's really no telling from the outside what any one trap is going to do. In fact, I don't even think that they're consistent. As for fighting classes, your best bet is to use a scroll of open, of which there are two types, Undust Eyes Unhinging and e Lock Locksplitting. They carry the upsides of magic, with the downsides of weight and monetary cost. If there is a level 75 lock, you'll have to use your expensive e Locksplitter Lock Splitter to open it. I think a particular failure of the game is the inability of fighting classes to open a lock without a magical or thief-related ability. This creates a lot of situations for role-playing characters who avoid sneaky measures from opening certain chests, as there's not always a key. Those born under the sign of the tower can use a daily ability to open a level 50 lock, which is ironically more useful to fighting classes than it is to thief or mage classes, since it's ridiculously easy for both to have the necessary skill level and tool set to unlock a level 50 lock. It also comes with detect key and enchantment, which are the saddest spells ever since the quest and level designers never created any situations where you would need those effects. Back on the topic of the Thieves Guild, our next quest is to steal that Redoran Master Helmet I mentioned earlier. Erebar's guard can occasionally path out of the room if you leave the door open, then you can shut the door on her to keep her out. What? You must be joking. Now you're down to Erebar, but he's a bit politically significant to just kill. Luckily, NPCs can be distracted. By getting NPCs to speak towards you, you can control the direction they look. This isn't always reliable, since sometimes NPCs are positioned up against a wall, but here it is necessary. For our next job, we're then tasked with stealing a smut book from Minor Erebar's daughter, and... Oh my god, this is absolutely depraved! I love it! Now, somebody has a grudge against Erebar, and it's strange because this plot point doesn't come up again, not even in the House or quest questline. Over in Sadrith Mora, we get a job to steal a potion recipe for the benefit of the local mages guild. We can, of course, ask for the recipe, to which we'll be told, No, I don't think so. Naturally, she forgets we asked after we take it. Or maybe we make a copy. Either way, this quest is actually really easy. So, naturally, the next one is quite difficult. We are to steal a rare Grandmaster's Retort from a trader in Tel Mora. This is difficult as the retort is in clear view of the merchant. She's willing to sell it, but isn't in a selling mood until somebody deals with the health and safety violation upstairs that is a corpus monster. The zombie has a good deal of health, but is trapped behind some clutter so we can pick it off from a distance safely. There are other retorts, and they are about as difficult to acquire as this one. The wiki actually suggests you kill Berlin, which is pretty psychopathic but he's a bit politically significant to just kill. I just buy it off her and trade some contraband I'd stolen earlier to make up the capital. It's, it's better for everyone that way. Our next task is to help improve the defenses of the guild hall by hiring a battle mage. We ask around the local mages guild and come to a deal. Four pieces of ebony for a battle mage. Ebony is a controlled substance in the empire, which naturally poses some challenges in acquiring it. At this point, we're getting the beginnings of a clue that this is more than just go to X place and steal Y thing. If we go to the big city, Vivek, you'll find people a lot less knowledgeable about where the Thieves Guild is. 
In the East Canal Works, below the Waste Works, of the foreign quarter of Avec is a bookshop belonging to Simon Fralinet. Behind a locked door inside his shop are the headquarters of the Thieves Guild. I feel no shame in marking this position as to avoid trying to find it every time. Jim has two quest lines, a final one for the Thieves Guild, and one for those who've messed up the earlier quests and need the reputation. We'll start with that one, the Balmalagmer. So, in Dunmer culture there was a group called the Balmalagmer who would steal from the unjust and give to the needy. Stunningly clever, and original I know. This faction exists, like I said, for rep points, but also for that group of people who can only allow themselves to be criminals if they're doing it for what they perceive to be justifiable reasons. There is no reward for these quests. There isn't even really the opportunity to steal valuables while doing these quests. And there is no ceremony at the end. Merely acknowledgement that you're now qualified to do good on your own. Still, the questline is enjoyable. Most of them start with Stacy explaining an injustice that has occurred or is in the process of occurring and the steps we can take to correct it. Also necessary is wearing a pair of gloves that are iconic to the group and signifying in conversation that we are acting on behalf of the Balmalagmer. At first, nobody cares, but as the deeds go on, people start to recognize the name and the actions. You can catch Halau Counselor Yingling Half-Troll in an act of corruption, accuse him, and then kill him in self-defense. Or it can be as simple as stealing a locket and returning it to its owner. Perhaps the most interesting about the questline is the thought process of whether or not Jim Stacy is having you do this out of genuine interest in restoring the Balmalagmer, or simply as a ploy to generate goodwill with the people of Vardenfell. It's a theme that's reflected in the main storyline as well. So let's get into the end game of the Thieves Guild questline. This starts with the process of building up the guild. In Balmora, we free a member from prison by tricking a guard into self-admitting that she was taking bribes. Then we find a master of security hiding in Balmora and convince him to step up and help secure the corner club. After this quest, Habasi will perform a free wipe of your bounty, which served as a fantastic opportunity to rob everyone blind and get away with it for free. 19,000 gold bounty? Gone. In Aldrun, we collect the scrap metal to build a spider centurion, and collect the darts of judgment from a Radoran guard. The dark quest is interesting because the amount of rep and pay you get depends on how many you return. They aren't really worth keeping though, so it isn't really a choice. Now let's talk about Marksman. Steals your wallet preferred ranged combat, but also kept short bladed weapons as backups. Marksman is a mostly simple affair. You take a bow, arrows, and shoot people. Projectiles generally travel in a straight line, and your chance of hitting is pretty much guaranteed at a marksman level greater than 50. Vardenfell, however, sees wood at a premium, and so favor bows made of chitin and laminated in resin, or bows made of steel. This is to say that the selection is rather weak, basically jumping from bone mold to daedric. Some nuance does come with the arrow selection, however. And arrows do have travel time, and enemy marksmen are actually really easy to dodge since they are easily tricked into leading their shots. Crossbows are another option. The steel crossbow is the mass-produced Imperial Legion version, and there is a Dwemer version as well. I always found it strange that the Empire just forgot about crossbows in Oblivion, and then they were rediscovered in Skyrim. Then again, they never managed to rediscover the spear, you know, one of the most basic weapons in human history. There are also throwing weapons, but sadly they are underappreciated. It's hard to appreciate a weapon that disappears after you use it, especially when said weapon is one of the only ones that exists in the game. Using the darts of judgment isn't a wise move because you can't retrieve them if you miss, and have a very low chance if they hit, and even if you do hit, they don't do standout damage. As for lesser throwing weapons, a stable supply of anything greater than steel was pretty unreliable. They're actually kind of fun since they massively scale with your strength, but have way too many downsides to consistently use. Hey, this is me in post. I just want to add one of the reasons throwing weapons are so much fun in Morrowind is because of their slow travel time and high damage on impact. So you feel like a ninja when you throw one and strafe to a side, watching as the projectile you threw connects with the target. For the love of God, please bring back the throwing weapons. I get the battle mage hired, and am tasked with stealing a Radoran cookbook. An odd sounding quest, I know, I feel as though the Sagerth Mora quests were a bit out of order. The final Sagerth Mora quest is to steal an ebony staff from Felon Marion, a Telvanni wizard living in Telbrenora. She's more so giving the job to satisfy a personal grudge and doesn't really care if we decline it or accept it. It's actually pretty easy, I just get behind the shelf and grab it. This quest has two big rewards, a telekinesis ring and another bounty reset. 
Telekinesis allows you to interact with objects at a distance, which includes picking locks and stealing objects. I think they intended the final quest of each hall to reward something useful. The location of a master trainer in Balmora, a quote-unquote powerful ranged weapon in Aldrun, and the TK ring in Sadrith Mora, as well as bounty resets at the end of each line. The problem is that these are, for the most part, not that useful as rewards. The Master Trainer might let us raise a skill up easily, but said skill is security, the one that does not need to be as high. The darts are better off being turned in for gold, and the Telekinesis Ring, while useful, is coming far too late in the quest line, given how the following quests play out. The bounty resets are nice, but are also not telegraphed to the player when you'll get them, meaning it's entirely probable players never actually get to use them the way I did. This leads us into the final chain of events. Have you wondered why all the masters took steps to shore up the defenses of the guild hall? Well, it's because it's known to the members of the guild that the fighter's guild head, Shoring Hardheart, is working in service of the Kamana Tong, and is making moves against the Thieves Guild. Jim Stacy starts us down the path of retribution with an investigation into the disappearance of a guild member. Turns out Nads Theron is in his studio apartment dead. A short, optional investigation reveals the murderer to be a barmate over at the Elven Nation's Corner Club, Arvama Rathri, who happens to be a Hlahu retainer. Accuse her, and she'll admit it. And she'll also admit that she's going to try to kill you. We return to Stacy, and we get a bonus for taking out Rothri. Our next objective is to speak with Perseus Mercius of the Aldrin Fighters Guild. He was the old guildmaster before Jorin, and is more principled. If you have a decent disposition with him, he'll even give you some information. He was the master of the Fighters Guild before the Kamana Tong made a move. Harundi was a second in command and is against the Tong, but might not help out the gate unless we leverage a love affair he's involved in. Ida's Fire Eye at the Balmora Fighters Guild is a competent fighter, but she's a worshipper of Clavicus Vile and impossible to blackmail. Shorin Hardheart is in great debt to the Kamana Tong and will likely have to be killed. If you've never played an Elder Scrolls game before, I envy you, but I should also explain that the Fighters Guild, like the Thieves Guild, is an imperial organization that does as its namesake implies. It is a joinable faction, and is in the next section of this video. So having a questline where you murder their entire upper management is, to players of the later games, a highly unusual affair. Imagine a quest where the companions are ordered to take out the College of Winterhold, for example. To take care of Idis, we have to get our hands on a Clavicus Vile artifact, the Bitter Cup. This provides a non-lethal solution to dealing with Idis at the cost of the Bitter Cup. What does it do? It raises your highest attribute by 20 points and lowers your lowest by 20. Not the most useful thing, but it is necessary if you want to min-max your health. The real value of this quest, however, is Oh, no, wait, no, hang on, no! Okay, so one naked skeleton war wizard later, and uh, as I was saying, the real value of this quest is something the skeleton is carrying called the Vampiric Ring. It's an enchanted ring that absorbs a massive amount of health and fatigue from enemies on touch. It's quite deadly. Give Idas the cup, and she pledges her allegiance. Jim notes that she'll likely be trouble down the line, but for now she's no longer a problem. Our next step is to convince Harundi over in Sadrith Mora to join us. He can be made amicable to the idea, but can also be convinced if you figure out who he is choreographing an affair with and threaten her life to him. Finally, before we can make our move, we need to take out some top-level enforcers in the Kamana Tong. Yeah, this is a straight-up assassination mission. Vardenfell's Thieves Guild does not fuck around with trying to be the better man. Second, never kill anyone on the job. This is not the Dark Brotherhood. Animals and monsters can be slain if necessary. Of course, we aren't going to go out of our way to kill Orvis Dren. He is the Duke's brother, after all, but his two goons that pose a threat are free game. The game actually bugs out. One of the brothers is supposed to teleport behind you when you start the fight, but ended up teleporting inside a door. This made killing the first brother easy, but I was somewhat stuck. I could still teleport out with magic, obviously. I just didn't want to. Eventually, he got free. This guy's a bastard. He has a jinx blade that paralyzes for longer than it takes to swing it, so he can basically score a bunch of free hits until the enchantment runs out of a charge. Luckily, that new vampiric ring is very lethal and restores our health. And finally, for our endgame, we're tasked with taking down Shoring Hardheart. We're warned that he's a competent fighter. Head on. You 
will die during your stash. You are clumsy, snowman. So what are the conclusions? The Fighters Guild threat against the Thieves Guild have been eliminated. Not entirely sure who's going to run the Fighters Guild now, but at least it's not being run by somebody in debt to the Kamanit Tong. The Tong itself has lost its top enforcers, while the Guild has built up its defenses and position in Vardenfell, appearing more culturally relevant thanks to their Balmalagma revival than the xenophobic Kamanit Tong. Stacy figures this is an adequate position to retire in, having found a successor and steals your wallet, and hands us the skeleton keys to the skeleton car. Okay, I'm sorry. The skeleton key works like a normal lockpick, with 50 uses and 5 times the effectiveness. I prefer Morrowind's Thieves Guild line to its other incarnations. It does feel like helping to maintain your criminal family without any metaphysical connotations. I'm not steals their wallet, protector of the people and hero of the poor. I'm steals your wallet, known criminal overlord. Sadly, this is where the story of steals your wallet ends. He never achieved his namesake, and there wasn't really anything logical to do with him as a follow-up, like the other characters. Which is a shame, because I did like him. Apparently not enough to notice that his name was actually Steel's wallet, however, you can't do dashes on the Morrowind Xbox. Mace was a meme character. His class name of Jedi Knight and his propensity to bash people in the head with the blunt side of his weapon didn't really help much to assuage that fact. I was originally going to call him Metal Bat because he uses a uh, metal bat and has the whole fighting spirit thing going on. How do I get this tangent back on track? The Fighters Guild is a rather straightforward organization. You sign up, you get a contract, you fight, you get paid. What we'll typically be doing is a reflection of the area you're in. I.e. in Balmora, you start off with normal contracts and move on to shadier business. Since we just covered this in the last section, we have to operate with some sense of dramatic irony that says the Fighters Guild isn't corrupt. This does become apparent by our third contract, but I get ahead of myself. Our first job is to take care of some rats. The first one is simple enough, the other two not so much. These rats have a lot more health than your standard large rodent, and 2v1 is a bit of a challenging proposition for early game builds. Luckily, we have racial abilities that generally turn the tide of fights like this. Our next contract is to take care of some Kwama egg poachers? What? Okay, so in Morrowind, the main food the Dunmer eat is giant eggs harvested from insects living in caves that are the size of bears. What? And when people are desperate, they poach the eggs. What? We make our way to the mine, and some of the miners say that the egg poachers are in the back, near the queen, and ask that we try to avoid killing any of the Kwama since they won't be used to our scent and will attack us on sight. I could pontificate about lessons taught in these quests, or we could call them what they are, filler. Now filler isn't bad, and there could always be more generic, but scripted, basic level contracts to do, but I'm not going to pretend it's something greater than it is, when in this case it's not. Our third contract, however, is where things get interesting. Idis tells us to take care of some quote, Telvanni agents, end quote. Of course, when we ask about these Telvanni agents, it turns out that they aren't Telvanni, they're Thieves Guild, perhaps working for Telvanni, but all Thieves Guild nonetheless, and one wonders at the need for deception. It is also entirely possible that less attentive players who aren't curious enough to ask about the targets will miss the subtext of this quest entirely, so it is nice that the writing isn't so on the nose as to make absolutely sure we are aware that Idis is deceiving us. You have to actually roleplay as somebody who asks questions to figure out that something is wrong, and if you don't, you get led down the lemming path. I go out and meet the guys, their lookout greeting me friendly enough, but turning hostile when he realizes I'm with the Fighters Guild. I defend myself and figure I might as well finish the job. It ain't nothing a little adrenaline rush can't handle. Idis's next contract is even more sketchy. She wants me to get my hands on a Thieves Guild codebook from the local guild hall. I figure I'll look for a different contract and meet Perseus Mercius. He says he doesn't have any contracts for members at my rank, but he does offer advice for jobs and suggests I speak with Harundi over in Sadrith Mora for good ones. He figures the codebook contract might be legitimate, but advises that we avoid a lethal solution. I decide to go to Harundi, and his jobs are a lot better. 
His first job is to provide support to a witch hunter hunting a Daedroth in Ninchurn Dams. This first entails getting to Ninchurn Dams, which is a remote location that takes a bit of water walking to get to. Although the circumstances of getting to this quest can be difficult, the quest itself is quite good. It's a great introduction to combat, with a necessary crutch for players in the form of Lariana. She's a capable warrior with unique audio dialogue who is able to heal the player if they get wounded and can generally handle the creatures inside Ninchurn Dams. Ninchurn Dams has early access to some Dwemer gear and ends in the mini-boss of Hrelvzu. This is what should have been Morrowind's introduction to the Fighters Guild. Morrowind's combat is very straightforward, but I see a lot of people who pick up this game get overwhelmed and mentally overcomplicate something that can really be as basic as point and click to do damage. The problem boils down to the fact that people will pick a basic class like Knight, then take that dagger in the census office, go off to fight a mud crab, miss, and start immediately complaining that they should have hit the crab because the models collided. Hit chance is a part of Morrowind. Playing Morrowind without hit chance is not playing Morrowind. Weapon skills are a reflection from 0 to 100 of how proficient you are with using said weapon. Believe it or not, but swords aren't as simple as swing sword hurt person. Ideally, if your system is set up right, the footage of someone playing as an unskilled weapon user should differ from the footage of someone playing as a master in that skill, right? Well, here's what an amateur in Morrowind looks like. As you can see, I'm having a hard time landing hits using a weapon I've never used before. And here is what a master looks like. As you can see, I'm landing hits consistently and ending the fight quite quickly. This is a proper contrast between apprentice and master. Let's contrast this now with Oblivion's allegedly revolutionary and entertaining combat system. Clip 1. All right, and clip two. Now, tell me, which one was the master clip and which one was the apprentice clip? This is not a trick where I switch the clips or they're both the same skill level. I've kept all the conditions the same. Same enemy, same difficulty. The first clip is skill level 5, the second clip is skill level 100, and yet they are practically identical. Because unlike in Morrowind, there is no progression in feel of combat, only in the raw numbers of damage you do. The way skills work in Morrowind is that they determine your chance to hit. Your damage is then affected by the weapon you're using and your strength. In Oblivion and Skyrim, however, all your skill affects is just a damage increase. The first enemy you fight with a weapon, all the way to the last enemy, will be exactly the same because all you have to do is make models intersect. With manual blocks, parries, and more intelligent AI, it can be a more interesting or dynamic melee combat system, but it's not a melee combat system that accurately reflects skill levels with weapons, or a combat system that is reflective of an actual progression of character skill, something that is important in a role-playing game. Because there's one thing I've left out of all of this. The enemy has skills too. Because of course they do. NPCs can be more or less dangerous as a result of their own backstory and training. This includes their own chance to hit, as well as various defensive skills that determine your chance to hit them. Perhaps this just comes down to a matter of preference, but rather than tying our preference to nostalgia, let's consider what meaningful difference there is between a hit chance oriented combat system like Morrowind versus a percentage damage oriented combat system like Oblivion and Skyrim. In the hit chance system, should you be far superior to an enemy, you're able to kill them quickly and efficiently. There is a clear progression from the first enemy you fight to the last. You're encouraged to specialize and invest in a particular weapon, rather than switching arbitrarily to ones that have bigger numbers than the last. In a percent damage system, you cannot be superior to an enemy, as scaling will eliminate your advantages. Increasing your skill is not a matter of gaining an advantage, but keeping up with the world. Rather than becoming incrementally better at landing hits, you are becoming incrementally better at doing slightly more damage. The skill is less so a reflection of you or other characters' proficiency and mastery, but a stagnating progression where combat is identical for the entire game. All this lost, because some people complained they couldn't hit mud crabs with a weapon their character had never picked up before.
I hope you can forgive me, but I am going to speed up, particularly as a number of Fighters Guild quests are not noteworthy. These are as simple as go to place, kill, or do thing. One quest type I particularly like is the fact that the guild has been contracted by the Empire to deliver alcohol shipments to miners in remote areas, something that feels like a legitimate contract such an organization would receive. Our next notable mission is to rescue and escort a researcher investigating a Dunmer stronghold, Telesero. I have mixed feelings on escort quests, which is quite a surprise as I, and this is a fairly reasonable position, vehemently dislike them in most contexts. I think Morrowind's escort quests work because they allow you to lead and listen to your commands to stop and let you do your job. They are also fairly rare, and when they do pop up, they are short and designed in such a way to be painless. So it turns out that the researcher, her name is Sondale, went in ahead of us, and this is a 6th house base. What happens at 6th house bases? She's in a side room, hopped up on a table because some giant rats are harassing her. I mean, they're the size of dogs, I'm sure they could get up there. I find the 6th house hammer, which is interesting because its damage can rain from a peck one might give a lover, to a pair of school buses set in a head-on collision. Sadly, it's also really heavy, so I don't have any room for it in my life. We're then tasked with taking care of a bounty in the local Sadrith Mora. Enger has taken up residence up in Tel Naga particularly as a prisoner of Master Neloth. I have to taunt the guard into attacking me, which is a tall order for my speechcraft level. Neloth then gets rather upset when I kill Angar, perhaps mad I shortened his life as a prisoner, but as per Telvanni law, it's a-okay because I managed to escape the building. Let's take this opportunity to talk about the AI in Morrowind. It's bad. It prioritizes casting the worth spells, like minor burdens or blind. It only repositions to avoid damage if using ranged, then it runs full speed backwards, which makes archers in open environments a nightmare. Melee AI will just book it towards you until death, only running away if you go invisible or start flying out of their reach. AI is an area that the later games improved without question. Hell, as early as Morrowind's first expansion, they had AI who could drink potions, which means that for the entirety of the base game, potions are a distinct advantage held solely by the player. This is one of the reasons I don't like to do everything in one playthrough because Morrowind reaches a point where the AI stops being a challenge. When you are working within the limitations of the yearly game, finding creative solutions around problems, that's when Morrowind is interesting. Some of the most fun I've had in Morrowind was during a Mage's Guild quest where I had to kill an enemy who was 10 levels higher than me and could one-shot me. Whereas if the Mage's Guild was just the third faction I joined, I'd already be higher level than the NPC and able to take the hits while killing them in three, maybe two hits. Anyways, Hurundi is out of real contracts, but has one mission that he believes is in all likelihood bullshit. Apparently there are seven eggs of gold inside a legendary mine, the Pude Egg Mine, somewhere on or around the island of Sheogorad. He's willing to pay quite a bit should the eggs actually exist. So this entails some time exploring Sheogorad, and I took the chance to do some dungeon crawling. I found some Malakath worshippers and got a few full sets of Orcish. I ended up finding an arena being used for slave fighting. They weren't appreciative of me, and so I got a powerful legendary sword. And in one of the earlier quests, I had slain a vampire who was wearing a powerful ring. This is a point in every Morrowind playthrough I call the power threshold. If you have a graph, there's a line for the progression of the difficulty, and a line for the progression of the character, the power threshold is when the character line intersects and becomes greater than the difficulty line. Once characters cross the threshold, they've become powerful enough to handle the challenges of the game. It's rewarding and, at the same time, a sad part of Morrowind because it means that the challenge is over. You can turn up the difficulty, but all that does is make enemies hit a little harder and make you a little more fragile. Orcish armor is some of the best medium armor in the game. The sword, the ice blade of the monarch, is extremely powerful, even for a character that is specialized in blunt weaponry. And the ring provides some serious defensive enchantments, reflecting and resisting damage. All turning up the difficulty really does now is push me to use my adrenaline rush ability more often. I do eventually find the mine, which, for an abandoned mine, still has lit torches. I mean, okay, I, I've worked with the editor, you have to place a prop, a light source, and a sound source, so either someone created the mine unaware of what quest it would involve, someone created the mine, was aware of the quest, and didn't see anything wrong with torches in an abandoned mine, or my favorite possibility, someone copied the mine from elsewhere and made the bare essential modifications for the sake of the quest. 
Down all the way at the back behind the uh, queen are the seven eggs, which all weigh 30 pounds, 30 pounds. So getting back is a challenge, but it's a challenge that's met by magic. Hurundi, surprised we even found the cave, pays us 10,000 gold for the job, which is quite a big payout. He is out of work for us and recommends us to Perseus Mercius back in Aldrun. And Perseus does have work for us now. He wants us to help a buoyant armager take care of a necromancer at Vos. Said necromancer is a member of Telvanni, so one wonders at the political nature of the situation. The armager is willing to give us a recommendation, provided we don't hit her in the fight. I don't, but I do take an accidental swing at her ancestor ghost. Look, I didn't even hit him, it's fine. But it's enough to be a problem and I get paid a lower rate. Our next job is to take care of a bounty of someone living in a place called Sargon. That's the only reason I mention this quest, it's otherwise by the book. We take care of some more bounty, we deliver some more liquor, and then I go ahead and meet the guild leader, Shoring, who gives me 5,000 gold and instructs me to take care of the three masters of the Thieves' Guild in Balmora, Aldrun, and Sadrith Mora. Perseus, on the other hand, decides it's time to ask, and asks we take care of a few corrupt Fighters' Guild members, Idas Fireeye in Balmora, and Lord Bumal, Gro Anglak, in Vivek. I go with Perseus, since he's been the more reasonable option. Ida's Fire Eye attacks me as soon as I enter, and Gro Aglock declares that he'll be Guildmaster soon enough. Then, we're tasked by Perseus to take care of Shoring. He gives me access to full sets of orcish and glass armor, and tells me that Shoring is one of the toughest fighters on the island. You should have picked an easier opponent. Shoring is one of the toughest fighters on the island. And he wasn't even wearing his armor. The Fighters Guild fizzles out towards the end. For all the intrigue behind the Thieves Guild relying on the Fighters Guild to be interesting and lasting throughout the entire storyline, it's a shame that there weren't more missions in the Fighters Guild side of the story where you can play the other side. And it's a shame that these quests were so on the nose with it. It's very difficult to see anybody being tricked into going against the Thieves Guild. Unless they just aren't paying attention and thinking about what they're doing or they don't care. Should you side with Thorin and kill the three masters, he'll then task you with killing Jim Stacy before then attempting to kill you. So in the end, all roads lead to Shoring Hardheart's death. I could say that the Fighters Guild has some appeal in that it pays, but it doesn't even pay all that well for the work. You go from running errands and performing contracts to decimating the leadership in one quest. The Shadow War with the Thieves Guild is only hinted at if you decide to play the Stooge, and the Kamanatong doesn't even come up from the Fighters Guild perspective. Our Mage's Guild character started off by picking everything from Sidonine to Balmora, and once she got her free 200 Gs from Caius, joined up with the Mage's Guild. Turns out the early Balmora quests deal with picking mushrooms and flowers that I happened to grab. Who could have seen this coming? Uh, well, me, because I've done this before. Between the collection of mushrooms and flowers, we're tasked with replacing a soul gem with a fake in our boss's rival's desk, slowing her research. She'll come downstairs and, due to her faulty AI, this means I'm free to leave the cell and come back, and that traps her downstairs, forever, which is a more convenient location. I'm not sure about these early quests. They aren't introducing alchemy, asking the player to create a potion with the ingredients or anything like that. It's just go out and fetch some ingredients. As for the Soul Gym quest, it isn't usually the case that static NPCs move around during quests, so that isn't introducing anything new either. You also don't need to use magic. It might have been handy to have a quest involve learning a low level unlock, like 5 points, to unlock her desk to perform the switch. As it stands, it feels like the designer is showing off that they can script NPCs to move around during quests, which, again, isn't useful information for the player since it doesn't happen again, nor is it impressive from a technical standpoint, since all it does is highlight the fact that NPCs don't work on a schedule and just stay in the same spot all day. It would be like me bragging that I can edit out all these coughs. <coughs> Our next quest is to take 10 gold and buy a ceramic bowl. This is so that the cell can reset so that when I return, Stolen reports will have spawned. We're then tasked by a panicking Najira to find said reports. This is the closest the game comes to teaching a lesson, and the lesson is just look around the environment and you can find stuff. And that's it for now with Azira. 
I know I've been hard on these five quests, but that is more from an analytical standpoint than anything else. The Thieves and Fighters Guild have you playing out these fantasies, but the Mages Guild plays more like assistant busy work. We're presented a choice. Work with Rannis, Athras, and Balmora, or Edwina Elbert and Aldrun. Rannis' quests are a bit more oriented towards the guild as a magical regulator, while Edwina's quests are oriented towards the guild as a research institution. Rannis first asks we take care of a Telvanian Sulapund, either recruiting him to the Mages Guild or killing him. While we're out here, we're also to collect dues from a member in Punambi. Over in Aldrun, we're tasked with taking 250 gold and finding a copy of the Chronicles of Nushleft. And turns out, in Vivek, the Archmage has duties for us. He wants us to solve the disappearance of the dwarves. No leads or anything, just solve this ancient mystery that people have been investigating for centuries. And also three games. The trip out to Sulapund and Punabi is a bit of a drastic shift in difficulty. Ajira was really onto something when recommending us against doing Rannis' tasks, since we're tasked with journeying into Malag Amur. If only there were quests prior to this that could have prepared us for combat. I get to the first cave, and Manway, the person who has been dodging their dues, is performing research out here. She owes 2,000 gold in dues, apparently, and is not willing to pay unless she likes us, which can be afforded for 200 gold. That's the art of the deal. Then we go and meet with the Telvani. He's one of dozens of quote rogue unquote Telvani living out on the frontier doing their own thing. I put quotes around rogue because honestly taking a place and making it your own is the Telvani way. Nothing roguish about that. He doesn't want to join the mages guild complaining about how outlanders are ruining Morrowind but naturally this means he can be bought for 200 gold. Morrowind's quests leave a lot to be desired in terms of convincing people through dialogue. You may have noticed that in most dialogues, there aren't often conversation options. And when there are, they tend to exist in a binary. The concept of dialogue in Morrowind having multiple options is actually fairly alien for the series. When I discuss options for quests, it tends to be in what you can do to complete it through gameplay to get different endings that have minor knock-on effects, but... Actual dialogue tends to be rather lacking in these choices. Morrowind's text-based dialogue seems like the perfect place to do an in-depth conversation system, yet it doesn't happen. Why? Well, in part this has to do with the way quest scripting works. The appropriate responses given to dialogue prompts is determined by a quest stage variable. However, go on many quest pages on the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, and you'll see full bug sections that are consequences of what happens if you do something slightly wrong affecting journal stages. Now, I never ran into the issue of bugging out the journal stages. I also never ran into a situation where I needed to use console commands to progress a quest, which is fortunate since I didn't have access to a console to do so. But I can speak from experience outside of this review series that it does happen. The journal stage system was new in Morrowind and at its most primordial. Bethesda also seemed more concerned with filling out all the content than doing the work necessary to take full advantage of the system they had created. Oblivion would have been the opportunity to expand on the text-based dialogue system providing a wide swath of potential dialogue options for players and responses, since it's text only you don't need voice actors. But instead, the decision was made to scrap the dialogue system and hire voice actors. Bethesda has stuck with the same engine, and that means the same journal stage system, Although they're called quest stages now since the journal got peeled back, even Fallout 76, which I haven't played, utilizes the system. And yet its advantage of potentially providing alternate paths for quests has been used sparingly by Bethesda. If you want a full demonstration of its potential, just look at a random Fallout New Vegas quest. You can see alternate paths, endings, and rewards tied all in there, and most New Vegas dialogues are full of optional paths despite being voice acted. Bethesda, even with the time and grace provided to them to create Skyrim, still couldn't muster the effort to improve its dialogue system and quest staging to provide options beyond, yes, I will do your quest, and no, but leave the door open so I can come back and do your quest at a later time. Anyways, I happened to grab a copy of the Chronicles of Nush left while I was convincing that Tilvani to join the Mages Guild, and so I started doing more tasks for Edwina since she seemed the most reasonable of the options. She has me FedEx a potion over to Skink and Tree's Shade at the Wolverine Hall, introducing another quest giver who teases at orders once I finish this quest. 
Edwina now wants me to steal a book called Chimar Van Midium, and we might have to cast magic to do it. Just kidding, we're given a scroll with the necessary effect on it. Bethesda, if you keep holding my hand, I'm going to start to think you like me. This is where I go off on a tangent because Bethesda just hates the idea of magic-themed quest lines requiring players actually cast magic they've learned beforehand, but I just went on a huge tangent already, and I'll let it slide for now. So we go to the Vivek Guild Hall, sneak into a closet, and steal the book. Don't worry, we'll return it later. But before we do that, we need to deal with the situation developing up in Margan. Apparently there's a disturbance at Hulin's hut. Sure enough, we find the place trashed and a scamp's running loose. An apprentice to Hulin apparently summoned it to prove his worth, but the scamp was only pretending to be under his control and stole his clothes and locked him in the basement. I kind of like this quest. Edwina is less than thrilled that her time was wasted on something like that. Now we return the book, which I just give to its owner, and she's surprised at its return, and that's that. Now we need to source a Dwimmer tube from a place called Arkin Thunster Dumbs. She doesn't actually need any specific tube, just a tube will do. So while we're on the way up to the ruin, let's talk about the Xbox. The Xbox had a severe effect on the difficulty of the game. Turns out playing the game at a low frame rate compromises the experience, who knew? The biggest culprit of deaths would be when I would press a button, only to not get a response because the button pressed happened to correspond with a stutter, so the input would be lost and my character would just impotently stand there and take their beating. Another offender is weapon and magic stancing. Those unaware may be used to the idea of pressing a button to draw a weapon. Well, in Morrowind you have a separate stance for casting magic. This stance was removed in Oblivion, and I have a suspicion about why that was. See, among the inputs that can be lost in stutters are the transitions from your normal stance to magic stance, or to your weapon, or to switch between them both. I got frustrated more than a couple times when my character would refuse to switch stances. This would have been a standard experience on the Xbox, since it didn't fare much better than the 360 when running the game. It's not much of a secret that the Xbox copy of Morrowind served as a testing ground for ideas for Bethesda. The new multi-panel UI being adapted into Oblivion, for example, before being reverse ported onto PC players, much to our chagrin. The lack of response simply made Magic Stance too much of a hassle to keep in the game, hence the new cast button that allowed you to use magic at any time. I actually prefer Skyrim's system of having two independent hands, even if the magic tangent removed. So what are some other quirks of the Xbox? Well, the AI stopping and taking a think happened quite a bit. It seemed the game prioritized keeping itself running over the AI pathing. However, this wasn't consistent. If the AI knew what it was trying to do and then the game stuttered, the AI would continue on its collision course independent of my ability to respond, button presses being ignored, and of course, since this is being played suboptimally on a controller, this ended in a fair few deaths that wouldn't have happened if I was playing with a keyboard and mouse. I do this for love. Ranged combat in particular was quite difficult. At a high resolution, it's easy to spot enemies from the environment, but squeeze that resolution in, knock it down a few hundred pixels, sprinkle on some aliasing and bad lighting, and all of a sudden target acquisition in Morrowind is quite difficult. And aiming with a controller, I mean, my god, I don't want to harp on the weaknesses of controllers this much, but trying to aim with some measure of precision was a nightmare. Especially since the projectile trajectories and collision models were built with the idea of being used with a mouse first. Moreover, playing with a dominant strategy is encouraged because of the loading screens. Loading is near instantaneous on a modern PC, as is expected, but on the Xbox I spent probably hours of my life just waiting. Optimally it was a good time to take notes, but sometimes when I was just forced to reload because I kept dying on difficult fights it was less than appreciated. So playing in unorthodox ways was discouraged. Let me give you an example. Ever notice how every Skyrim playthrough you see ends up being stealth archery at some point? Dominant strategy. The upsides of the strategy always present themselves as an option should the downsides of the situation impede progress. For Morrowind, the dominant strategy is to use enchanted items with powerful on-touch effects to nuke enemies to death, and then run back and forth timing the enemy's attacks and swinging in between rounds. As long as I had room to maneuver in Morrowind, victory was guaranteed. The fun then came from trying to play in new or interesting ways, trying unconventional magicka effects, or summoning, or, or, and then I die for the fifth time and I say, looks like I'll have to get a little bit serious. 
Overall, playing on the Xbox made me hate this game, and at the same time, appreciate what exactly about Morrowind would cause me to waste so much time analyzing it. To me, it's the ultimate testament of respect, as the thoughts say. If you can't handle her at your worst, you don't deserve her at her best. Even if sometimes her best is also her worst. Now that we've got the tube, we're tasked with checking in on a Dwemer Ruin expedition. This is, naturally, in the middle of Malaga Moor. Luckily, Edwina gave us a couple handy intervention amulets to facilitate the travel. Turns out the site's guide has gone missing deeper inside the ruin, and worst of all, he had to report Edwina once. Some investigation reveals the test of pattern. There are three lights, each with a corresponding lever. Two lights are broken, one light is not. Which lever is the correct one to pull? Well, don't worry, it's the lever that is across the room from the hidden wall, as shown on the minimap. Yeah, the Dunmer guide is dead, but he did manage to find a book before dying. The Mage's Guild rep isn't too bothered by his death, and we take the report to Edwina, who says the book might be useful if we knew somebody who can speak Alt Maris. Our next task is to acquire some Dwemer Scarab plans from the Ruin of Muleslefd, up in Sheogorad. And this is a little high level, as evidenced by the fact that all the orcs can one-shot me. I won this fight, eventually, by using a paralyzed spell to freeze the orc, then cast a spell that had a 50% chance of working to nuke him to death. This took quite a few attempts, and involved a trip back to make the nuke spell. Now I have the plans, but in for a penny and for a pound, surely there's something valuable here. Well, there's more orcs. Luckily I found a use for the lock spell. Why do you want a spell that locks doors and creates future hassle? Because NPCs can't unlock them, and can be hit through them. A tactic I discovered early on was the locked door tactic. The enemy's AI pathfinding would lead it through doorways, but can only account for obstacles like doors by opening and traveling through them. To the AI, it should be paradoxical that they can detect someone through a locked door, as if the door is locked, then the player can't have come in the room. That's obviously not how it actually works, but the point is, from a design perspective, what I'm doing only works thanks to an exploitation, or rather, a clever use of game mechanics. The only other thing you can use lock for is if you care to level your security up, and you really shouldn't do that. However, the other half of this is a ranged spell with an area effect. I always felt it was a shame what happened to spell making in the later games. In Oblivion, it got relegated to a high-level reward for Mage's Guild members, or DLC, while in Skyrim, it was cut entirely. Using the Spellmaker allowed me to make a fire spell that was perfect for hitting through locked doors, maxing out the area and setting it to low damage, high duration, making it magicka efficient as well. Then I just nuked the door until I stopped hearing footsteps on the other side. It's a beautifully stupid tactic, but hey, it works. I like to imagine I'm just heating the room up until the people inside burn to death, which is brutal, but hey shouldn't have been the one shotting me. In addition to the Scarab plans, I find a book named The Egg of Time. Edwina thanks us for the plans and recommends we speak with Hasfet Antibolus in Balmora about the book. He says the book is written in Old Maris, which is a dead language. So we should take the book to one of the older Telvanni, but he doesn't have a recommendation who. Edwina says the miners in the Nysus egg mine found a Dwemer ruin in the mine and she asks us to find anything that's down there. Specifically, you know, plans. I have to bribe the door guard for the key, and another guard lower in the mine threatens to kill me if I don't leave. So I leave, in the direction of the ruin. It still counts. Near the entrance, I found some Dwemer airship plans, as well as a book named Divine Metaphysics. Leaving the mine, I hear some ruins that Nysus has a rogue Telvanni wizard living in town, so I pay him a visit. His name is Balados Demnavani, and sure enough, he can read Aldmeris. The Hanging Gardens was written in both Aldmeris and Dwemer, so it's able to be used to translate the other two books. The Egg of Time is a refutation of a theory from the time of Resdane and Nerevar. The theory said that using the power of the Heart of Lorcan carried more risk than reward, and the Egg of Time figured that the reward was worth the risks. Divine Metaphysics is about how the Dwemer tried to make a new god using Kagranak's tools, and using sacred tones on Lorcan's heart. So, extrapolating meaning from these two books, we can conclude that the Dwemer tried to make a new god using Lorcan's heart, that the great risk that was warned about came true, and then the Dwemer disappeared. Thus, having discovered both the plans to a functioning airship, as well as solving the mystery of spontaneous extinction of the Dwemer, we will return for our rewards. Edwina has none. She's disappointed because she wanted the plans to build a robot, not an airship, Trebonius, the Archmage, also has no reward, taken aback that someone had actually managed to complete one of his missions, 
let alone a mission that entailed solving a centuries if not millennia old mystery. You do get some reputation, so more people know your name, but scholarly work itself pays very little. Despite this, the mystery of the dwarves is one of my favorite quests. The fact that it starts off giving you zero information to use, but is perfectly solvable just by paying attention while doing other quests is just, it's just fantastic. So where do we go from here? Well, one rank requires we pay our dues, so that's a couple hundred gold gone. You'll also need a wizard staff to reach the rank of wizard, so we can either pay 5,000 gold we don't have, or we can, um, ask. Yeah, ask a former guild member for one, who lives in a cave called Sud in Sheogorod. I don't think she'll let us ask. Once we got the staff, we can get promoted. Oh, but hold those horses, because we have something big to talk about. Training. One of my favorite aspects about Morrowind is that factions require you have the necessary skills to properly fill your rank. Every faction has attributes and skills they prefer. Now, assuming you're being a logical person and playing to the specialization of the faction, these are reasonable skill requirements. However, this is an instance where the game is just twisting that knife into me. And that is due to my format. Had I played the one character doing all the factions, I'd have been alright. It'd have been fine. It'd have had two contractions when I should not have been using any. Point is, I have seven characters, and for six of them, the same thing happened at least once. They outquested the requirements. Now, if you play this game like a goddamn normal person, you're doing stuff like adventuring, freelance quest work, even working for other factions. That's what a reasonable person who isn't playing faction by faction in order to make a video series does. We have enough faction reputation to complete the final quest and become the Archmage, but we're severely underleveled. I need to gain 30 levels in a single skill to reach the requirements. This happened to Steals Your Wallet, and to a minor extent, Mace as well. Mace was actually very close to the necessary requirements in his blunt weapon ability, and that's because fighter skills tend to level really well compared to stealth and magic skills. So, in order to progress, I need to use a trainer. Trainers are a bit different from the later games. Later games put stipulations that you can only train five times per level. Morrowind has no such requirement. Cash provided, you can train from level one to max level, whatever that should be for your character, at trainers. But it isn't that easy. Like the later games, the trainers themselves have their own skill levels, corresponding to their lore level of mastery. You need these master trainers because only they can train you past skill level 70. Most skills, and mind should be paid to the word most, most skills have master trainers. Some don't appear. Some do appear but don't offer training, and some just don't have trainers. Of the ones who do exist and do work, only about two-thirds of them are mentioned anywhere. The rest have to be found. Hell, some of them may only be mentioned. One is hidden in a locked room. Another is hostile and attacks on sight, having to be calmed. Two require a high rank in a specific faction. So not only are their trainers rare people, but training costs money, and high-level training costs lots of it. I'll talk about making money in part four when I discuss House Halau. Just bear in mind that large stopping point in every playthrough, besides my final main quest playthrough, was stopping and setting aside time to farm money and skills in order to meet the requirements to level up. Again, this doesn't normally happen unless you're laser focused on completing factions as fast as possible with new characters. So once I finally reach destruction level 80, Edwina says that I should talk with the Archmage Trebonius about stepping down, as I'm clearly more committed to scholarship than he is. I ask him, and he accuses me of lusting after his position, and demands we settle this via duel to the death in arena. it's a pretty cool duel. Turns out he had an artifact called the Necromancer's Amulet that made him such a powerful wizard. Edwina said he was a strong battle mage, but he hardly met the conditions of battle mage. 
Anyways, the Mages Guild, scholarly institution, settles its management disputes via trial by combat, and I am now the Archmage. I'm not sure if I'm going to get a letter in the mail from Mikado telling me I'm being replaced. The Imperial Guilds of Morrowind are the bridge between the tutorial and the broader content of Morrowind, since Caius pretty much flat out tells you to go join one. Which is why it is important to pay attention to the starter quests, since this is likely to be the first impressions of everyone who played Morrowind past the first Mud Crab. The intrigue of the Thieves Guild line, the fun stuff like the Boudet Egg Mine and the Golden Eggs, or accidentally running into a powerful vampire in the Fighters Guild, and the mystery of the Dwarves quest requiring a bit of astute problem solving or uh, internet research to figure out. Despite how hard I may have gone on these guilds, they actually are pretty good. But when the Thieves Guild throws you into the deep end of crime, the Fighters Guild starts pitting you in unfair fights, and the Mages Guild engages in bureaucratic busywork, it colors people's impressions of the factions. One thing to mention, because of the non-linear approach to the faction quests in Morrowind, my experience of the guilds is slightly different than what yours can be. I mentioned Skink and Tree's Shade, but looking back I never went and did his quests, or that many of Rannis Athras's quests either. This non-linearity is what I love about Morrowind and, at the same time, is the biggest risk in terms of personal enjoyment. Which is probably one of the big reasons Oblivion Onward focused on linear quest lines leading players by the nose into controlled experiences. The Imperial Guilds in Morrowind are a strange thing. Between the Fighters and Thieves Guild War and the rather straightforward if simple Mages Guild, you hit the three archetypes of role-playing games. In the next part, we'll be discussing the Great Houses. You see those same three archetypes, but a lot more political intrigue. I think if love was shown to any of the factions, it was the Great Houses. Still, the guilds serve as a great starting point for any character, especially for players new to Morrowind. Time will give context to the name Rethan. He's an Imperial Spellblade, although I jokingly named his class Conman. As such, he went up to the largest building in Balmora, which turned out not to be a manor but a council hall for House Alone, and upon attempting to enrich myself, I decided to join up with the house. Of the three great houses, Halau is the friendliest to outlanders. This is not just evident in some kind of lore sense, but by the fact that they are themselves the most accessible to new players, who are outlanders in a way to the game of Morrowind. Of course, there is no way to not be an outlander, and it plays somewhat in part in the story of Radoran, while Telvanni does not really care. Halau is a merchant establishment, sucking up to the imperial government on one hand and engaging in a dirty war for Monopoly with the other. After joining, you're given the sort of task that is emblematic of Halau. You're given the disguise of a recently deceased Radoran and tasked with deceiving a Radoran quest giver into giving you information. Not only is it a perfect representation of the sort of faction warfare that you'll be getting with Halau and the lack of values that would cause them to adopt such a tactic, it's a direct interplay with the Radoran questline. Our next objective is to take down a business rival in Vivek. A great deal of House Halau can involve walking around at Vivek and, being at least somewhat conscious to this, I chose the Steed as my birth sign. This gave me a 25 point boost to speed, which made my character quite quick. It was, in fact, jarring to go from a character like Wiz, who was very slow, to one like Rethan, who is very fast. The quest itself has a complication. We are stealing an alchemy recipe from an alchemist who has stolen business from the Halau alchemist in Vivek. It pays to do business with Halau. Said alchemist cannot be convinced to give us the scroll and, to further complicate matters, she lives and works in a one-room studio apartment. There are three scrolls that can be stolen, the first in a locked chest, the second on her person, and the third on the table by the door. This early in the game, this job is quite difficult, but on the plus side, guards don't try to chase you down for sub-1000 gold bounties, which naturally means I can just take the scroll off the table, turn around, and walk out the door. And the guards aren't going to come from every corner of Vivek to arrest me for it. We were instructed, while we were here, to meet with Indrino Arethi. She's an alternate quest giver. Between the two, you have enough room to pick which is more convenient and still advance in the faction. Arethi's missions tend to be more focused towards work as an enforcer, while Dorvane's missions tend to be more business focused. Missions can be as simple as deliver this report across the hall to the treasury, or they can be like, take out a rival businessman's egg mine, but you can report this to him for a reward and not mess up the local economy. 
I'll give you some highlights for this part and not detail every quest. We're asked to convince a Guar hide salesman to buy hides from House Halau. He protests that Halau hides are dried out because they have to be shipped from the mainland, whereas Radoran hides come locally from Vardenfell. The first Radoran quest happens to involve one of the local Guar herders we're putting out of business, which helps set the tone of each house. This is where the speechcraft system can come into play. It's one of those things that most people I've seen on YouTube don't realize made the big difference in how the game's played. In Morrowind, and Oblivion to some extent, every NPC has a disposition with the player. This is influenced by the player's reputation, their bounty, the faction relationships, and some quests. This disposition can influence the turn of how quests proceed. NPCs with low disposition do not like you, and are less likely to comply with your requests or questions. NPCs with very low dispositions may even refuse to speak with you on topics and deny you access to their services. Disposition can be directly influenced via speechcraft. Now in Morrowind, speechcraft takes the form of four options. You could admire, intimidate, taunt, and bribe. Admire and bribe both raise disposition, but admiration's more difficult than bribery. Most people in Vardenfell are prepared to accept free money and the Ashlanders even see it as a thoughtful gift. Intimidate, on the other hand, is rarely useful. It relies on you being higher level than the person you're intimidating. As such, it doesn't work at lower levels, and since it doesn't work, it's easy to forget that it's an option when it would work. There is the odd quest where intimidation can be a solution, like this one. It is entirely possible to intimidate the Guar merchant into doing business with Halau, but since bribery and honey-coated words are often more reliable, and easier, Intimidate becomes unnecessary, and Bethesda, rather than solving the redundancy by making Intimidate more valuable, saw fit to remove it. I won't even go off on a tangent about speechcraft in the later games, although I will say in having recently replayed the game to get back into the groove of making these videos, I was able to find a bit more use out of Intimidate when I would pair it with uh, calm spells in order to calm NPCs who were hostile down. You could intimidate them, which would lower their attack value, and then they would become peaceful. Other options for disposition are as follows. Charm spells can temporarily raise a disposition, and since time stops for conversations in Morrowind, they only need to last a couple seconds to be effective. Imperials also have a racial ability to charm once a day, which I used a bit as a money and a time saver, although it becomes unnecessary later when you get better at speechcraft. Personality can also influence disposition, so if you fortify personality with a spell or with something like Tovani Bug Musk, or just by having a high personality, you can raise your disposition in the process. Trading is another option. Each time you successfully trade, your disposition will go up. Unfortunately, this is only temporary. So temporary, in fact, that leaving the dialogue window and immediately re-entering it will lose all that disposition. So merchants can be convinced into anything by selling a bunch of a single item repeatedly to them. I like the idea of building a relationship with merchants based on repeat business, but I would change this in two regards. Make the disposition boost permanent, or at least longer lasting, but give a cooldown to transactions to avoid the cheesers who will sell one arrow at a time from becoming best friends with all the merchants. Back to Halau. There's a mission where we deliver orders to a Radoran clothier living in Aldruin as a Halau spy. There's a quest where we have to solve a local murder of a Halau noble. This quest is interesting because there are two principal suspects, but no effective evidence that really exonerates either suspect. So the resolution can be done entirely by judgment. I think most people would agree that the Argonian that stands accused due to racism against the Scalies would be the lesser suspect, since the Dunmer suspect was described by a witness. But I know, as a player of this game, that there was no witness. Otherwise, the suspect would have had a bounty and been arrested the second he left the manor. The final quest from Balmora entails maintaining the Halau monopoly on Ebony. The East Empire company in Ebonheart is threatening to buy Ebony from Redoran unless we cut our prices. So we have two options. Convince the head of the EEC to renew the contract for another year, or go assassinate the head of Redoran's only Ebony mine and shut down their operations. To be thorough, I did both. Renewing the contract is much easier, since that's simply a disposition check. Assassinating the head of mining operations, Darns Tedalin, is more difficult, as he is a capable spellcaster. Our reward for being thorough, though, is a comfy suit of glass boots, greaves, and a cuirass. Glass armor is a very rare reward, and I appreciate it being the reward you get for going the extra mile on this quest. On the Arethi side of things in Vivek, our first notable quest involves reinforcing Halau fighters who went to Odornaran to kill a rogue Telvani and rescue their prisoner. The Halau sent have messed up the situation, forcing a stalemate between the two sides. 
I will note now that the other side of this quest is to be dispatched by Telvanni to kill the Halau fighters. This can be a bit of a challenge. Odunaran is remote, and both the Telvanni wizard and one of his summons, a Dramora, can pose quite a challenge to new players. To complicate matters still, you can't actually rest in the tower due to there being an inaccessible room full of ghosts preventing resting. It's a neat trick. The wizard, Mylan Faram, has a key to the prisoner's cell, so once he's defeated, it's simply a matter of returning the lost sister back into the Halau force's hands. We also get dispatched to convince the Zainab Ashlander camp to sell their ebony to House Halau. Apparently, they've recently entered the market with their own source. Well, upon arriving at the camp, which tended to bug out and not spawn, we get directed to their Gulakan Ashabal. We can either compliment him or be direct with obvious results. Then we can hit him with some market logic. If we both sell ebony, the price will drop. This is good for both Halo and the Zainab, as it means that more smiths would be able to access the material, which would result in an increase in sales and it would weaken the imperial monopoly on the resource. He will agree to this. If we plead we don't have enough, he will simply end the conversation. Arathi's next quest is to find a sunken wreck and recover its valuable cargo, a Daedric Wakizashi. The rather obvious reward of this quest is the blade itself, rather than the gold. There is only one quest beyond this from Arethi, and more than enough reputation to go around to simply not turn it in and still advance, so I don't, as this is a decent weapon to hold on to for the time being. But to advance in House Olau, past the third rank, we need a sponsor. This is true of all houses, and since we're always an outlander, this is the general response. Oh. There is one counselor who would dare to sponsor us, a man famous for writing the Lusty Argonian Maid, yes, the short blade skill book. He has a lesser known work, a play called the Three-Legged Guar. When, wait, th Guar are bipeds? How would they... Oh. This man is Crassius Curio, and he's willing to sponsor us for a price. If we strip off all our clothes, he will sponsor us. He doesn't explicitly want anything from us other than our nude figure, so it's kind of a half Me Too moment. Anyways, Curio sponsors us and gives us the instruction to go to Caldera and work for Odrell Helvi, and keep Curio updated on what Helvi has us do. This is good and all, except for the fact that Curio lives atop the Halau Canton in Vivek, which means we'll get a lot of trips to the city, and by the way, Halau Canton is pretty much as far from fast travel as you can get. Helvi's in charge over in Caldera. We dealt with him in the Thieves Guild quest line, stealing his prized history book collection and donating it to charity, and we'll be dealing with him in the Redoran quest line. His first orders are to deliver a sealed document to Nisi Loradri in the Halau vaults. Under no circumstances are we to deliver them to the head of the treasury, Baron Allen. There are a few ways about this quest. The lemming route is to do as he asks as directly as possible. You net a very small reward of only 100 gold. You can also go to Baron Allen, who will pay you 500 gold for reporting to him, but this reflects negatively with Helvi. You can also report it to Ravon Arvel, another Halau counselor, although how exactly you'd figure out to go to him is beyond me. Finally, you can report it to Curio, as he requested initially, you get the 500 gold reward, and he's discreet enough not to let the news of your deception reach Helvi. His next task is to figure out who has stolen the Caldera mining contracts from the Caldera mine, retrieve them, and kill the thief. We have two suspects, but can easily narrow it down to one, El Musa de Mori, and at a high disposition, she will admit the theft and give you the documents. However, she'll ask you to let her live. Also, if you're part of the Thieves' Guild, she will admit it to you freely. Curio concurs, noting that Demori is actually a member of the Thieves' Guild, adding intrigue to the situation. He suggests I let her escape. I do, and I deceive Helvi as to her identity. He is disappointed, but this does not strain our relationship with the Thieves' Guild, whose services I've used to clear bounties and the like during this playthrough. Helvi then asks us to replace some erroneous land deeds of the Escadian Isles in the Halau Records Office. The deed is fake and can be dealt with in three ways. Again, there's the limbing option where you do the task and replace the deed. You can report to Curio, who will have you quote, buy the deed, unquote from Baron Allen for a small sum, convincing Helvi that you did the job while changing nothing. The last option is to report it to the landowner, who is Ravon Arvel. He has the best reward, an invisibility ring, and also suggests we copy the real deed and deceive Helvi. Helvi's next task is to collect rent and taxes from two farmers in the Isles. They both owe 50 gold each. 
and we are to kill them if they refuse. The lemming root can go one of two ways. The first is that they obviously can't pay the debt, they're farmers, and you kill them. The second is that you can accept one of the farmer's guar, Corky, who can then be sold to a guar herder for 200 gold, which settles the debt. Or you can go to Curiel or Arvel. Curio will give you 500 gold to settle the matter, suspecting Helvi simply wants the farmers dead. Arvel will give you 100 gold and his appreciation. Lastly, you can simply pay out of pocket. This is the fast thing to do. Finally, Helvi has a big request. He wants us to smuggle, well, um, covertly transport five pieces of raw ebony to Drynar Varion in Aldrun. Now, ebony smuggling is illegal. Although you can't get caught, you can report it. You can also go the limbing route, smuggling the ebony and getting paid 500 gold. Curio suggests we take the ebony to Sagunavis Mantidius at Buckmoth Legion Fort. We have to convince him. This entails giving him the ebony and implicating both Varion and Helvi. Now, note here. If you don't have the ebony in your inventory, but give him the ebony, it reduces your encumbrance by 50 points, regardless. The weight of the ebony. This means I can still sell the ebony and become even lighter, although this is obviously an exploit. This is Helvi's final mission, as he gets sent to prison afterwards if you go the curio route. I'm not really sure what happens if you go full lemming with him. I guess he just sticks around and curio proceeds to give you missions, disappointed at how much of a pushover you are. While we're on the topic of ebony smuggling, let's talk about Vardenfell's controlled substances. Ebony and glass smuggling are illegal as they are rare materials used by the Empire for weapons and armor. Moon sugar and skooma are dangerously addictive substances that plague non khajiit societies. Dwemer artifacts are illegal, I assume to discourage the desperate from going on dangerous missions to Dwemer ruins. And ash statues are illegal, as in Vardenfell, the temple is trying to curtail the spread of the sixth house. Some merchants will refuse to do business with you if you're in possession of moon sugar or skooma, the exceptions generally being Khajiit, like Azura at the Balmora Mages Guild, who bought half of Vardenfell's moon sugar supply that I recovered in drug busts during my playthrough. This was an occasional inconvenience since I would try to do business with a merchant and happen to be in possession of these substances, so they would refuse. I think there's a missed gameplay opportunity with these substances. For instance, how cool would it be if travel services like boats, silt striders, and teleporters would refuse to transport you if you were in possession of a controlled substance? Suddenly, the quest to implicate Helvi becomes a lot more nuanced because you actually have to smuggle ebony to complete it. You could even add features like guards confronting you if you're carrying materials, taking bribes to look the other way, or adding a bounty if you're caught smuggling. Then, later, when you're a high-ranking member of an official organization, you might be able to acquire a license to possess some of these items. That would raise the restrictions, although clean merchants still might not deal in them. Drugs and ash statues would still be illegal. Unfortunately, later games would go in the opposite direction. The idea of controlled substances was dropped, likely due to players complaining about how inconvenient that merchants wouldn't do business with them while they were carrying drugs, and the Empire stopped enforcing its laws. Anyways, Curio's first mission involves getting an outlaw to pay smuggling fees to Halau. I'll speak of the devil. Most of the quests is finding the outlaw, who is aboard his ship by Halau Oed, and getting him to pay his protection money. I've heard the argument that Curio is anti-corruption. If anything, he is just as corrupt as the best of them. He's simply better at blackmail and deception, being a scheming, conniving imperial after all. We're in the end game of House Halau now. First, we need to set our stronghold construction. You can do this very early, and I believe the idea was that you could build your stronghold concurrently while doing the quests, as much of the stronghold process is simply waiting for the actual construction to be done. Each great house builds a stronghold and involves some basic steps. First, the Duke, Vedam Drin, has to assign a construction contract. He does this simply with the request that you have Vardenfell's best interests at heart against the threats posed to it. Then you'll have to pay a member of your house to oversee the project. With Halau, you can haggle with a merchant to get the price down and even trade for it, which is a mechanical demonstration in line with how the faction operates. Mercantile is a broken mess of a skill. It's a shame too, considering how prevalent it is. I don't like the idea of universal skills in Elder Scrolls, those being skills that every class has to engage with. For example, bypassing a lock can be done multiple ways tied to multiple different skills. Convincing somebody can be done through speechcraft or illusion. Mercantile, however, is a bottleneck for all playstyles. There's no build that cannot benefit from having the skill, but at the same time, 
it's broken. For instance, there's a sweet spot of the skill at around level 70. Past this spot and traits will actually offer less and less if they have a high disposition. It's weird. Prices can sometimes be better for players with a low mercantile and bribes, which are influenced by mercantile, but instead give experience to speechcraft. Mercantile also levels in a backwards fashion. You would think that you would get more experience turning a 2500 gold transaction into a 3000 gold one, but no, you get more experience proportional to the percentage change, meaning that turning a 2 gold sale into a 3 gold sale is a better display of mercantilism than a 500 gold increase on an individual sale. Making money is an important part of Morrowind, more so than Oblivion or Skyrim. In those games you can simply play and acquire more money than you can ever spend. This is primarily due to trainer costs more than anything else. So, how does one make money in Morrowind? Well, generally, the transaction system is fairly robust. Every item has what is a fair value. When you try to sell an item, the sale price will be lower than the fair value. When you try to buy an item, the sale price will be higher. The spread on these prices is dependent on your disposition and mercantile. In addition, the amount you spend or receive from a transaction can be influenced. The amount you can influence is determined by your mercantile skill. Merchants have a fixed amount of gold to spend on transactions. This amount can be temporarily increased should you use their other services, like training or enchanting. This is important, as many items in Morrowind's late game will exceed the value available to most, if not all, merchants in the game. Thus, trying to get the full value on these items is tricky, but possible. For instance, getting a custom enchantment that costs 50,000 gold, then selling a Daedric weapon at that price is effectively trading that Daedric weapon you aren't going to use anyways for a useful enchantment. But what are the two exceptions I mentioned? Those who've played Morrowind before are likely screaming at me to mention Creeper and the Mudcrab Merchant. Unfortunately, I didn't get any footage of Mr. Merchant on the Xbox, since he's fairly remote and I didn't want to make the journey, but that's okay. He's just a drunk Mudcrab, he looks like all the others. Creeper is a scamp living with orcs who has 5,000 gold. He generally buys most items, barring alchemy ingredients, clothes, and literature. Since he's considered a creature merchant, he has no disposition and will buy and sell items at their fair value. No haggling necessary. The mudcrab merchant has similar stipulations, but has 10,000 gold to trade, his downsides being the journey across the water and nondescript appearance. There isn't really an in-game reason for these characters provided, barring a vague reference to the mudcrab from Mayik the Liar, so if you aren't reading the wiki, chances are pretty good it could be a long time before you ever run into one of these characters, assuming you didn't kill the mudcrab while you were passing by. I guess the museum in Mournhold bears mentioning. In Tribunal, there's a museum which can purchase certain artifacts. Most artifacts in the game are priced in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of gold range. They are all exceptionally valuable, as the base value of items is meant to signify those items' rarity. These are the sort of things that end up in the hands of a head of state. Of course, you can acquire many of these items, and most of my characters naturally came into a possession of a fair few of them. They can be sold for half value up to 30,000 gold at the Museum of Artifacts. 30,000 gold is generally sufficient to meet all my character's training needs, although my lack of Xbox footage as of writing this indicates I never did use the museum's services to make money. After a few days, we're tasked with checking in on the Stronghold. This is a way of giving you the location, which for Halau is the Odai Plateau, southwest of Balmora. It's the most convenient of the three locations. After checking in with the foreman and returning with the news, phase one will be complete after a few more days. Phase two will entail solving some problem. For Halau, it's increasing the land value by investing in a Kwama mine. We have to cure the Queen of Blight and recruit some miners. After that, a few days pass and phase two is complete. To complete the Great House quest lines, you only ever have to reach the end of phase two, although phase three does have some extra benefits. After phase one, Curio will tell us that Radoran has constructed their own stronghold at Bal Isra without getting a contract from the Duke. Since this stronghold is an illegal expansion, he sends us to deal with our counterpart in House Radoran, Indaris. At Bal Isra, Indaris isn't much of a fight. He has quite a collection of valuables and his guards can be killed for even more. Afterwards, Curio figures we need more support in House Halau and sends us to get the support of Dram Barrow. Barrow is hidden, so after a small investigation, we're told he's somewhere in St. Olm's, Canton. A search of the plaza reveals a haunted manor, inside which is a locked door concealing Barrow and his guards. Barrow is willing to support you if we can defeat his champion, Guarding the Bold. After a fight in the arena, in which Guarding concedes at load health, Barrow supports our nomination. 
Following this, and phase two of our stronghold, Curio has another mission. This time, House Tovani has constructed their own illegal stronghold. Again. And we're to eliminate it. We're sent to tell Uverith to take on the wizard of the same name. Again, this is not a tough fight, although Uverith does not have as many valuables as Indaris did, which is weird because Talvani are usually the ones with the valuable stuff. We are now a house father, and Curio directs us to further work under the Duke, Vedem Dren. Thus ends our... professional relationship with Crassius Curio. The Duke, himself a former leader of Halau, has some work. Beryl Sala, leader of the Ordinators, has been a pain to House Halau. So why are the Ordinators harassing Halau? While it's not directly stated, the Ordinators are the militant religious branch of the Temple, and are members of the Great House Endoral. House Endoral has no territory on Vardenfell, being located entirely on the mainland, and are opposed to the Imperial Law. So while under the pretense of opposing the Sixth House, Endoral is likely using the opportunity to try and expand into Halau territory on Vardenfell. The Duke asks that we speak to Archcanon Tholar Serioni on the matter. He agrees to help control the Ordinator, provided we recover the Robe of St. Rorus, an artifact the Ordinators themselves failed to recover. The artifact is inside of Asamanu, which is, strangely enough, not the only cave or name that is a reference to the Ass Man. Curiously enough, Serioni left out the fact that the cave is occupied by Sixth House cultists. Dagoth Halevul here is in control of seven sleepers who will give you one rep apiece for talking to them thanks to breaking the hold Dagoth Ur has over them. But there's not really a way to know who the sleepers are, it's just one of those happy rewards you get for talking to everybody. The robe isn't all that powerful, it's slightly better than the average healing enchantment you can find at enchanters, but it's not really worth trying to keep. We return the robes, embarrassing the ordinators who failed in recovering it, and Serioni promises to speak with Beryl Sala about the Ordinator's relationship with House Halau. Dryn, impressed, says that advancement to Grandmaster is contingent on control of the Kamana Tong, due to the sway it holds over the rest of Halau's political functions. It is unfortunately in the hands of Orvis Dryn, the Duke's brother. He would greatly prefer we find a non-lethal solution to the problem, but admits it is a last-ditch effort. Orvis will doubt our ability to run an enterprise like the Kamana Tong and wants to know how he can trust us. I use my natural Imperial ability to temporarily deceive him into agreeing, just as Tiber Septim did with Vivek. A potential alternate solution for the enterprising Halau who somehow sucks at speechcraft, which should be rare, is to find a note that implicates Orvis in a conspiracy to assassinate his brother for interfering with his smuggling business and use it as blackmail. The last solution is to kill him, which displeases the Duke, but he will still promote you. This can potentially be a part of the Thieves' Guild and Morag Tong quest lines. There's quite a few quests that will correspond here, even the main quest. And thus, we become the Grandmaster of House Hello. Now, Rethan's story is not finished. He will feature again in Part 5. I'll also be going into more conclusive thoughts into Halau after discussing the other two houses. But until then, House Redoran. Jib Indaris was a saint. He was known as Saint Jib, the Eradicator. He went down in history for his feat of driving the cliff racers out of Morrowind. Hey, uh, this is me in editing. I was uh, planning on doing the Saint Jib stuff like two months before the Young Scrolls EP came out, so serendipitous thinking, I guess. Saint Jib is a rather comical reference to the first character you meet in Morrowind, having been put through the Skyrim Retconia into becoming a hero. But are cliff racers really as annoying as people claim? <laughs> yes, they are faster than 300 speed. They can block your attempts to rest. They make an ungodly noise and tend to gang up on you when working around the ghost fence, all the while being difficult to actually hit. It's very little surprise they are hated and that a gag character was created to jokingly drive the species extinct. Jib and Doris is, then, fittingly our protagonist in the story of House Radoran, the early years on his path to sainthood. House Radoran is, in a sentence, the honor house of Morrowind. Although they would say this is because of their virtue, I attribute this to the fact that their historical holdings are very close to the Nords. 
They are home in Aldrun and thus must be traveled to from Balmora in order to join. Our first quest, working under Radoran, is to take care of some mud crabs that have harassed the citizens Gwar herd. This is a quest that requires specific attention be paid to the navigational directions given since it's very easy to get lost on the way there. And sure enough, mud crabs have been killing and dragging Gwar off into the swamp. We kill them and get paid by the herder and weed. As for our reward from Naminda, our steward, nothing. We get nothing. Our next task is to deliver a cure disease potion to Ald Velothi. It's a remote fishing village lacking any fast travel options, although it is fairly close to cool. We are told, while we're up there, by the ranking member of Redoran that he may have further work for us, but for now to return to Naminda. Our reward is again... nothing. While up near Ald Velothi, we find a woman who dropped her ring. She offers to pay us in sexual favors if we get it for her. Only it's a trap, and Azura herself points out the folly of our actions. No good deed goes unpunished, Outlander. Luckily, players good enough to survive, or good enough to exploit the AI, are rewarded with the Amulet of Shadows, which gives an 80-point chameleon effect, basically turning us invisible when we use it. A trader went missing near Margan or Nysus. Nobody in Nysus knows anything, but the people in Margan do. Apparently a recent ash storm hit, and it was bad by Vardenfell standards. A trader apparently ended up going near an ancestral tomb west of town, right before the storm hit. Sure enough, we find the trader in the tomb. The door apparently had gotten stuck during the storm. We take him back to Margan and get our reward. Nothing. Next, we're tasked with retrieving a founder's helm stolen by Alvis Terry of Halau. He stole the helm from an ancestral tomb and has taken to wearing it at a bar. We need to maintain our house honor and avoid simply murdering him and retrieving the helm. I sexually assault him, grabbing his ass, incurring a 25 gold bounty, and apparently also the legal right to murder him. I don't think this normally works, it's not supposed to, but hey, we got the helm and it didn't count as murder. I even do the honorable thing of stripping his corpse of all his armor and selling it to a merchant. Then I turn myself in, pay off the rather small bounty, and walk free to claim our reward. Nothing. The Guar Herder is having trouble again, this time with bandits stealing Guar. Naminda remarks most bandits in Vardenfell are outcast Ashlanders, but it actually turns out to be a diverse bunch of Outlanders. This is where I really demonstrate how broken the Amulet of Shadows is, since the AI can't really handle dealing with an attacker who is invisible and stays invisible when in Chameleon. So I should explain. There is invisibility, and there is chameleon. Invisibility is a flat effect. If you have it, you are fully invisible. However, interacting with anything, and I mean anything, breaks the effect. Talking to someone, going through a door, picking up an item, anything. Chameleon has a point value, meaning magic costs can vary based on the effect value. Chameleon improves your chances of not being detected, so it's more costly than invisibility, but has the benefit of allowing the effect to continue through actions. An 80-point chameleon is effectively invisible. Most NPCs in the game cannot see you with it on. And it doesn't break when we attack, meaning NPCs can do nothing except try to run away when I use this amulet. It is quite powerful, although it is also limited by its charge, taking a bit to recharge enough to use again, so I don't solve every problem with it. If we return to the herder, she'll pay us in more weed. Naminda doesn't pay us at all for the work. Let's sidetrack and go to Ald Velothi. Our first mission there is to take care of an old menace that has returned to plague the village, Old Bluefin. It's a slaughterfish, and a tough one, although its heightened abilities are still limited by the fact that while I'm on land, I do not exist to aquatic creatures. And get this, in exchange for dealing with a threat to public safety, I get paid. Albeit in 10 Druwax, but hey, Druwax is worth 100 gold apiece. Albeit this is a fighter character, so he's not going to get anywhere near that, but it's still a payment for services rendered. Actually, Redoran itself wasn't even going to pay me, it was the fishermen in the village who all pitched in to reward me for taking care of a problem. Next, we're sent to the Ashimanu Mine to deal with an infected shock. Another trip to the Ass Man Cave. It's really that simple, and of course, we aren't paid for the job. We're then sent to deal with a Kagudi den near Ashamanu Mine. But instead of the Kagudi in the den triggering the quest, we have to kill a Kagudi on the road near it to do it properly. No reward. We're asked to check in on some soldiers sent to Shishi, a Telvani base. After a fun trip up there, we meet up with the men. They say they've cleared the base, although the lead wizard has yet to be found. 
You can turn the report in now, although you can also ask another man who keeps hearing sounds somewhere downstairs. Turns out with some exploration that a Breton skull reveals a hidden basement where the wizard is hiding. With him taken care of, we return to Ald Velothi for our reward of nothing. At this point, our path forward in the house is to seek a sponsorship. Lucky for us, Athens Serethi is under attack from assassins. We go and defend him. <laughs> and although there is no reward, he does offer to sponsor us. No, oh, no, wait. There is a reward. We get paid the standard guard rate of 200 gold. So why have I been pointing out the fact that Radoran has been so stingy in paying us for our work? Factions in Morrowind have a requirement that the factions of later games lacked. Skill requirements. Each faction has a list of skills they favor and requirements to meet to climb those ranks. The real stopper is that the highest ranks of factions require skills be higher than 80. For most people, this is easily attainable just by playing the game. Pure mages may need to train a bit due to magic skills training slowly, but for anyone using a skill that involves bashing things, playing the game like a normal human being is good enough. None of my characters, however, were played like normal human beings. Because of the way I took notes and the recording limitation of hard drive space, each character was played generally focusing down one faction at a time. This means that every character inevitably fell short when it came to skills. The way you're meant to offset this in Morrowind is through trainers. This however is costly, and I feel as though the real victors of Morrowind's story are the skill trainers who became rich as a consequence. What would you do if you had an eternity to do nothing but wait? Do you keep busy? Do you daydream? Do you freak out? He trained. How can someone get so into something that nothing else matters? Some guilds provide adequate enough income to achieve this. House Halau often paid out 500 or even 1,000 gold for tasks completed, while the Thieves and Fighters Guild provided plenty of opportunities to make money while questing. House Radoran does not. The average quest for House Radoran has no reward. There quickly came a very real problem where I simply could not advance in the house due to skill limitations that were caused by the fact that I wasn't being paid. Now the way that a normal person deals with this is to go adventure, which I generally did not do due to recording, or to go do another faction that does pay, which I also could not do due to my note taking. So when House Radoran refused to pay me, I forced them to. See, at a point you are recommended to go speak with Feral Retherin in Vivek. He has a decent number of quests for the house. However, finding Retherin was a pain, I wasn't given adequate directions. And I searched most of Redoran Canton for the bastard. Then I found the Redoran Treasury. It turns out they've been holding out on me. They were not poor, these were not hard times, and I was not doing charity work. They're rich. Like, real fucking rich. And turns out, in the process of getting to the treasury, I had stolen a key that could unlock the door. Gradually, the ordinators would path out, and I would close the door behind them until none were left in the room. Then I looted it. I got a free set of ebony armor and a ton of valuables. Went to Creeper and offloaded it. Suddenly, what was my poorest character became my richest, and then I spent 25,000 gold training my skills to become high enough that I wouldn't need to worry about it again. So you see, it wasn't a matter of me acting dishonorably and acquiring large amounts of material possessions. It was me satisfying the needs of the guild for strong leadership while compensating myself for the sweat off my back. Since I got my hands on a full set, let's talk about ebony armor. Armor in Morrowind is divided into three classifications, light, medium, and heavy. Clothes also count as unarmored, I guess, but you wear those under your armor. It works simply enough. The better the protection offered by armor, the heavier it is. Lighter armor meant you could carry more, but it also meant sacrificing armor value. Medium armor was a happy medium, but it was offset by the fact that it was rare to find. Ebony is heavy armor, and it is heavy. But it is also good at protecting the body, provided you had the skill to wear it. It's not as simple as equipping Daedric armor and then being protected. You had to be conditioned to wear the armor to see the benefits. 
Characters in light armor will score a higher armor value if they have a high skill, compared to characters in heavy armor with a low skill. Ebony is also some of the best heavy armor we'll be getting. Daedric is better, but it's also exceptionally rare. Equipment in Morrowind isn't as simple as saying, oh, well, this has the biggest number, so I'll wear that. Wearing partial sets means you have more room in your inventory to carry loot. It can also mean you move faster since you aren't as weighed down. Equipment was also made with the idea in mind that it should be appropriately rare. It's a sign of mastery and danger to see an opponent wearing glass or ebony armor. Almost exclusively will you see guards wearing bone mold, orcs wearing orcish, and ordinators wearing endoral armor. Ranks with legionaries can be told by their armor set. Morrowind's design philosophy towards armor seems more so geared towards lining the armor skills up with the armor that is diegetically a part of the game world, rather than designing armor assets around the mechanics in tiers. I think this is better as it can feel a bit stilted how the world gradually escalates its usage of armor types in Oblivion and Skyrim. While I discuss armor, I should also mention durability. Durability, in the eyes of some, is an annoyance that must never again enter the design of video games. I disagree. Durability is a factor to consider in the preparation before trips. It's also an element that can introduce surprise into a situation. A piece of armor or weapon breaking forces the player to adapt to what is an unexpected situation. However, I can understand why durability is disliked. It can be seen as tedious to maintain equipment, and video games aren't supposed to be more tedious than real life, right? I guess, and to some extent, Morrowind does fall victim to durability falling on the side of tedium as a mechanic. Higher-end items are more durable as traits, which in turn means a reward for good gear is not having to repair it as often. If that is a reward, then why have the mechanic? I did like the Oblivion idea of allowing skilled armorers to boost their durability above 100%, although, again, that ultimately begs the question of why bother with the mechanic if the reward is to not have to deal with it. To me, durability should represent the prospect of potentially losing an item if it's broken. This would make routine preventative maintenance more rewarding, but obviously this also creates the risk of losing something valuable, potentially even irreplaceable. That does, however, reward the higher-end items with high durabilities, since it decreases the chance you'll lose the item since you would have such a long window to repair it. Think of it like this. Lots of games, including Elder Scrolls games now apparently, have hunger mechanics. Why do hunger mechanics exist? Like durability, they are an intentional annoyance that is dealt with in an arbitrary fashion. Proponents, however, argue that hunger is a good mechanic because it rewards preparation, or because it can make a tough situation where there is limited access to food or repair more tense as a consequence. It also carries the consequence of death as a failure state, which is more punishing than the consequence of simply losing an item, even temporarily. Durability is an intentional annoyance, but intentional annoyances are kind of the point of video games. What is an enemy in a game but an intentional annoyance standing between you and hollow victory? Saying that durability being removed from Skyrim is justifiable because it was only annoying anyways opens a rather nasty can of worms when it comes to the question of why we even play video games in the first place. Anyways, let's get back on track with House Redoran, since we should be done training by now. To start, we need to get our sponsorship from Serethi, and advance far enough to start our stronghold. I learned from my last playthrough to not put it off, and to start it as so I can do it while I'm also doing the quests. Like before, we need the construction contract from the Duke. He has the same request, our pledge to help Morrowind against its enemies. The person overseeing our construction also needs 5,000 gold to finance the process. Unlike Halau, this is non-negotiable. Luckily, we have plenty of cash to spare from robbing the Rodoran treasury, so in a way it is... free? Now that the process has started, we can get to work for Serethi. He will sponsor us provided we can rescue his son from Bolvin Venom, who has kidnapped him. Sure enough, a note in Venom's manor reveals that they are entertaining a special guest, and it is Serethi's son. The guards get mad if we try to let him out, although using Chameleon kind of breaks this quest. Anyway, Serethi, reunited with his son, promotes us. Although there is still no reward, we also no longer need it. Our next task is to deal with the principal reason Serethi's son was kidnapped. He has been accused of murder. Well, maybe let the Imperial Guards handle it, it's what they get paid to do. Athen claims that his son is innocent, as the victim was friends with his son. Even though there is a witness, Athen figures his son may have been under a spell and requests we check his room. Sure enough, we find a suspicious ash statue. Varvar will say he's been having odd dreams since he received the statue and asks us to take it. 
We then get directed to take the statue to Loro Serrano over at the temple, who asks you to arrange a meeting with him and his son and exonerates Varver of murder, since he was likely under the influence of the Sixth House. This was likely done as Serethi's house is friendly to outlanders, a stance the Sixth House does not tolerate. Now that Serethi's house has been sorted, we can get back to the real work, which is defending House Rodoran from slander. Our contact and Vivek give us a similar mission, and here's how they contrast. Andres Norano, a Halau noble, notable as he had his key stolen from him by Steals Your Wallet, has been slandering House Rodoran. We are to honorably duel him, emphasis on honorably, as simply killing him would be a PR nightmare for Rodoran. He accepts the duel, but is woefully unprepared and loses. Contrast this with Meryl Halano, who is accusing a Rodoran counselor of adultery. Halano will not honorably duel anybody, and is likely just saying that as he is under the influence. I decide to handle the situation appropriately. You will die. I murder him. Naturally, this looks bad, so allow me to explain my logic. The way Meryl wants you to deal with the situation is to either stoke his ego until he accepts to withdraw the slander or to bribe him. These are positive reinforcements for negative behavior, and would only encourage other rowdy youth of Halau to join in on the slander. Since blood would eventually be drawn on a larger scale from such an outcome, nipping this behavior in the bud is important. We positively reward Narano by not killing him as he abides our traditions and faces us in a duel. We negatively reward Halano by murdering him as he acts dishonorably. So although the reputation of Radoran is hurt in the short term by this action, in the long term we have saved lives and preserve our honor. That's not how the game sees it. I figure I'm not going to hear the end of it from Retherin for this, so I just go back to Serethi. Next, he wants me to deal with smugglers in Shurinbal. This is an easy affair, although the cave in question is remote. While I'm out, I check in at Aldvalothi. Virith has a new request. A local Daedroth worshipper named Gordal is wanted by the people of Aldvalothi. This should be a challenge. However, my spear and his broken AI actually make it quite easy. He's also wearing a full set of ebony. I think this was intended to be the turning point in Redoran where you start to gear up since the reward for this is an enchanted ebony spear, a free set of ebony armor that Gordal was wearing, but I already have a free set of ebony armor from the Redoran treasury, so... I know this is a bit of a non sequitur, but let's talk about my spear. Spears are great. They allow you to do damage at a distance at the cost of being long and unwieldy to use. Naturally, something as varied and unconventional as a spear in an RPG setting was cut from the later games for the usual swords, axes, and maces. I suspect spears were cut from oblivion due to the skill crunch, that being the reduction in the number of skills from 27 to 21. Each specialization went from 9 skills to 7. Axe and Blunt were combined, medium armor was cut from the game, but to facilitate the cuts in stealth spec, hand to hand got moved into combat, while short blade was combined into blade. This meant that combat spec still had one more skill to reach the desired seven, so the spear was lost from the game. Spears as weapons are historically associated with formation fighting, something that generally never came about in the Elder Scrolls setting due to the prevalence of destruction magic. Their popularity, instead, is owed to regions that routinely have to deal with disease, Valenwood and Morrowind. For Morrowind in particular, the threat of Blight and Corpus makes Spears a popular option amongst the buoyant armagers, as it allows them to stay out of reach of the sick. Since the Imperial Legions generally don't engage in formation fighting, there wasn't a pressing lore reason to keep Spears around in Oblivion. The other argument is that spears simply were not popular. Although I personally disagree, I can imagine that swords are handily the most popular, since as a weapon they are by far the most publicized. However, it's a situation where Bethesda engineered their unpopularity. Spears are uncommon, and upgrades few and far between. Contrast this with swords, which are very common, with many opportunities to upgrade, and with many of the game's most powerful weapons being swords. It's the same story with medium armor. It was given the short end of the stick in Morrowind, so people didn't use it, so it wasn't popular, so it got cut. Rather than try and keep spears, medium armor, and, well, throwing weapons for that matter in the game, and fixing the issues they had while abandoning the ridiculous idea that each specialization needs to be balanced in a single player game, the skills were simply dropped. The weapon skills of Morrowind provide a great deal of nuance for fighting characters. You can't just pick up any weapon you find out in the world and use it like a master. Short blades, long blades, axes, blunt weapons, spears, and hand-to-hand -hand were all different skills that played almost like martial arts. Short blades are fast and light, so they can work as backup weapons. Long blades are slower, two-handed long blades especially slow. 
Axes are great for chopping, although their historical value of, of breaking wooden shields and fortifications is underappreciated. Blunt weapons don't serve their purpose of breaking armor. Spears provide a longer reach and hand-to-hand. -hand. Hand to hand damages fatigue until knockout, and then does damage. You can also go straight to damage using Paralyze. It has the obvious upside of having no weight. I think they should have expanded on hand to hand. I know in Oblivion they added the special attacks, which is cool, but I'm thinking like special techniques that work like spell creation, like Paralyzing Fist. Just something that lurks like a martial arts anime, but lets you use a spellmaker to make your own moves. Instead, what was the most distinct fighting style, at least from its counterparts at the time, was cut come Morrowind. I suspect it's another in the long list of victims of scaling, where in an effort to fix the problems posed by scaling mobs in Oblivion, instead of fixing scaling, they quote, fixed, unquote, everything else. Just another victim of the skill crunch, although for hand to hand, its day came between Oblivion and Skyrim. Serethi has a new request. A Redoran noble has gone mad and has taken up residence in a cave called Milk, harassing travelers and demanding tribute. We need to solve the situation, however the noble in question is a friend of Serethi's, so we need to do this non-lethally if possible. He suggests I speak with his father in Ebonheart. While I'm in Ebonheart, I hear a rumor about unrest in Cyrodiil City, something about the legitimacy of the heirs. I don't think this will be relevant. I meet with Mandis' father, who says his son went mad after his granddaughter was kidnapped by the Telvanni lord, Divith Fear. He thinks finding and returning the daughter should cure his madness. This entails a trip to the remote Tel Fear. There's no fast travel points, as the man in question can't be bothered to do something so foolish. Once inside, we meet with Divith, who doesn't actually care if we take Mandis' daughter, he's far too busy. We let her out, and she gives us an amulet to take to her father. We do, making liberal use of Chameleon to dodge his guards who have taken to dealing with intruders with the sharp end of the sword, and when we give him the amulet, he says he'll stop demanding tribute, calming the guards down. Serethi says that in order to advance, we need support from other counselors. He suggests we start with the counselors Morvane and Remoran. Morvane, or rather Morvane's wife, requests that we clear out her manner of corpus beasts. Turns out they had killed her husband after they had received an ash statue, and not only did House Rodoran take the time to decide to let her take his spot as counselor, they haven't dealt with the manor full of corpus beasts that is drawing more to it on the edge of town. Our man Serrano is in the temple and is willing to destroy the ash statue after we retrieve it. Ramoran wants a bit more. He wants us to go up to Nysus and collect taxes, 60 gold pieces, and if we pay out of pocket, he'll refuse to give us support and softlock our game. So, after the round trip to Nysus, we're then tasked with finding a girl he's lusted after for years. Turns out she has a similar name to his personal bodyguard, who happens to be lusting after him, and at that suggestion, offers his support. You know, three paragraphs ago I was at a tower where the guy cloned himself four times and spent his days researching a cure for corpus and low-key banging his clones, so I'll let this slide. Anyways, we're a counselor now, and to advance, we need more counselors to support us, as well as phase two of our stronghold. We need guards, and are directed to the local fighters guild master, Perseus Mercius, to recruit them. He says he's willing to waive the fee if we free his friend from prison. Sadly, there is no option to just pay him, and we end up going to Vivek, freeing his friend, killing an ordinator, and returning. As for the counselors, we need the support of Larethi and Erebar. Venom will never give his support due to his vehement opposition to Outlanders, but as long as we have the support of all the other counselors, we can stand to claim the title of Archmaster. Larethi is willing to support us provided we can shut down the Caldera mining operation. This is not as simple as going and wiping it out, we need to do it honorably. So we start with trying to find proof of corruption. Odral Helvi, local corrupt overlord of House Ulau, has some secret ledgers hidden in his room that provide such proof. With evidence in hand, we can now shut down the mine. We're saving the evidence in the event that Duke asks any questions about why we took these actions. We learn from Caldera locals that if Dalina, a slave at the mine, were to be freed or killed, that the slaves would revolt. I free her. Lorethi says it was an unconventional solution, but it did end the Halau market domination. As for Erebar, he seems preoccupied and refuses to speak on the subject of our support. Serethi figures he may be getting influenced by the Telvanni, and we need to figure this out to gain his support. Asking around Telvanni town reveals that Master Neloth and Telnaga is holding Erevar's daughter hostage. Those damn Ancaps keep stealing our daughters. Anyways, I free her and the guards take exception to this, but since the non-aggression pact is at the heart of the Telvanni law, there are no questions asked about the dead guards. 
And since I successfully stole her, she is now my property, at least until we get back to Redoran territory. Erebar gives us our support on the council and a Redoran master helm. Well, a replacement helm anyways, the original was stolen. And after some waiting, our stronghold finishes phase two, and Serethi fills us in on Bolvin Venom. Bolvin was a successor to a long line of incompetent Redoran leadership. He was the one who, after the armistice, brought Redoran to Vardenfell. He effectively brought the house back from the brink of ruin, he however did so via strength of arms and a hatred of outlanders, and in the modern era this has put Redoran in a bad position. The house's view on tradition and honor has allowed it to be taken advantage of by Halau and Telvanni. In two instances, Redoran was forced to deal with slander from Halau, who abused the fact that Redoran took their honor seriously. In two instances, Redoran nobles had their children stolen by Telvanni, who abused the fact that Redoran followed the law so strictly. Serethi hopes for someone to lead Redoran who shares his quality of strong martial prowess and military leadership, but better understands the modern Redoran situation needs to treat its citizenship with kindness and justice, rather than alienating them. And, as a counselor, with support of all the other counselors, he figures that we are fit to rule, but Venom will not allow an outlander to become Archmaster. Thus, we must challenge him to an honorable duel. Venom initiates the conversation with his own challenge, to fight at the Vivek Arena. This is the logical action as Venom is likely confident that he is stronger than Indaris, and if he wins, he can remove an outlander from the council. He's a tough fight, full ebony with a Daedric weapon, I suspect this quest involved a free full set of ebony and ebony spear were likely preparatory for this conflict. It also helps I'm high level thanks to rank requirements. Did you know that Redoran consider looting the bodies of those you defeat dishonorable? So you don't get paid for your work, theft is dishonorable, looting is dishonorable, and stronghold payments are non-negotiable. You're just supposed to make whatever meager sum you can, die, pass it on to your kids who combine it to their meager sum, until after a thousand generations, your descendants have enough to maybe get sponsored. Is it actually possible to maintain your honor and make it to the end of Rador and questline? Maybe it's some kind of mechanical storytelling. Anyways, we're Archmaster as soon as we defeat Venom. You Morrowind regulars might recognize that this playthrough did not engage in the House Wars quests. This is because they were subsequent to the one slander quest where I murdered the guy, which was unappreciated. You are able to complete Redoran without fighting the other factions. I believe this is also possible in Halau, but I'm not sure about Tilvani. Jim and Doris will return in part 5. As for now... Uvarith was inspired by one of the characters on the Xbox loading screens. This guy. Yeah, you PC players might recognize the ones with the monsters, but there are a few new ones with characters on the Xbox. Since I spent so long on loading screens, I thought of a few memes that these screens are perfect for. Anyways, I was inspired by one with an Altmer vampire mage holding a Daedric Dai Katana. Originally, I was planning on having Uvarith be a vampire. Vampires in Morrowind are excluded from most factions on principle except Telvanni, because end cap rules. But, upon further inspection, some of the quest scripting gets broken due to vampirism, specifically due to certain quests which rely on introductory text, which gets replaced when you are diseased. So sorry guys, I ended up not getting any footage of vampire gameplay. So I'm going to throw this in post-com to try and explain why vampires are broken in Morrowind. There's a hierarchy of greetings that NPCs will use when meeting the player, which are either specific to them, quest-related, or general greetings that are shared among multiple NPCs. This hierarchy is based on the logical importance of the greeting, with stuff like locations, clothes, and classes having lower priority over quests, factions, and combat-related greetings. This is why in the next part a certain quest line is broken if you approach NPCs naked. Now, when you contract vampirism, most NPCs will get a general hostile greeting. Telvani, on the other hand, gets a friendly greeting. The problem has to do with how you progress a certain quest. Because one quest relies on a custom greeting that is always replaced with the vampirism greeting, you will never receive it. In addition, the aforementioned stronghold quest that is standard for each great house is also impossible as the Duke will not speak to you if you're a vampire. I have zero basis to say this, but I'm fairly confident that vampirism was a late stage feature that was added to the game, as it is very basic and your options as a vampire are fairly limited, but I am surprised that, since it was supposed to be a feature that vampires could join Telvanni, that this issue was not noticed. I know it's a meme to say Bethesda doesn't do QA, but if you have any experience working with the construction set, you'll know they would have had to have been doing some because of just how many lollipop sticks and cum this engine's made out of. To fix this issue, all you have to do is take this intro from Greeting 5 and put it 
initiated in greeting 1, so it takes priority over the vampirism greeting in greeting 2. Although this wouldn't fix it on the Xbox version since it has a special patched version. And actually, now that I think about it, they did fix the Dark Brotherhood glitch between the PC and Xbox releases. But I guess nobody had tried playing Vampire and House Tilvani during that time period. Or, or if they did, they didn't complain on the internet. Anyways, back to the scheduled analysis. Uvarith spent a short stint with the Balmora Mages Guild getting some basic spells set up for our future plans with House Tilvani. Tilvani starts in Sadrith Mora, which is an interesting town in its own right. For starters, I think you're supposed to come into the town via boat, go through the Gateway Inn and be introduced to the Hospitality Papers, which is a scam being run on Outlanders. Only I would wager most people get to Sadrith Mora for the first time through the Mages Guild at Wolverine Hall, since it's the superior form of travel. What stands out about the town is its buildings. Truly, in the world of identical adobe structures, the Mushroom House is king. Tavani buildings are often twisted, conforming to the demands of nature rather than any functional design, perhaps a reflection of the more naturalistic philosophies of Tavani, seeing the strengths of individuals as more important than the needs of common folk. While Balmora, Aldrun, and especially Vivek are heavily populated urban centers, Sadrith Mora is lacking in commoners. Almost every person in Telvani, which is more racially diverse a faction than even Halau, possesses entrepreneurial spirit or a talent of some kind. You'll find that there is a surprising lack of sixth house sleepers in Telvani territory, an affliction caused by a weak sense of individuality that allows the sixth house to control the sleepers. In the same vein, the tribunal temples of Telvani are token gestures. The masters of Telvani are as old as the gods themselves, so the temple has little place in their society. You can also perceive this as a negative since the temple does perform services for the poor, but there aren't many poor in Telvani society. Thus, Telvani society is in fact very progressive. But for how ideal it sounds, it has its flaws, as will be demonstrated. Joining Telvani involves entering the council house and, well... The frame rate is not good in here on Xbox. Tilvani has a very unusual quest structure for Morrowind. Most factions in Morrowind will typically send you quest giver to quest giver. Each one have five or six tasks to complete. For the early days of Tilvani, you simply contract through the mouths or the masters themselves. Members of the Telvani Council are represented by Mouths in Sadrith Mora. They represent the interests of the Telvani, while their lords can continue their research in their towers. Tasks requested of you include things like retrieving alchemical ingredients, finding artifacts, and performing deliveries. And the rewards for these quests, rather than being gold, are often spells or artifacts. In fact, you can learn Mark and Recall very early in the house. I greatly appreciate that a magical faction actually teaches magic as part of its quest structure. So instead of having two quest givers each giving five quests, you have five quest givers each giving two quests. The progression is also much more forgiving. You don't really have to complete all the quests to get to the sponsorship stage. Early on, I am asked to deliver a skirt to Mistress Therana of Telbernora. I am advised by her mouth to be prepared to use an intervention spell should anything happen. This is because Therana has gone crazy. She keeps a naked Khajiit as a pet, and when you offer to give her the skirt, she accuses it of being cursed and asks you to put it on to prove it isn't, only to then attack you for doing so. You will suffer greatly! Another task entails delivering a note to Telfir and returning. It sounds unremarkable, until you realize that Telfir has no fast travel services. Water walking is an alteration spell. I mean, without water walking, what else is there? Looking at you, Skyrim alteration, looking at you. It plays an especially important role in Morrowind since so much of the terrain has been geared towards aquatic travel. Now while Oblivion did have the ability, it really wasn't as important since there wasn't much need for it. I mean, sure. There was an inland sea, but honestly with fast travel and the lack of need to go out on the water again, you don't need it. Skyrim was much the same way, there were some attractions out off the coast, but for the most part water walking was unnecessary, but lack of necessity doesn't mean the spell should just be cut. 
Speaking of cuts, levitate is another good option for avoiding the swim. It also performs the function of vertical access, such as in Telvanni Towers which don't have stairs, or in dungeons with secret areas. Levitate was cut from Oblivion, the reason being exterior-interior hybrid cells. The cities would be in cells separate from the overworld in order to help with performance, and levitate would expose the fact that the cities and the countryside were not seamless. I think there were better ways to handle the issue. Mournhold and Tribunal, for instance, didn't allow levitation for much the same reason, so perhaps there could be a magical bullshit lore reason to stop people from flying over the walls. I think most players would understand the limitation. The real reason they wouldn't, and perhaps won't, adopt this rule set is a shift in dungeon design. I made a game of noting dungeons in Oblivion and Skyrim that would feature drop-offs near the entrance that would lead to the end of the dungeon, leading to a circular loop design. The need to deposit players near the entrance of the dungeon by the end quickly without giving crafty players the ability to take the back entrance simply necessitates the restriction of vertical navigation, hence why jump spells and acrobatics went as well. I disagree with this need. I think if anything the new dungeon design could be complemented with a proper use of mark and recall to return to the dungeon entrances, but then again, did I make the most successful RPGs of all time? I didn't think so. Now while I'm on the subject, eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed I'm using a couple spells named Efficient Waterwalk and Efficient Levitate. Ignore the letters, I just use those to organize the menu. Those are custom spells, designed to give me a more Magicka-efficient version of the effects. Waterwalking is basic. Mostly, its magicka needs translates to the duration you'll be waterwalking. The nice thing about setting its duration to 10 seconds is that it allows me to duck under the water quickly without waiting around, and it only requires one magicka to cast, which is very nice. The Levitate spell is much the same, although it's a little more expensive for a little more convenience. Levitate's magicka costs are tied to its duration as well as its strength. Levitate strength affects how quickly you move. A one-point levitate is simply way too slow. But on the flip side, you can become very fast using a 100 or even a 500-point levitate scroll, although casting those spells would be very demanding on Magicka. And as I said, many Telvanni homes have a vertical tube between you and its master, levitate sort of serving as a filter in Telvanni society. Spell creation can be quite versatile and even broken. You might wonder how, so I posit fortify attribute and skill. I didn't get any footage of me abusing these spells fully, so let me explain. Lots of variables in Morrowind, and Oblivion for that matter, are tied into complex formulas. Since these formulas don't have any kind of cap to them, you can very quickly boost your skills into the hundreds, even temporarily, to some amusing effects. For one second, you can boost your speechcraft or mercantile and get a good deal or convince NPCs of basically anything. You can boost your speed and move very quickly. Perhaps the most infamous example commonly known are a trio of scrolls labeled as Icarian Flight, which temporarily boost acrobatics 1,000 points for 7 seconds. This can send you soaring across the map, but the effect doesn't last long enough for the landing, as evidenced by its creator's fate. One of the reasons I don't mind escort quests in Morrowind is the fact that I can fortify other people's speed and make them move faster. With custom spells, you can tailor illusion effects like Frenzy or Calm or other effects like Command to specific humanoids. Also notable is custom destruction spells. You can have an on-touch death spell that targets all elements. Tailor custom spells to specific races to avoid resistances such as a frost spell for Dunmer and a fire spell for Nords. Create a spell that can snipe a specific opponent or a spell that targets a wide area, and the amount of magicka spells require is the great limiting factor. On a hand-to-hand -hand character I had a spell that would damage fatigue to speed up the process, or spells that would absorb other people's fatigue into my own pool. Spell creation tickles the wizard fantasy quite well. Unfortunately, it was too limited in Oblivion and removed in Skyrim. In Oblivion, the spells you could create and cast were hard limited in effectiveness by your skill level. So for example, if you create a spell that does 100 points of damage health on touch in Morrowind, your limitations in casting the spell are the amount of magicka it costs and your chance of casting based on your intelligence and destruction. If you don't meet the magicka requirement, you obviously can't cast a spell unless you find a creative solution around that such as Fortify Magicka potions. If you don't meet the skill requirement, you still have a chance at casting it, and barring that, you can still find the ways to boost the necessary skills to create a chance. In Oblivion, it's simply a threshold of, you have met the level requirement, you are now permitted to cast this spell. 
And even that is better than Skyrim's, there's a handful of pre-selected spells that everyone casts and you may not deviate from that option. Now that we've completed the trip from Sagerth Mora to Telfir, back to Sagerth Mora, I'll tell you a bit about that note we just delivered. The Mouth's master, Arion, is asking his former master, Divith Fear, to join the Telvanni Council due to the incompetence of the incurrent council members threatening the future of House Telvanni. Divith notes that Arion has a personal stake in the matter, and mentions that it doesn't really matter. Telvanni does not need him to survive. The note doesn't mention that Divith is busy, um, with his clone daughters. Although seriously, he is busy with Corpus, which is a bigger threat to Vardenfell as a whole than the collapse of House Telvanni. Another task is to deliver a cure blight potion to tell Voss, and we have to acquire the potion ourselves. This is simple enough, but while I'm there, I follow up on a lead from Master Arion's mouth, who, in the interest of moving on in his career, says that Arion may be willing to sponsor us. After delivering the potion, I fly up to meet Arion. A note about Telvas, it's one of the more interesting locations I've seen in an Elder Scrolls game, since its design is a reflection of the character of its owner. It's a fusion of the new Imperial architectural designs with the classic Telvani Tower, which goes well with Arion, who is a Telvani who's willing to bring Outlanders into the house. It's also a nightmare to navigate and figure out where the services are. Arion says he's willing to be our patron, provided we convince Baladas Demnavani to join the council. Now, funny thing, after this conversation, I immediately recall to the council hall and speak with Arion's mouth, who apparently has already spoken with Master Arion about my delivery, despite me actually, quite literally, teleporting from Arion to him. Hmm, maybe that's the reason Mark and Recall got removed. Anyways, we journey to Nysus. What do you see, Kinesis Outlander? To meet with Dim Navani. We start with the questions. Dim Navani's response depends on his disposition. Since this is my first meeting, it's actually quite low, and he gives me the obstructive answers, basically telling me that people like Gothrin, who have no interest in academics, really should not concern themselves with the dwarves. Should he like you, he basically gives you some theories that get confirmed during the Mage's Guild questline, so hey, we formed a nice connection. We move on to the subject of him joining the council. He says it wouldn't bother him, provided we collect some literature for him. We need three books. Nunchak's Fire and Faith, Antecedents of Dwemer Law, and the Chronicles of Nushleft. I won't bore you with the details, but after collecting the books, he agrees to join the council and gives us Andesai's key and the Amulet of Admonition. The amulet paralyzes for 30 seconds while doing 1-2 to two points of frost damage for that time. This makes it quite powerful since it can paralyze so long, but a double-edged sword should it reflect. Andesai's key is a ring that opens 50 points on touch, basically magically opening most locked doors and chests, but not all of them. I complete another task of Arion's mouth, who wants me to deliver some Daedra skin to Arion and get taught paralyzed for it. While I'm out there, Arion promotes me to mouth, giving me a staff and new chores. I need to go cure his Kwama Queen of Blight. This is convenient since I'm heading out that way on a new task from Gothrin's mouth to collect some plans from Nushleft. I collect the plans, cure the queen, and return to Arion, who gives me a skill book in return. Skill books are good rewards, both for quests and for completing dungeons. Since skill ups are important to progression in Elder Scrolls, it seems like a good way to ensure players are properly leveling up to keep up with the requirements in their faction, but then again, that hasn't been important in a long time. Arion insists I go and learn some basic wizard spells. See? A magical quest line that highly emphasizes and requires the usage of magic. We need Levitate to get to Arion, we had to cure the Kwama Queen with a spell, and we have to learn Recall, Fireball, and Levitate to continue progressing. Fireball is actually the only one I don't know. While going out to learn, I turn in the Scarab plans and get a Cephalopod helmet. This is another great reward, as it allows you to summon a Dramora. We then get another skill book as a reward for learning the spells. You can probably guess that Telvanni is my favorite faction. It's objectively the best. It has the competent rewards, the best rule set, the best quests. It even has the lowest skill requirement of all the factions in the game, only requiring you get a single skill up to 70. We're tasked by Arion to assist Myland Faram, who's being attacked by Halau at Odurnaran. I know it was a long time ago, but yeah, we're crossing over with Rethin right now. I actually forgot this happened, but it's right here in my notes. My recording got cut short because I needed to charge the controller. Just one more reason I hate playing on the Xbox. So me and my new Dramora clear out the tower and I do a bit of soul trapping. Soul trapping in Morrowind is a somewhat minor thing. You can use souls to recharge enchanted items, which we'll talk about, but also to enchant items. The only problem is enchanting isn't all that great. It was actually a bit busted on Morrowind, and not in a good way. 
There are two ways to go about enchanting. You can take out a small loan of tens of thousands of gold to enchant at a services provider, or you can enchant yourself and usually fail. Your success of enchanting is tied to your enchant skill, but even maxing out your enchant skill and intelligence still results in a high chance of failure when enchanting. Enchanting also requires soul gems, which aren't as common as the later games, especially the higher tier ones. Well, they sort of are, just not at the levels I'm recording at. Now, when you hear about people breaking Morrowind, it tends to involve enchanting. This involves a healthy amount of exploiting the game and grinding your soul to eventually become useful. But I know I'll have the regulars sending me angry letters should I leave out the fact that yes, you can create an outfit that instantly restores all damage taken in constant effect restore health enchants. Just as spell creation allows you to utterly break this game, enchanting can take it a step further. No, oh, right. This section is labeled Soul Trapping. Um, you cast Soul Trap on a monster, when it dies, its soul fills a soul gem. Enchanted items are Morrowind. You can't have a Morrowind playthrough that does not eventually make a big point about them. They start out simple enough. Utility jewelry that can do something small like restore a little health, restore some stamina. Maybe if you're fancy you have a recall or intervention amulet. Then you get something like the Vampiric Ring that drops enemies while healing you, or the Amulet of Shadows that allows you to disappear, and you realize, enchanted items are awesome. It's a perfectly viable build to just collect enchanted damage rings you can spam on enemies until they stop moving. Your carry weight could be nothing but rings, amulets, and clothes that perform these functions, and the only downside is that your spell menu would look absolutely atrocious. Enchanted items are great rewards, and more quests should give them. However, enchanted items are only as strong as the magic system supporting it, since using an enchanted item is basically casting a spell without the magicka costs attached. Items have charges, sure, but that comes back with time, so as long as you aren't spamming the items constantly, you'll be fine. One downside I noticed with enchanted items is that if you are wearing a constant effect ring, that you might eventually take them off the ring to make way for another. So it would be annoying to occasionally realize I'm no longer wearing the one ring because my character took it off to use the common ring of ironing clothes or something. Another thing is that it can be quite annoying to be using an enchanted weapon that has run out of charge since it will constantly make this pleasant sound. While informing you that yes, you have indeed run out of charge with the weapon. Hey, Morrowind, you know that the upside of an enchanted sword over, say, an enchanted ring is that when the enchantment runs out, it still has the functions of a sword, right? So, somewhere in the plot, we're tasked with ending the Mage's Guild monopoly on magical services in Redoran territory. What function this serves, I don't know. I don't think the Redorans are the type to use magical services all that often. Also, I decided to jump the gun on that stronghold business. We need a construction contract, as usual, and two strong souls such as Winged Twilights, Golden Saints, or Storm Atronax. This is the power of the growth of the mushroom that will become my home. It just stood there, holding its tail and whispering. What did it say? Excuse me? So we go to talk with Serethi at Arion's recommendation and says that he does not trust my intentions, nor does he particularly like me, and he says goodbye. His tone changes at the bribe of a 100 gold, which is honorable, and I just feel that certain people should be impossible to bribe. He sees most of the counselors, barring Bolv and Venom, will support the resolution opposing the Mage's Guild, provided I make an appeal to fairness. And sure enough, the Rethi and Ramorin are on board once I appeal to fairness. One vow to protect Vardenfeld to the Duke later, and we've got the construction contract. Arian gives us one of his gloves as a reward for taking care of the Redoran thing, and... Okay, so Arian is known for enchanting a pair of powerful gloves. This is one of them and it's known as Arion's Dominator. Its effect is to control humanoids up to level 15 for two minutes. Sounds innocuous, right? However, remember that NPCs generally don't move from their spots, and when I say command, I mean follow you through doors, follow you through fast travel, journey with you across the map. Command humanoid is basically the ability to abduct people and bring them anywhere you want, which is especially powerful since it can be done to people who provide services. Master trainers are generally around level 25, so they can't be affected, but yeah, don't like where the services are in a town? You can now move them. Arian wants me to save Favis Andes over in Shishi from Redoran attacks, which is another crossover quest, this time with House Redoran. I turn in the soul gems, which I, uh, appropriated from certain vendors, and get my stronghold on way. 
As you can see in this footage, I'm making full use of the Dominator in a tactical sense. However, and this point applies to summons as well, it's not that effective. The problem is the AI. Even on PC, even without the slow computation speed, pitting two AI against each other is a miserable affair. This makes Conjuration one of my least favorite skills since half of the skill is about pitting AI against AI. Now don't get me wrong, I see the tactical advantages of summoning, but relying on summons and dominated creatures to fight for me? That's not happening. Only problem is that on occasions where I would try to use summons to distract a tough enemy, the tough enemy would just prioritize killing me anyways, as though it was aware that killing me ends the fight quicker. So dominating and summoning, while an amusing distraction, was pretty rare for me. It's certainly a viable playstyle, but I'd only recommend it if you're the sort to watch like AI fights on YouTube. Once we get to Shishi, we clear the place out. I actually managed to crash the game here. I dominated one of the Redoran soldiers while using a Dremora to fight another. Then when I tried to kill the last soldier, my dominated one, my Dremora turned on me, assuming I had betrayed the cause. The second he killed me, my game crashed, as though it was thoroughly confused and realized that that probably should not have happened. So yeah, add that to the list of reasons I don't use Conjuration. Favis, now free, gives me some skill books. He says he studied them thoroughly, which makes sense, he's been in this basement for a while. That does beg the question though, why you wouldn't just intervention out, you're a wizard. This must be why you're living in Shishi. Arion says in order to advance, I need my own mouth on the council and says he's heard of a Telvani in Balmora that was promising. Sure enough, one of the Halau guards figures fast Eddie is the man, and Ed the man is willing to be my mouth, but he needs a silver staff of peace. Did I mention that earlier? Yeah, when I became a mouth, I got one. Luckily, I kept it. I can imagine a few players being slightly inconvenienced after having sold theirs. Anyways, Ed becomes my mouth and I get told to check on my stronghold at Uverith's grave. It's a bit macabre of a name, isn't it? Anyways, the foreman says it's going to be fine and I check out a Dwimmer ruin while I'm there. I find some schematics and a Dwimmer crossbow and spend a few days selling loot to a Clavicus vile minion in Caldera. Then my stronghold manager says I need to post 5,000 gold in any schematics I find in a ruin named Mezankind. Just so happens I found the plan she's looking for. I, uh... I may have looked at the wiki for this quest beforehand. As a reward for finding a mouth, Arion gives me his other glove and I'll tell you about this one later. Arion is impressed we've risen so quickly, which is an understatement as I've soared through the ranks of Telvanni in about two weeks. He figures the only way forward is to take care of some up-and-comers in the other houses. A Halau has constructed a stronghold, without contract, at the Odai Plateau. Sure enough, I take on Rethin at Odai, which was an easy fight. She tries to silence me, but silence doesn't work on enchanted items. And behold, Arion's helpers. Yeah, this right here lags my game, but it is quite effective. A Flame, Frost, and Storm Atronach summoned simultaneously. Our next task is to take down another stronghold, this time at Bal Isra, and kill the Redoran in Daris. I decide to have a little fun and treat this one like a battle. His guards are willing to just let me go down and murder him, but I make them fight me. I steal some clutter, which angers everyone in the manor, then use Arion's helper and the Dremora summon and turn the manor into a giant clusterfuck. Just watch. I Arion is naturally impressed with this, and I suppose I should talk about the House Wars. 
Each great house has quests to assassinate your equivalent in the other house, the rising stars who are doing the quests you get locked out of. I named each character after their version, so Halau was Rethin, Rodoran was Indaris, and Telvanni was Uvarith. In retrospect, considering how fantastically Uvarith's attack on Rethin and Indaris went, I want to say it's canon, but sadly, it can't be. Because Rethin and Indaris are in part 5, but Uvarith? Uvarith didn't get a follow up. Tell Uvarith became Uvarith's grave, sadly. Rethin killed him while Indaris didn't engage in the house wars. So what happens in the non-canon timeline? Well, Arion says that there are two paths. We can become a master, like Arion, and hold a spot on the council. Or we can become a magister, which announces that I am worthy of the rank of archmagister. I think there's only one choice. We go to Talmora and confront Gothrin. He has nothing to say to us, and so begins the wizard duel. I silence Gothrin, send in the squad who fights Gothrin's own duo of Dramora, and kill Gothrin with my special mysticism technique of absorbing health. It's a good fight. A damn good fight. Fittingly, there's a book titled The Final Lesson in his tower, and with that, Arion names me Archmagister of House Tovani. This, however, is fanfiction. Gothrin yet lives, and Uvarith sadly doesn't. The Great Houses of Morrowind are a really great storyline emblematic of the game. To contrast, Oblivion was originally intended to allow you to become the Count of Kavach following its destruction, but this was cut according to Todd Howard because it apparently detracted from the main questline. Skyrim had the Civil War, a literal red versus blue fight between two factions that were both kind of right, although the Stormcloaks were better suck at reds. The Great Houses, though. To have not one, but two separate questlines that become exclusive when you pick one, I mean, modern Bethesda loves the whole only create one character and experience everything design philosophy. Even when they have multiple factions like in Fallout 4, they fuck it up by having all the factions still complete the same story beats. Each faction is also properly represented in their quests. Halau is about being sneaky and conniving, and you make a ton of money doing it. Radoran is about honor, and honor doesn't pay. Tovani is all about the acquisition of power and rewards you with powerful artifacts. However, a problem I have with the houses is that they don't quite fit with hybrid classes. It makes sense for each guild to correspond to its specialization. You know, fighters to fighters guild, thieves to thieves guild, mages to mages guild. But then the houses do the same exact thing. It'd be great if, for example, heavy armor was a part of the philosophy of House Telvanni, but secretly all Telvanni cheat and bind theirs. It'd certainly make Divith Fear, fully clad in real Daedric armor, much cooler as a consequence. Or illusion magic is a part of Halau, or mysticism a part of Radoran. Just something that makes Tovani feel more like a faction instead of just the mages guild for Dunmer hipsters. If you look on most of Morrowind's materials, you see the three house names on them, but you also see the name Endoral. I think it was pretty smart to keep Endoral out of Morrowind. I personally think it would have crowded the space to have a fourth great house. Same goes for house dress. I feel if the greater mainland of Morrowind had been a part of the original game, then it would have fit in as a sort of competing mainland powers. Perhaps a story of tribunal traditionalists versus Daedric worshippers, as is technically already the case. But as it stands, House Dress only gets paid lip service in Morrowind, which was a shame because, well, it was retconned into being destroyed in Skyrim. I mentioned Endoral and Dress because they helped to fill out the roster for House Dagoth, the Forbidden Sixth House. For years, I've heard a rumor that Bethesda originally intended to let the player join the Sixth House. Researching this was difficult, since there are mods that entail this that muddy the waters. Some have alluded to the content being in the game files, but this is not the case, as according to both the UESP and the Cutting Room Floor, no such quests or scripts exist in the game files. I've searched around for some hints at interviews that would suggest this information or where this misconception came from, but alas, I couldn't find any. If joining the Sixth House wasn't a design document, it got cut very early. As for the main three, a good balance. I handily ranked Telvanni at number one while Halau and Rodoran tied two for a variety of reasons. Rodoran has some better quests, but the lack of payment really dragged it down. Halau has some more menial quests, but it has enough intrigue to entertain. In this section, we'll be seeing the return of a few prior characters to play through these factions. For the Imperial Legion, I chose Mace, the master of the Fighters Guild. He made the most sense as a fighter and as an outsider to the Great Houses. 
The Imperial Legion is a strange faction. The only ones recruiting is the Legion and Nisus, but you don't really join as a legionary, more as an agent. But the ranks in the uniform imply that we are a common soldier. I mean, we obviously can't spend days patrolling town as a guard while we earn our rank, so... We start off getting tasked by General Darius himself to acquire a deed from a widow in order to open a port. Only it turns out the widow's husband was recently murdered, and she says, by a legionary no less. And so, we, an Imperial Legion recruit, set out to solve the murder. He recently died while inside the local egg mine. We get let in by the door guard and some snooping reveals an orc in the lower levels who threatens to attack us if we don't leave. He threatens to count to ten- oh no, please. Go ahead. I want nothing to do with you, orc. I'm going to enjoy this. It's your last chance. Run or die. I eventually find a pool with a body and an axe that I somehow intuit belongs to the lug grub. Wait, they never found the body? How do they know he died then and didn't just go skip town to go to the Saran House of Earthly Pleasures? And sure enough, there's a ghost of the widow's husband who's there to detail the murder. The orc was sleeping on duty, woke up to find him there, and killed him to cover up his insubordination. And General Darius believes our story. He even rewards us with a free broadsword for taking the initiative and solving the case. No, no thank you. As you might be able to tell, this quest is written a bit different than the other factions I've detailed in this series. That's because it has a different writer, and said writer clearly had a different perspective on writing. To give a clear example, I reference an earlier murder mystery quest we've done. For House Olau, we're tasked with solving a noble's murder. Asking locals in Balmora points us to an Argonian suspect. Asking the servant of a noble points to a Dunmer man. You know what doesn't enter the evidence pool? A murder weapon with the name of the murderer still on it. Still planted in the skull of the victim, and the victim's ghost certainly doesn't pop up from the grave to recount the events of the murder. I mean, all's fair, right? The murderer is an orc, so he might be prideful enough to carve his name in his weapon and then dispose of it poorly, and sure, ghosts do exist in the setting. I'm not saying the circumstances are implausible, but, well, this is a problem with the later games, too. Instead of creating an actual mystery that requires detective work, where there is no actual way of knowing with absolute certainty who the murderer is, this quest was written with the desire of creating an emotional payoff. And having the ghost of the victim show up means that there is no speculation on the part of the player on why the murder happened in the first place. For the Halau murder, you weren't actually given solid motive for either suspect. There's a lot of evidence that the Argonian is only suspected by people because of his race, and the Dunmer ends up being the more likely suspect, but just as easily we could be missing out on a whole other story. A story where an Argonian man has an affair with a servant of a racist noble, whom is killed in a conflict between the two, and to cover up the crime of her lover, the servant implicates a man who, while still a criminal, is not guilty of this crime. Pretty interesting, right? Well, just as easily, the story could be that of a Kamanatang thug murdering a pro-abolition Halau noble, then spreading rumors that it was an Argonian free man who did the deed. Do you want to know why Mr. Ghost here got murdered? Because he woke up an orc who was sleeping on the job, and the orc didn't want to get in trouble with his boss. See the problems with having the murder victim posthumously explain the crime? Just as easily you could solve the crime by saying, 1. Vabdas' last known location was inside the mine looking for food. 2. Inside the part of the mine where the food is, is an orc who's threatening to kill people for trespassing, even his fellow members of the Imperial Legion. And 3. Deep inside the cave is a skeleton and an unmarked Imperial weapon, a weapon that the orc is missing. Players who fail to find point 3 might still be able to figure out that the orc has a history of violent confrontations. Maybe he's on strike 2 of 3 from losing his job. As for motives, besides being an orc, he is standing right next to a bedroll and some empty mugs, so you can fill in the blanks. This is a very dramatic first quest for a faction that generally does not match the tone of the other factions in the game. Our next task is to cure the blighted Kwama Queen. Oh no, do I really need to detail this one? We've done this quest twice already. Next, we need to rescue a pilgrim who's been kidnapped. Some outcast Ashlanders are living near Ald Velothi and trying to collect ransom money. Unfortunately for them, this is non-negotiable, so I kill them and free the hostage. A local tax collector went missing trying to collect taxes from a Telvanni living in Nisus, old Baladas Demnavani of Mage's Guild and House Telvanni fame. Fun fact, the wiki says that the summoning room key unlocks the dungeon cell door. It doesn't, at least not on the Xbox. You know, I, I can't blame Morrowind fans for not playing it on the Xbox. Baladus isn't thrilled. He says that he imprisoned the tax collector because she's collecting taxes for a false empire, and that he only really tolerates the people of Nisus. I respond that everybody pays taxes. He rebuffs this. 
Presumably, I mentioned that if he wants to be a sovereign, he needs to have the power to back up his claims, and we fight. Rest in peace, Baladus Demnavani, a true OG. Don't think I ever got out of that place. Wow, the Imperial Legion was not shown love. Or an editor. Alright, fine, I'll talk about the writer. Todd Howard. For the most part up to this point, we've been working with the writing of Douglas Goodall. Seriously, he wrote all three Imperial Guilds, all three Great Houses, as well as the Morag Tong and the Tribunal Temple questlines. He also had mostly worked out the beats of the Imperial Legion questline, but fell behind. Having a falling out can do that. So Todd Howard stepped in and finished it. This may be one of the big reasons the Imperial Legion, and the Imperial Cult for that matter, feel so different compared to the rest of the factions. Goodall was clearly more interested in a low fantasy writing style about mundane everyday living, while writers like Michael Kirkbride and Ken Rolston focused on the more high fantasy and esoteric concepts of the game. So what's the deal with Howard? I mean, we all know the meme of him as the liar that overpromises and underdelivers of today, but turns out his favorite of the games with his name on it is Morrowind. He doesn't want to remaster it, he wants people to play it for what it is. And I certainly agree, but... why? Well, that's where we get into the context behind this game. Daggerfall did well enough, but Bethesda had gotten a little mismanaged in the 90s. Between Battlespire and Redguard, the company had overextended itself to little reward. There was a very real threat of Bethesda either becoming a shovelware company or going under. So when you hear stuff like, Morrowind saved Bethesda, yeah, it's true. For a time, Bethesda was a success story in a gaming industry that tries to snuff out innovation and creativity for safer, secure, and exploitative designs. I think part of the reason people like to rag on Howard is partly because it's a fall from grace. More than anything, it's an unabashed greed that goes into something like Fallout 76 that bothers people. I think Howard overpromises and oversimplifies the modern games because he doesn't want his company to ever go back to its dark times of the late 90s. It certainly lines up with the fact that Bethesda, the developer at least, is one of the few AAA dev studios that doesn't abuse their employees with crunch periods. Howard knew what it was like to work under crunch. It's part of the reason I'm interested to see Starfield. I mean, if the claims are true, and this is what Howard has been wanting to make for a long time, it'll either be a return to form that we've been waiting for, or it'll be a disaster from a man who's lost touch with his original fanbase. It'll be fascinating either way. As for Todd's work on the Imperial Legion, I mean, the guy's talent is using orc magic to make his games work, not as a writer or a designer. He wants to tell exciting stories and isn't really interested in exploring the culture of the Legion. Like, did I mention the Legion in Nisus is mostly made up of orcs? That never comes up in this questline. Our final quest for Darius involves investigating the local Talos cult. Rumor has it that Ortidius Mero is in the cult, and when bribed 200 gold, he invites us to join and gives us a key to a secret shrine. Sure enough, there's a shrine, and some investigation reveals a note saying they need to strike soon if Emperor Uriel Septim VII, yes, the big man himself, is going to come to Vardenfell. The shrine guard doesn't appreciate me snooping, and neither does Mero, so hey, at least I get my bribe money back. This is probably the fastest a literal conspiracy theory has ever been debunked. And thus ends our work with General Darius. We're high enough rank to operate as free agents of the Legion, but something feels... off. I think it has to do with the fact that all of these quests took place in and around Nisus. The quests try to be more than just go to X and do Y, opening with a literal murder mystery and all, but it feels superficial because this isn't the kind of work a new recruit should be doing, especially in contrast with the other factions that do give you the right kind of work for new members. I accidentally activated Darius's bed while trying to pick up some gear, earning a small bounty in a building full of guards. Yeah, and maybe it'd be nice if the bounty triggered after you actually tried to start resting, not just when I hit the bed by accident. That said, it means I got some good footage of me stripping down and running around naked for a while while I was wanted. Darius, once he's calmed down about our heinous crime, says for further orders I need to check with the night protectors at each fort. We're told in Moonmoth that the buoyant armagers have challenged us to a hunt, and the ordinators say they're going to get a piece of corpus weeping while we need to get a piece of scrap metal to prove our superiority to the tribunal temple. Okay, Todd, those aren't all synonymous groups. So I take a run up the hill and ask the nearby Dwemer Ruin for a cup of metal and turn up the difficulty while I'm here. Turning up the difficulty does breathe a little bit of new life into the playthrough, since Mace was starting to become unstoppable. Personally, on the PC, I find the max difficulty to be the most fun, 
but that's with the benefit of near instant loading screens for when I die. We do get paid 500 gold for the work, so hey, it's already better than Rodoran. Our next task is to rescue a missionary who went missing while preaching the good word of quite literal imperialism to the Arabinism camp. Hostage situations aren't very pressing, so I go look for work elsewhere. Over in Aldrun at Buckmoth, we're tasked with finding evidence of Drynar Varion being a smuggler. I presume this is after Rethan implicated him in the Halau questline, as while he did provide evidence Odral Helvi was smuggling, the Legion only has his testimony that Varion was involved. Varion isn't the best at hiding his shadiness. He claims he is practicing pottery. Although I guess I could believe him since I see pots in every building, but so far Varion is the first potter I've met. Unfortunately for him, I apparently don't need a warrant to search his home and hidden amongst his pottery is a Dwemer tube. And yeah, that's enough for a conviction. Book him, boys. Stop! You violated the law. Next, we're told that one of our own is being held for ransom in a Daedric ruin and we need to rescue him. Hostage situations are a pressing matter, so off we go. <laughs> Let's talk about Daedric Ruins. They tend to be varied having very alien names like Ashurnabibi, with jagged architecture and a comfortable blood red color, full of Daedra and Daedric accessories. And if you see a shrine, I will warn you now to leave their donations alone. We don't talk about what happens if you touch the donation. <laughs> Quests that involve actually going to Daedric Ruins are pretty rare though. They are a source of entertainment you have to be proactive and seek out on your own. The benefits of the ruins are access to valuables, which can be used or sold for money and inevitably turned into training and levels. Which is smart, up until you realize that most Daedric Ruins are too difficult for characters lower than level 10. Which is unfortunate for me as most of the time I was playing, and in need of cash for this video, Daedric Ruins were out of the question. This is assuredly a me issue, a making a long analysis video issue. So after killing a bunch of tough orcs in Daedra, we find Johnsis, who thanks us for killing his captors and tells us he'll find his own way out of the ruin. Our next task from Buckmoth is to recover a token of a maiden, a rogue Telvani, at this point which ones aren't rogue, a rogue Telvani, Verona Nellis, is blackmailing a buoyant armager with an embroidered glove. At first this doesn't really seem an issue for the Legion until we go to the Assman K, I mean Asumanu, and recover the glove. The Telvani in question has a secretary who informs me that I'll need an appointment to meet with Nellis and like the brave initiative taking red guard I am, I just go in anyways. Verona Nellis says she's only willing to discuss the glove with a friend, something that will cost me. The thing is, Mace doesn't do blackmail and the situation ends poorly as a result. Yeah, so if you were wondering why the Legion cares about this glove, it's because it's embroidered with the name Ilmini Drin, who happens to be the Duke's daughter. Sadly, there is no reward, nor really any intrigue about the Legion covering for the Duke's daughter. Over in Ebonheart, we're tasked to deal with a slanderous, buoyant armager who says we lack courtesy. We're told to get our hands on a red book of riddles and go correct the issue. And sure enough, the armager, Salen Serethi, is willing to concede we have wit provided we can win a contest of riddles. And Serethi just quotes said Red Book of Riddles verbatim. Kinda weird, the quest giver somehow knew this book would be relevant. Fun fact, we returned Salen Serethi's dagger to him during the Thieves Guild questline. Next, we're tasked with dealing with a traitor who is working for a den of sorcerers and Daedra worshippers in a remote area. What is that? No, no, get away from me! Meet the Greater Bonewalker, or as they're more affectionately known, why Bethesda never gave an enemy a damage attribute effect ever again. Kind of a weird name, but absolutely fitting. See, attributes in Morrowind are important. In Daggerfall, they were life or death, but in Morrowind, you can live through having one knocked down to zero. It just enters its equations with said value of zero. Only problem with that would be strength. See, strength in Morrowind dictates how hard you hit and your encumbrance. Encumbrance is five times the value of your strength. Question though, what is five times zero? Next question, which playstyle generally has the greatest carry weight and do they regularly come in melee range? And the Bonewalkers are rather quick to cast the spell, so unsuspecting players are going to find themselves completely unable to move in a short manner of time. Now, the first instinct might be to reload a save. I'm on the Xbox, so no quick saves, and for reasons that don't go bearing into, in this video, Bethesda prioritized taking feedback from the Xbox players when it came to the design of Oblivion. 
which is why rather than improving the effect, they just stopped using it. There are two ways you are supposed to circumnavigate the problem. The first is by carrying a Restore Strength potion in your inventory. That would, however, make it unique as the only restorative that is completely necessary to carry to avoid softlocking your game. The second is some method of getting back to town. Interventions, recall, or just dropping everything and running back naked and unarmed. If I was designing it personally, I would have had damaged attributes recover through resting, offering a non-magical solution to dealing with damage attributes that makes sense and still carries some consequence for lack of preparedness. Your strength would naturally come back over time. Or I would have it so that the most your attributes can get damaged is, say, 50%, so you can still feel the negative and the lasting effects of getting cursed without it trapping you completely. Or just have the value that represents strength be 5 times plus 25, so even at a value of 0, you still have 25 units of weight to work with so you can carry a weapon and clothes on your walk of shame back to town. Back in the synopsis, turns out the broken level geometry here has prevented the trader Hongyolf from being a threat. While we're over here, I decide to finally go rescue that missionary I've been putting off. So the Arabinism locals say they told him that the Mabergash wanted to hear all about that imperial lifestyle of living in the soon-to-be retconned jungle. One bribe later, and he tells us that the Mabergash are when their wise women leave the tribe to go off stealing men's vital essences to become more powerful. So now we have to go rescue this guy from literal semen demons. Thankfully, he left a trail of book pages to follow to the camp, and on the way I meet with a lost slave who is saying he needs to get home, but isn't too enthusiastic to actually ask me to help, so I leave him in the middle of the wasteland. He's part of a quest for the Twin Lamps faction that Elmini Drin heads that is dedicated to slave abolition. I didn't play it because it's just two quests. I find the camp, and the situation feels very familiar to earlier in the quest line. I ask what they want, and this time it's not Ransom. They just say they need a man for their magic to work, and insists that if I want Josian back, I'll need to replace him. With a man from the tribe, I decide to use the business end of my sword and... Oh, God. That sounds sexual, doesn't it? Okay, no. I didn't dick down the wise woman. I killed her. And not metaphorically from over-pleasure. Literally from over death. Josian's learned nothing from this encounter, as he wishes to continue trying to preach the good word. Good luck with affecting any measure of generational change on a society of people that live three times as long as you. Our next orders are to rescue another hostage from some bandit- ah oh, jeez. Yeah, just generic bandits. And either I didn't do this quest, or this quest is so lackluster that I didn't take any notes on it. Thankfully at this point, we are high enough rank to apply for a job in the Knights of the Garland of the Order of Ebonheart, provided we can track down two of the Order's artifacts and remember their silly name. The first artifact is the Lord's Mail. Which Lord? Oh, the Armor of Mora House. It was being kept in a shrine in the Imperial Commission, then it got stolen. One of the folks in the shrine suggests I speak with someone named Rufinus, who himself figures that it was Furious Achilles who stole the armor. The first piece of evidence is his unfortunate name, Furious, which is just bound for trouble. The second piece of evidence was that Furious was talking a lot about the armor and about a cave below the castle and recently got fired. Motive and opportunity. In the shrine itself are track marks leading to a hidden door. Cool, but I must be the first person investigating this case because how would you miss that? We need a key, because my security skill is basically nothing on this character, and after spending an embarrassing amount of time looking for Furious' room, the hidden door reveals access into the cave, where Furious and his rat army are holed up. One fight later, and we return the armor to Varus Vantinius. If that quest sounds short and stupid, it kind of is. I mean, if you don't see a problem with a guy named Furious stealing a precious artifact, going through a hidden door feet from its shrine, locked by a key a copy of which is sitting in his room, so that he could live out the rest of his days starving to death in a cave below a castle in stylish plate armor, then I guess you're not going to see a problem with anything. Good news, Bethesda has made two whole Elder Scrolls games appealing to people like you. You'll also enjoy this next quest. The other artifact we're tasked with grabbing is Chrysomir. It got stolen by another knight, now it's in the hands of a rogue Telvanni by Sadrith Mora that's also apparently so scary that she's frightened the Telvanni into daring not speak her name. Kill her, take the sword, give it to Varus. Okay, first of all, is there anybody in this legion who isn't a traitor? Oh, what's that? Varus wants to do? Okay, hang on dude, seriously, there's a tad too many quests that involve knights murdering locals, knights engaging in petty faction warfare, knights getting captured, knights betraying the cause to go work for rogue Telvanni, and by the way... 
Can I just say that I am sick of hearing about Rogue Telvani doing this or that? Oh no, a Rogue Telvani has built a stronghold in the middle of uncontested wasteland. Oh no, the Duke's abolitionist daughter is being blackmailed by a Rogue Telvani and admitting that she had a relationship with a prominent member of a religious faction that doesn't practice abstinence. Their love is not forbidden. Fact. If Jaramu Haloran was terrorizing the city of Sadrith Mora, living a stone's throw away from multiple powerful wizards and she was hoarding powerful artifacts, more than likely Master Neloth, Archmagister Gothrin, or Lord Divith Fear would have, at a minimum, asked her to knock it off, or, more likely, either killed her or tasked some poor Telvanni player with the job. We aren't talking about Balmoran peasants here, this is House Telvanni. They don't consider Dagath Ur a threat, so why would they be scared of some witch with a giant sword? And finally, the duel. We've been putting artifacts in the hands of Varus only for him to turn around and use those artifacts to one-shot me while in my adrenaline rush. Whatever, at least this one has his armor on. But yeah, this guy's hitting like a monster truck at the local playground, which means I used what is probably the dirtiest and most underhanded way to beat an opponent yet. Step one, charm. Step two, buff. Step three, getting a few swings before he even reacts. You might think that honor should be an aspect in this, but thing is, sending me out to go collect artifacts that you proceed to use against me is kind of a dick move. I mean, I get it, I possess the Ice Blade of the Monarch, so getting your own magic sword is fine by me, but not the armor of Mora House. I don't like the Imperial Legion in Morrowind. I realized upon reflection that it's much more misanthropic than most of the other quest lines. The Legion is lording over a conquered people, and sending missions out to preach their lifestyle to the indigenous population. We're one quest away where we hand out corpus blankets from outright commentary. Thing is, that could have worked. Because unlike Amerindians or the Sandlanders, the Dunmer culture is much more capable of repelling foreign influence. But I kept getting the feeling that whomever wrote this, I presume Todd, actually wrote the quest line, wanted it to be a story of the player cleaning up the Legion's ill intents on their way up to the top. I think that could have worked, however the quest line lacked a real narrative. It was much more a bunch of isolated instances of demonstrating how incompetent these colonizers were, or how morally bankrupt members could be. And it wasn't exactly subtle. From the orc killing a native man to cover up his laziness on the job, to all the posturing to the armagers, to the knights who abandoned their cause for self-gain. I mean, do I have to stress that his name was Furious? There is one unique aspect I have to praise, and that's the uniform system. Legionaries, even the player, are expected to wear their uniforms when speaking to a superior officer, and the player is given a number of different curuses that qualify in this respect. This means that heavy armor isn't just an expected skill of members, it's outright mandatory to complete the quest line. The Order of the Garlic, or the Duke's Guard, they're underexplored. It's a very short time between joining the upper echelon of the faction to outright leading it, so there aren't any quests where you go out and do nightly things. Unlike other factions, where quests are reflections of the values and principles of said factions, the Imperial Legion stands alone as a faction that could be most described by the phrase, go to X and do Y. The Imperial Cult is a bit of an oddity. While Douglas Goodall wrote most of the factions and started on the Imperial Legion questline that was later finished by Todd Howard, the Imperial Cult questline was done by Ken Ralston. Goodall, in an interview, said that initially the cult was going to be a potential expansion or plug-in material. I suspect this was because it was written after the main questline was mostly finished, or written concurrently with the main quest to give Rolston a break from writing one project for too long. And I understand that feeling, believe me. That said, playing a questline written by somebody else gives the game an entirely different feeling. But unlike the Legion with Howard, it's a kind of a good one. Goodall's philosophy to quest writing was to make quests similar to Daggerfall. Rolston, on the other hand, created a series of more interesting quests, but the faction itself is also smaller in scale. To start, this is a continuation of Wiz, our Mage's Guild character. I had a hard time justifying why a character would line up with the cult, or with the temple for that matter, so let's just say she found the divines in her research. It was her or and there was no way a Telvanni was going to convert. I cheated a bit and did a bit of preparation. Prior experience with the questline tempered me to what to expect. Amusingly, you can gain quite a bit of rank without needing to leave this room. 
One of the first quest givers asks you to collect alchemical ingredients. He will give specific directions for areas where you may collect these ingredients. But, as with most quests in Morrowind, this is entirely superfluous as any rat meat or netch leather will suffice. So, if you purchase the necessary alchemical ingredients in advance, you can quickly complete his entire quest line. Another quest giver deals with collecting donations for the cult. This is primarily gold, about 2,000 or so, but also some brandy and a shirt. Again, adequate preparation can blast you through this quest line in record time, and all it costs is money. This is mostly just time saving. While the quests are interesting, there isn't really any reflection to be had with them. Yes, indeed, there are quests I'm not dealing in this analysis, I know it might not seem like it. In addition, I collected 100 scrolls of divine intervention. Just cause. You do need to donate 50 gold to join the cult, a preventative measure I suspect since certain Atronach related characters can take easy advantage of the shrines otherwise, but 50 gold is nothing in the grand scheme of things. Diseases are an intentional annoyance, similar to durability, and like durability, it was drastically reined in in the later games. Overworld enemies scale, usually getting a little tougher but notably becoming more infectious, presenting a chance of catching the disease, and most commonly contracted common diseases. I do not think in my entire history of playing this game that I have ever actually contracted a blight disease, and we'll talk more about Corpus in part 6. This is a mixture of becoming powerful enough to not get hit by blighted monsters, and not coming in contact with too many blighted creatures outside of the main quest line. And I'll spoil this now, there's a reward a third of the way through the main quest that provides total immunity to all diseases, including blight. So the main quest line that chances catching blight the most will make you immune to it. So, if immunity is a reward, why have the mechanic? It's another one of those questions of intentional annoyance. It's an added concern that has to be prepared for prior to an adventure, and a punishment for those who came unprepared. Disease is also a part of the story of Morrowind, more so than the later games. There's a canon reason you can't leave Vardenfell, and it's because the island has been quarantined due to the blight. Corpus is a biological weapon that is being used by the Sixth House against the Tribunal and the Outlanders, and many quests involve curing or providing the cure to various ailments across the island. So in this case, I can forgive the later games easing up on diseases, making them rarer, reducing them down to one category, etc. Because their stories aren't about disease. That said, if the next game were to be set in, say, the Black Marsh, or Valenwood, then I would hope special mind be paid to the disease system. Perhaps making spreading the disease more robust, like sharing it with NPCs and infecting entire towns with careless behavior. And by the way, this entire section was written prior to the human malware. Shrines can perform other jobs, they can restore attributes, and the tribunal shrines can provide even more functions. The only problem is, all the services provided by shrines are done so in a more convenient form by potions and scrolls. Shrines are cheaper, sure, but you can cure a disease or restore an attribute out in the field with a potion or a spell. And I was never in such a dire financial situation as to not be able to justify buying a cure common disease potion. So, one of the perks of acquiring a rank in the cult, free shrine usage, is not a standout reason to drop everything and go do the quest line on all of your characters. A quirk of the cult quest line is how quest givers introduce themselves. They'll often spring quests onto you as soon as you open a dialogue, chastising you if you return early or haven't completed your objective yet. So you can't use their services if you're presently working for them, or they'll assume you've been derelict in your duties. But, they also tend to provide a lot of choices in dialogue. Sure, some of these choices are, I have failed and must be flagellated, but other choices, especially with the gold collection quests, give you the opportunity to go above and beyond for extra rewards. I think between Howard, Goodall, and Rolston, Rolston used the dialogue system fully, coming the closest Elder Scrolls ever has to branching dialogue. So, after you get done with all your gold and ingredient collection, you'll find yourself with access to the upper level of the cult. You'll notice we're spending quite a bit of time here in this one room. That is functionally the entire faction. Fits in line with the idea that this was originally going to be an expansion. Still, this is our first real quest. Lalacia Varian says that she has visions from the Nine, and wants me to solve them. She says she has seen the Ring of the Wind upon a Dark Elf's hand and tells me a riddle and sends me to ask a Dunmer Savant and Scout about it. Now, these quests present the opportunity to use the services of Savants and Scouts, who have unique information to share about the world. This is a pure Rolston idea, as he uses this a lot in the main quest as well, while Goodall tended to just have quest givers themselves provide the directions to locations. There should have been a lot more opportunities to use these services, and this goes triply for Oblivion and Skyrim with their quest marker philosophy. That said, I think it is a shame that the puzzles can't be solved by the player's own knowledge about the world, especially considering the people we're directed to ask are located in... Vivek.
So we head to where she had the vision, a cave called Namu. I had turned the difficulty up during the Legion, but Wiz was far lower along the power threshold compared to Mace and was getting my ass beat. But paralysis works in a cinch. After a wizard duel, I get the ring and meet a guy named John Hawker. He says he was taken hostage by the wizard to be sold as a slave, and that we must have been sent by Zenithar himself to save him. He's actually a manifestation of Zenithar. Another difference between Goodall and Rolston, he asks to give him a divine intervention scroll, of which there are plenty in the cave in case you came unprepared. I have over a hundred or so already, and indeed I give over a hundred scrolls to him. Every time I give him a scroll, he gives me a pair of gloves and a reputation point. Every time. So after hundreds of button presses, I have 113 reputation and 104 pairs of gloves. At fair value, this is 412,000 gold. And I can admire anyone into liking me instantly as I am the most famous person on the entire island, if not all of Tamriel. Obviously, this is an exploit, since Hawker didn't close the dialogue box after teleporting out, allowing me to give him all these scrolls. And I'm going to add in here that this is an exceptionally easy problem to fix. As in, since I started the previous sentence, I've already spoken more characters than it takes to close a dialogue box in the editor. So I'll chalk this one up to forgetfulness and this quest having been created late in development. There's actually another opportunity to do this, but I'm not going to since the process of buying 100 scrolls of divine intervention and subsequently giving them to them is absolutely awful on the Xbox. Let's just say that for all the dynamic and interesting ideas Rolston had, they can be tempered equally with the strange quirks of his quests. Speaking of, Varian has another vision, this time of the Boots of the Apostle. They're in a Dunmer stronghold named Brandis, which has not one, not two, but three winged twilights for me to fight. Talk about an escalation in difficulty, I was here for quite a while... Well... I mean, these are flying enemies, can't they just fly at me? I guess there must not be any flying enemies in Morrowind. Oh yeah. Yeah. Speaking of flying, we now have the boots of the Apostle. The boots the big man Talos wore as he descended from the throat of the world that are for some reason here in Vardenfell. And if you're attentive, you'll notice that there are some ledges at the top of the cave with someone up there. It's an aspect of Mara, and like Hawker, she wants a scroll of divine intervention. It's kind of awkward that this idea was repeated, but only once. Hawker was obvious, with scrolls present if he came unprepared, while Amanin here is more obscure and with no scrolls nearby. Again, I'm not sure why Rolston decided to have this encounter twice. Technically, there's a third encounter in the same vein as this, but it happens during the main quest. Let's take a break from Prophecy and Seer's visions to do some other high-level work for the cult. We're tasked with recovering a limeware bowl that was stole. Okay, prophecy time it is. Varian asks us to recover the Ice Blade of the Monarch, which Mace had acquired while working for the Fighters Guild. So while we didn't find the blade, we did manage to rescue some slaves. One woman, Adisamsi, asks us to grab her ring, which casts Divine Intervention, and she leaves with it. We get that same ring as a reward later, and obviously we also have the Ice Blade, but that's not as fun. The Cult is a great questline early on, but even from an experienced Morrowind player, I don't really understand how people with fresh characters are expected to match the rapid change in difficulty and significance from gathering money for charity to battling wizards, winged twilights, and danger worshippers. Thankfully, our next quest from Varian is a bit more of a blue milk run. We're just going to recover some scroll, nothing too crazy, but I think Varian is overcompensating for not having an actual artifact from you to recover this time. I know the scroll isn't actually an artifact because a healer was sent to a Daedric Ruin to try and kill an old Altmer with it. We go to the Ruin, and there is a handy side passage you can sneak through to get through to the scroll first. For sneaky characters who might not be able to handle the mandatory horde of Daedra and highly talented warriors of Merun's Dagon. You know, just monk things. The scroll one-shots the priest, not because it's any good, but because he's actually really weak. You'll be seeing more of him in the next part. Oh god, I'm in summary mode. At least it's the last quest, and no, there hasn't been a theme to any of these. It's just kind of an inane list of tasks, which, now that I'm thinking about it, might be commentary on religion. Food for thought. While I'm poorly digesting it, let's get into Varian's final task. Long ago, in a distant land... The Nords invaded, and a smith, Hilbengard, made a powerful warhammer named Skullcrutcher. The hammer was lost in a buried Daedric ruin, and in all this time, nobody has bothered to actually excavate the site. Okay, not sure why a Nord was hanging out in a Daedric ruin during the days of the Nordic occupation of Res Dane, or why Telvanni living a stone's throw away from it never bothered to go pilfering. I honestly think Goodall was the only one at Bethesda who understood what the Telvanni were all about. 
We get directed by a scout to look for Dunmer tombs near the ruins, through which we discover a pathway into the ruins. There's some cool stuff here. Literally. There's a patch of ice that a frost stature neck is hanging out on, and the dungeon is very vertically oriented, which is good, as the boots of the apostle allows us the power of flight. Once we find the forge, and I should stress that once we find it, it's in a floating chest in the middle of the forge. Varian, for some reason, notes that the hammer isn't cursed, and declares her quest line to be finished. And that's where I stopped playing the cult because I ran out of quests and really wasn't interested in doing a bunch of go to X and do Y quests for the shrine sergeant. The Imperial Cult is unique, definitely. In fact, I'd say it's pretty well fleshed out. Beyond the Limeware Bull quest is four more interesting quests involving a witch hunt, two hauntings, and a really bad puzzle. That said, it definitely feels like a faction that was bolted onto the game towards the end. The faction has little to add to the existing Imperial shrines in the world, and outside of one example, there isn't really any instances of faction crossovers. It is, however, another faction that lacks an overarching narrative, and it's in an inconvenient location being set in the Ebonheart Chapel atop a castle. And as I noted, there is a drastic ramp up in difficulty from the first half to the second, which is one of the reasons I decided to use a pre-existing character instead of creating a new one. Ultimately, however, it does not compare to the other factions, and especially not with the other religious faction I'll be discussing, the Tribunal Temple. So let's get into the Dunmer factions, starting with the Morag Tong. We all know the triangle of RPG specializations, right? You have the hulking warriors of legend, the studious mages and wizards of antiquity, but is the third corner a thief or an assassin? There's a pretty big difference, one that isn't really there for the other corners, and it's not just a difference of morals either, the skill set is completely different. So who gets the claim to be the third corner of the triangle, and where does the other one go if it's not them? I say this as we're discussing the faction of the Morag Tong, Mafala worshippers turned legal assassination administration. The Dunmer, who historically worshipped Mafala, have incorporated a legal way to employ hitmen. I find this detail to often be the straw that breaks the camel's back when discussing the Dunmer with people not familiar with Elder Scrolls. Because I mean, criminal organizations, all cultures have had them at some point. And unique geographic features like giant mushrooms or alien creatures aren't really outside the realm of imagination. But a legally recognized religious organization dedicated to the art of murder that isn't entirely made up of psychopaths? That's a new one for some people. Sure, groups have existed, but usually they didn't hold residents and offices and their actions weren't immediately recognized by law enforcement and acquitted. See, it's a side effect of Tamriel's interpretation of murder. Obviously murder is illegal, but for whatever reason there is no crime you can't pay your way out of. I suppose this is the Empire's way of dealing with affluenza, allowing legal murder at a hefty price. Or it's just a mechanical way to discourage casual murder at the cost of a small bit of immersion. The Morag Tong is also different from other factions in terms of gaining membership. Most factions are over-inclusive, offering casual membership at the drop of a hat. For the Morag Tong, however, membership is exclusive to those who can find their headquarters in Vivek. It's hidden in the arena, just to give that canton something to do when it isn't hosting the final quest of other factions. Once you sign up personally with the Grandmaster Inu Halau, you can get most of the jobs in any of the Morag Tong offices, which are conveniently in all the main towns. Although honestly, you're just better off setting your mark here and working out of Vivek, since it's here that you can receive all of the major quests for the faction from one quest giver. So how does the typical job for the Morag Tong work? To test out our skills, we are given a writ and a name, Faruin Aran. He's a patron over the Elven Nation's Corner Club. He doesn't like the way I'm looking at him, so I pull out my knife and kill him. Everyone in the bar is shocked, I'm a wanted man, and as I leave, I'm confronted by a guard. How does the Tong handle bounties? Now the Morag Tong does have it slightly easier than most when it comes to legal human extermination, but let's start with the basics. When you kill someone, you earn a 1,040 gold bounty. 1,000 for the murder, 40 for the initial assault. From then on, you'll be hounded by guards presenting you with the choice of prison time, paying off your bounty, and summary execution. Remember that in Morrowind, guards are only excited by bounties over 1,000. Bounties over 5k aren't given the option of paying their bounty off, their only recourse being to use the Thieves' Guild, presuming the reason you're wanted didn't involve killing all of them. However, there are still ways to get away with murder. 
In my opinion, it's easier with the Radiant AI systems to commit murders, since in Morrowind, most NPCs have static positions. With that in mind, it's still pretty easy. The first recourse is to just pay the bounty. This comes with a big downside, namely confiscation of stolen goods. If you've seen me strip down before talking to a guard, yeah, that's the reason. But even characters whom I generally did not steal with, like Mace during the Imperial Legion questline would still strip down. And this was because what you might consider stolen, and what the game considers stolen, will not only differ, you won't be told what the game considers stolen. And this was a genuine improvement on the part of Oblivion. For all of these reasons, the rest of these solutions are much more attractive. Active. The core of Morrowind's legal system is reliant on who initiates a lethal confrontation. If you're attacked, you can kill people in self-defense, and that's A-OK. -okay. Using speechcraft, taunts can be used to initiate conflict. It's a strange beast of a system. Whether or not taunts will succeed is contingent on their disposition, but in a parabolic shape, where it's more effective the closer to an average of 50 than it is to an extreme like 0 or 100. People who loathe you and love you are less likely to be goaded into fighting you. But taunts lower your disposition, whether they succeed or fail, and they are dice rolls themselves based on your speechcraft skill. Very commonly, attempting to taunt people to stir them into action would fail because it would grind their disposition down. In a twist of common sense, people can be taunted, bribed, and taunted repeatedly. Then, after you kill them, you get all of your bribe money back. This means in Dunmer culture, a love of money supersedes basic self-preservation instincts. Taunt bribing is a tedious method, however, especially on the Xbox, so let me present another option. Under the illusion discipline, you have the Frenzy spell. A mostly useless spell for traditional playstyles, Frenzy is an easy way to initiate conflicts without issue. Strangely, casting magic to influence people is not considered a form of assault. So those with the skill and magicka can make a Frenzy spell 70 points for 2 seconds. Enemies, violent tendencies don't drop off after those 2 seconds are up, and those 70 points are sufficient to anger every NPC in the game. However, for this situation, I did none of these things. That is because the Morag Tong, as a function of its organization, is allowed to create honorable writs of execution, which guards, even non-Dunmer Imperial guards, will recognize and remove your bounty. I present the writ and walk away a free man. And you can do that for the rest of the quests. There is an added monetary reward for those who can perform the assassinations without needing to use the writs. And even though I am playing a character who already has enough money to buy one of the moons, I actually obliged this request, since Rethan considers himself a professional assassin. The Morag Tong tends to hand out writs in pairs, rather than one at a time. This is good because many of the writs are just go to place, kill person. This makes the questline notes rather short, since none of the quests are really multi-stage or complex. Let's make this more of a highlight reel. Our first two marks couldn't be more different. One is living in the city of Avec, a topper door in Plaza, in a manor. The other is living in a yurt in the Xerophel Bay. The one thing they share, however, is that they both attack us on sight, rightfully suspecting us of being Morag Tong assassins. This is a problem I have with the later Assassin's Quest lines, as well as the Morag Tong where everyone somehow intuits you're an assassin trying to kill them, but nobody else says anything about it in your general life. I could just as easily be the leader of Halau reaching out to the community. I mean, I am the leader of House Halau, and the Kamada Tong for that matter, but whatever. Somehow, people know because I can't just push my murder boner back down into my pants long enough to blend in. Our next set of targets are similar. One target is living with outlaws in Molag Amor. The other two are in Vivek, living in Telvani Plaza's temporary housing unit. The Telvani targets won't give us the time of day, posing a challenge for players who rely on speechcraft to provoke their targets. This is a good progression of mechanics, forcing players to seek new ways to do the work. Option 1 is just killing them, netting a lower pay but being the easiest option. Option 2, which I don't have footage of, is to strip down, open the dialogue to get an alternate greeting, then taunt them. Luckily, Frenzy will work just fine. Eno figures the cave in Malagamor where our targets are hiding is obscure. It's actually pretty easy to find. I even used a bit of stealth to get through the cave. <laughs> In the next phase, we're tasked with killing a member of House Rodoran with an influential family member. This poses a new problem for the player, as now targets may be members of factions, risking expulsion for trying to outright murder people, even if otherwise legally acceptable. What I find funny is that Eno mentions that the Dark Brotherhood is operating in Morrowind. I'm a god. I'm a god. No recall or intervention can work in this place. Intervention can work in this place. There is no escape. No recall or intervention can work in this place. There is no escape. 
there is no escape. Yeah, you don't say. So Inu wants me to make contact with the Brotherhood, that they might come to some mutual understanding. To start, we're directed to meet with Moin Guy, a Maroon's Dagon cultist, who directs me to his contact, Srizami, a Khajiit in the foreign quarter. She says she won't betray the Brotherhood for empty threats or gold, but eventually does thanks to my uncanny ability to charm. And she is totally going to survive her meeting with Inu. Trust me. So this is my target, a Dunmer lady wearing a robe, and you're thinking, how tough can she be? She's only wearing full ebony armor under that robe. See, that's part of what makes Morrowind's armor system great, that you can accessorize with robes and skirts without being a pre-baked model. We get another mission, this time to take out the Ionith boys living at the Dren Plantation, and yes, this is the third part in a row to feature a quest that involves killing these guys. I kind of blew through the writs, but honestly, it's just some work for you to do, which fits the faction's motif nicely. Somehow, the Morag Tong is one of the few factions that isn't plagued with trouble, and it pays decently too, as long as being a servant of Mephala doesn't bother you. While it is a nice progression of difficulty, unfortunately, it's surrounded by its fellow factions, notably the Thieves' Guild and House Halau. All three factions pay extremely well. The factions that actually need the Morag Tong as supplementary income, most notably House Radoran, make the least diegetic sense to join. Thankfully, we're getting into the latter half of the Tong and it features a good storyline. To start, Inu requests that we track down 25 artifacts of Mephala, the threads of the web spinner. They were actually created by Sanguine, but he gave them to Mephala. About three quarters of the artifacts can be found during the events of the Morag Tong questline. The other half are found spread out across Vardenfell. You don't need to complete this quest to progress, but you do have to complete it before you finish off the faction for the reward. Our next task from Inu is to recruit an agent of the Dark Brotherhood, Movis Daris. Should I fail, I'll need to kill him honorably. Daris doesn't really contest the job offer, saying that the Dark Brotherhood lacks honor and gives us a sanguine peace in a show of good faith. Inu now asks we deliver an ultimatum to Karakalmo. Remember him? He was in this video in an earlier part. He was the Mehrunes Dagon worshipper we killed during the Imperial Cult questline. I try to chat with him, which actually works since I'm invisible, and he gives me some good advice, suggesting I stay away from Daedric ruins because Daedra are nasty, and Daedric worshippers are even nastier. Yeah, he says that because it's generic advice. Anyways, I deliver said ultimatum, to which he gets cocky, and I kill him, just as easily as I did in the Imperial Cult questline. Funny, our next quest is basically the same. We go to another ruin, recover a ring, and the guy tells us how nasty Daedric ruins are. Next, we are to kill Darius Marius, a leader in the Brotherhood, who has set up a hideout in the underworks of St. Olms. And finally, we stab at the leadership of the Brotherhood, going after the Night Mother herself, Severa Magia, who's holed up in Ald Satha. Ald Satha is a Daedric ruin right next to Vivek, which is just the smartest place for your faction of assassins to hide. Jesus, these guys are so stupid. I hope this is the last of the Dark Brotherhood we ever see. Six of the sanguine items are here in Ald Satha. I suspect this was a fallback place to put relics that couldn't find homes in broader Vardenfell, and with that, the local Dark Brotherhood chapter has been destroyed. Inu gives us the Black Hand's Dagger, which is a powerful weapon, and... Here it comes. Inu Hulau is going to challenge us to a duel to determine the future leadership of the Morag he offers to step down. While it is tradition in the Tong for power transfer by combat, he actually wants to retire and sees us as a worthy successor. What a pleasant surprise. Why is it that the faction that primarily deals in killing people ends with a peaceful transfer of power, but most of the other, morally better factions end with violent confrontation, betrayal, and slaughter? I refuse him though. Two reasons. The first is that if you accept, Inu Hulao will disappear, making the Threads of the Web Spinner quest unable to be completed. The second is that the only benefit of becoming Grandmaster are the Grandmaster Writs, which are only handed out if you complete the main quest for some reason. Targets include Larius Vero of Moonmoth Fort, Baladas Dimnavani of House Telvani, Dram Barrow of Halau, and Mistress Therana of Telvani. Vero is a dirty cop who works in Balmora. He doesn't really have anything to do with the main quest line. Demnavani dying early can break three different quest lines for the Mages Guild, Tilvani, and the Legion. Drambero can break Halau and the main quest. Therana doesn't really break anything, seeing as she's likely to be killed in the Tilvani quest line, so why these writs are handed out after the main quest is really anyone's guess. Obviously I don't have any footage of me doing them since I wasn't going to change my main quest plans, which did not include Rethan. 
The Morag Tong is one of the more interesting factions in Morrowind. Their main conceit, a legal assassination organization that you can only join if you figure out where they are, is pretty interesting. They pay well, there's a good story in here, and they got a lot of interesting quests that reward creative uses of the game's mechanics. It would have been nice if the Threads of the Web Spinner quest was able to be completed just by working for the Tong. I managed to find 17 of the 25 missing pieces and it kind of sucks just coming up short. It also has the added detriment that the more pieces you find, the harder it gets remembering which pieces you already have. I also wish the Grandmaster Ritz were available prior to completing the main quest since, you know, murders are supposed to have consequences. One complaint I have is that I have been showing off the Vivek branch, but the Tong actually has offices in all major cities. I said earlier that it didn't make sense to work out of them, however, as it's better to complete the questline taking writs and assignments from Inu in tandem. It makes the questline feel very small, because instead of having Balmora contracts on Balmorans, we get contracts on whoever from a singular location, and the player is incentivized to work from Inu because, well, he's the guy you have to talk to to get the job. It feels more like the Tong were given buildings in each of the cities in order to make sure players found out about and knew that the Tong were there, as an option. It's a missed opportunity because the, each office could have had different issues to deal with during their particular quest lines. Balmora could have been about deceit, perhaps clients that are trying to get out of paying contracts, or have the assassins whacked by other criminals, or we have to compete with the Kamana Tong enforcers. Aldrun could have placed special emphasis on performing jobs honorably, as the Tong might be at risk of being expelled from the traditionalist and notably anti daedra Radoran. Sadrith Mora could have had the Tong at its most difficult, routinely getting jobs to settle grudges and tell Vani against powerful wizards. Postscript. Hey, I get why it's called that now. One of the early Telvanni quests involved finding a ring that's in possession of somebody at the Telvanni Morag Tong Hall. The guy who has it refuses to hand it over to you without violence, but if you do outrank him in the Tong, he will give it to you. It wasn't a big quest in Telvanni, but I thought it bears mentioning here because it's another good example of logical faction interplay. But that's all irrelevant now, for we must discuss our final major faction. Of everything I was going to cover for this video, the Tribunal Temple is what I was most looking forward to. I had never actually done it before. Even though I have played Morrowind a great many times, there is always something new that I get to do in this game. I never actually played through the Tribunal Temple, the main reason being a role-playing perspective. Morrowind is hostile to Outlanders and your status as such is non-negotiable. I find this somewhat limits role-playing, but not by much. House Rodoran stretches the limits, but I think it somewhat justifies why an Outlander is allowed in an otherwise hostile faction. The Temple, on the other hand, isn't really a logical choice in my books for players, especially if you go down the main quest line. That said, it is a very interesting and unique faction for the game. It also contrasts nicely with the Imperial Cult. The Cult is a more radical group as they are a religious minority on the island, most associated with outlanders and taking up residence in Imperial forts. On the flip side, the Temple is the official state religion of the Dunmer. The Temple is given a lot of nuance. Sure, they are an antagonistic force in the game and are guilty of religious persecution of their dissidents. Caius Casatis himself also admits they have an admirable dedication to helping the poor, which is something that is corroborated by some of the quests you do for the faction. The Temple also happens to be the main entity that is combating the spread of Blight, Corpus, and the Sixth House, and none of the main Temple figures you interact with are shown in particularly malevolent lights. I think it's a responsible representation of a religious organization, although perhaps it should be stated that unlike the Divines, the Tribunal Temple has the benefit of having their gods personally interact with them and help to manage to protect their society. And so continues the story of Jib and Daris, Archmaster of House Redorn, on his rise to sainthood. Starting out in the temple, you will be tasked with completing the Pilgrimages of the Seven Graces. These are seven pilgrimages that introduce some key ideas and lore about the temple. These pilgrimages are also an effective measure of filtering out commoners for the more difficult tasks done by higher echelons in the temple. It's also a big part of culture on Vardenfell, so there are plenty of quests that involve pilgrims, generally to help them out. The first, and by far the safest, pilgrimage is to the Fields of Kumu. At this shrine, you will donate a piece of muck. This is the Shrine of Humility, where the god Vivek had worked out in the field as a beast of burden for a farmer whose guar had died. Our next stop is the Shrine of Justice in Nisus. For this one, you donate a potion of cure disease and touch the ash mask. Attention should be paid to the shrine itself as it turns out the real ash mask is hidden, which when used teaches a cure common and blight disease spell on touch that is very magicka efficient and will be useful for later quests. Our next stop is the Coal Cave, near Nisus, which we actually visited during a side quest I didn't mention during the House Redoran section. This is the Shrine of Valor, where Vivek had fought the King of the Drew, Drow. 
It doesn't matter, because the king got killed. You can get a free set of armor if you follow Vivek's actions at the shrine by slaying a Drow in the cave, which is nearly as exploitable as the Divine Intervention Scroll exploits in the Imperial Cult line, but I was content just donating one piece of Druax. Our next stop is the Shrine of Pride, which is located about 100 feet inside the ghost fence of Red Mountain. It's basically just Dunmer daring each other to enter the haunted house, which is being occupied by very real zombies and Satanists. To knowledge, this is one of only a few quests that involve going inside of Red Mountain, outside of the main quest line. The shrine requires a donation of a soul gem, any value, which includes Azura's star. So, in a fitting twist, work for the tribunal can steal your reward for working for Azura. And in another fitting twist, Azura's star happens to be just big enough to steal the souls of Vivek and Amalexia. Really though, the shrine accepts the permanent donation of Azura's star because of bad scripting. There are other quests that will do this as well, such as the Telvanni Stronghold quest. This is because, for whatever reason, the game tries to take the largest value soul gem out of your inventory, which is always going to be Azura's star should you possess it. Our next few stops are in Vivek itself. The Shrine of Generosity accepts donations of 100 gold for a small boost to luck and mercantile. Have I talked about luck? Most of Morrowind's skills and mechanics are reliant on complex mathematical equations. This factors in a multitude of attributes, skills, and fatigue. Luck tends to be a minor influence on these equations. I didn't really play any character long enough to demonstrate what difference a decent amount of luck can be for various playstyles. I didn't play with high luck because luck has no skills, meaning they can only be raised one point per level, which also means you can't level up another attribute. If I wasn't able to put multiple points in another attribute, then I would default to raising my luck, but I don't think I ever actually raised it past 50. If you're a safe scummer, luck is the attribute for you, because it tends to influence your chances with things you would save scum, like alchemy, speechcraft, and lockpicking, even stuff like hit chance, both offensive and defensive. Another shrine in Vivek is the shrine to stop the moon. There's a large celestial body hanging over the city. Turns out long ago, after the switch from Resdane to Morrowind and from Daedra to Tribunal, Shia Gorath... Have you come to be of service to Shigarath? Shigarath threw a massive rock at Vivek City. Vivek, using his divine power, stopped the rock in place. Although, spoiler alert, he didn't stop the velocity of the rock, just froze it in time. Technically, he's not actually moving slower. He's moving at the same speed, just over a longer period of time. Huh? It's relativistic. His fist still travels at the same velocity. We just view it from a faster time frame. Therefore, it looks slowed down, but theoretically, it should still carry the same force. Force. Madness. This pleases me. This is the best shrine, both in name, backstory, and benefit. In exchange for a levitation potion, you get a 48 minute, 100 point levitation effect. 100 points is very fast, more so the higher your speed is. Levitation potions range in price, but the cheapest you can donate can be found for less than 50 gold. And in terms of location, the shrine is right next to an Almsavi intervention point in Vivek, meaning a possible navigation option for the city is to Almsavi, donate a cheap levitate potion, and fly around the city. Although it's worth noting that the actual effect time can be run down if you wait. Like, use the wait function, not sit there for an hour. Our next shrine is in the Puzzle Canal, a neglected area of the game. Despite what Vivek will say, the only hidden treasure here is the shrine. The shrine here is the Shrine of Courtesy, but it will only give the cryptic hint to breathe the water to make the way clear. When we awake, we find the room has changed. There's a new shrine, but to use it we have to give a silver longsword to a very, very bored Dramora. I brought my own, but he keeps a selection of swords on hand, presumably because he doesn't want to have to haggle with pilgrims who come unprepared and demand to speak to his manager. Sadly, despite how detailed the shrine is, its effect does not match. You get water breathing and swift swim for 48 minutes. Remember, outside this palace, in an easily accessible area, is a shrine that will give you the power of flight. And here we get a fairly weak swim bonus and water breathing. And those were the seven graces. If it seemed easy, that is a consequence of me doing a little preparation and playing a character that's already been broken in. So we return to Tol's Valen, in Aldrun, who welcomes us as an acolyte in the temple. A common trend when working for the temple involves several quests that will have us curing people of disease. Many of these quests will emphasize the need to maintain humility. One of the quests even entails curing a Daedra worshiper in a Daedric ruin full of hostiles on the side of a cliff. 
This is where knowing the spell the Vex Touch from doing the Seven Graces comes in handy. Quite a few of the quest rewards are skill books, which I definitely approve of, although I think having actual training as rewards might be slightly better since literature tends to also double as a monetary reward, which is not in line with the temple's values. Also, a difference between the Xbox and PC copies of the game have to do with skill books. On the PC, you can use the inventory screen to pick up books without reading them, meaning you can stash them for later, more expensive levels. Here's my library on my latest PC playthrough of skill books I've collected from playing every faction aside from Radoran. Now is a fair point to mention the 36 Sermons of Vivek. Morrowind is full of ancillary literature like, for example, the 2920 series which is 12 books detailing the events of the final year of the First Era. Some of my information that I've generally sourced to the UESP is itself sourced to some of this work. Most of the books are short stories with some insight into the world and culture. Not the 36 sermons. The sermons are long at 16,000 words and difficult to read in one sitting due to the various changes in prose, structure, and logic. It also conflicts heavily with actual historical accounts, which makes sense given Vivek has been playing historical revisionist for over a millennia at this point. What the books themselves are about is almost irrelevant. It's a revised story of the origin of Vivek and his relationship with Endoral Nerevar, the nature of which will be revealed in greater detail during the main quest. What is significant about the books is that they, even today, serve as the series' primary example of its foundation on the concept of the unreliable narrator. The series is an increasingly complicated web of lore and theory crafting that allows for effectively any interpretation of the setting to be correct. A good example of this would be the fate of Atmora, the original homeland of humanity. Atmora is said to have been frozen over, but what this actually means depends on the account. One account would suggest that it literally froze over. Another account suggests that the dragons, who represent corporeal time, left Atmora and the continent was subsequently frozen in time. Or perhaps the apocalypse hit and Atmora was frozen in time in the sense that no one lives there anymore, so nobody bothers to make the trip. Because the player is never able to visit Atmora themselves, it's impossible to say which interpretation is correct, and that is the point because it's a reflection of human writing as well. Michael Kirkbride wrote the 36 sermons, but he wasn't alone with his philosophy. As Douglas Goodall is quoted as saying, Ken Rolston wrote a dozen different accounts, apparently without any personal preference to which, if any, was accurate, and ignored the contradictions. End quote. I feel that far too many people attribute Morrowind's writing to Kirkbride, which, like the sermons, isn't necessarily an accurate truth. He wrote the sermons, and while the sermons are an iconic part of Morrowind, they are not Morrowind itself. Let's get back to the temple then. An early quest I was tasked with was to deal with Elvil Vidron, who is claiming to be something called the Nereverine. Don't worry, that name will never come up again. We are asked to convince him otherwise, but should this prove impossible, to kill him. Sure enough, he has his shirt off and is ranting in the street about the blight spreading from Red Mountain. Nothing I can say will convince him, so I kill him, and on his person is an ash statue. We're then tasked with making another pilgrimage. This time, we're to go to Margan and mimic the events that occurred at the temple there. Long ago... Mayreen's Dagon, yes, that's how it was spelled, Mayreen's Dagon was gonna throw a rock at some Dunmer. The Dunmer people have had more rocks thrown at them than the dinosaurs. Anyways, Vivek taunted Dagon to throw the rock at him instead. Well, I doubt Mayrunes is in the area waiting to throw around rocks at pilgrims, given he's currently planning his invasion of Tamriel in, what, seven years? So I asked the local priest for help, and he's the one to tell us to reenact this drama. I have to taunt a Dremora in the room into fighting me, he threatens to rape my corpse, I touch the giant rock, and the ritual is complete. You know, I'm really starting to find faith here. The Tribunal Temple is a very... populist. A very populist religion, because their pilgrimages are all about physically imitating the actions of their idols. But not everybody can toil at the fields of Kumu, or slay the Drog King, or stop a meteor from starting the Red Khan year. Or in this case, get Mayrun's Dagon to focus their attention on them. Hard left, we're tasked with convincing a pilgrim, Tanusia Veloth, who's popular in the city of Vivek, of leaving town as she's contracted Corpus. She's hanging out in the arena, presumably watching all my characters and all their various duels, and impressed with my battle with Bulv and Venom, leaves when I ask her nicely. Fun fact, if you kill her and search her body, you contract Corpus disease. It's incurable and will completely break your game as NPCs refuse to speak with you. Also, for anyone in the audience who might not already know this, you're completely capable of spreading diseases that you show no symptoms for. Do not be like Tanusia Veloth. Our next quest has us take an oath of silence and journey to the Sanctus Shrine. Let's see, we're in Vivek, which is in the south of the map here, and the shrine is, uh... 
This entailed a long journey on foot as I was not able to speak to anybody, including fast travel services. Well, on foot, as in my feet were atop the air as I journeyed through the sky battling cliff racers. Yeah, that shrine that gives a 48 minute levitation effect came in real handy, but uh, good try and an interesting quest. We do get four skill books as a reward, which is pretty substantial as it's maybe four tenths of a level if those skills are in your class. We cure some people, deliver some food, lowly busybody work, and finally we're tasked with making another pilgrimage, this time to Mount Kant, which is I think the second tallest mountain in Vardenfell, the low draw distance makes it hard to tell. Up at the mount, we're approached by a flame atronach who challenges us to solve a riddle. A metal, neither black nor red, as heavy as man's golden greed. What you do to stay ahead, with friend, or arrow, or steed. The correct answer is lead. I think keeping the rhyming scheme is the riddle here, as I don't know what color lead is supposed to be, nor do I have any inkling how heavy daedric, glass, or ebony are compared to lead. Further in the cave, we meet a frost atronach with another riddle. If you lie to me, I will slay you with my sword. If you tell me the truth, I will slay you with a spell. I tell him he'll slay us with a spell, catching him in a paradox and earning our passage. Remember, people who stake life and death on riddles are entirely irrational and will likely kill you if you try to invoke a paradox on them. Finally, we meet a storm Atronach with its own riddle. My fellow Atronach, Zedius Soko, was slain. The Altmer claims the Dunmer is guilty. The Dunmer says the Khajiit did it. The Orc swears that he didn't kill Zedius Soko. The Khajiit says the Dunmer is lying. If only one of these speaks the truth, who killed Zedius Soko? Now, I actually figured this one out without using a wiki. Okay, basically, the orc did it because that's what orcs do. The actual logic is the Dunmer accuses the Khajiit and the Khajiit says the Dunmer is lying. Both of these people can't be right because only one person is telling the truth, which means they can both be ruled out. The orc and the Altmer are thus lying, and since the orc's lie is about the murder, that makes him the suspect. I like that each of these races basically summarizes how those races are characterized in this game, and also this is kind of a reference to the two murder mystery quests in this game. This opens the way to the shrine and completes our pilgrimage. But wait, we're missing the fourth challenge. Where's the watermelon outronet? We get tasked with some real work to take out a necromancer working near Malagmar. Guess what faction T's a part of? Oh. Oh, well, that was supposed to be a joke, because it's not in my notes or in the quest page that he was a rogue Telvanni. I mean, he's the lowest rank of the faction, but still. Tatha Sil. One of the priestesses has a vision of an artifact, and not one of the Lalatia Varian brand visions where I need to hire a consultant to figure out what it means. She knows that it's right across the pond at Ald Satha. Oh yeah, I have an amulet that basically renders me invisible. I somehow forgot about that. We're then tasked with wiping out a Shigarath cult here in Vivek in the ra I mean the sewer level. I kinda panic because I get attacked as soon as I enter and realize I haven't saved in a while, but it goes okay. Shigarath is even thrilled to see me. Fetch the Fork of Horopolation from the Mad Hermit near Aldradania. Take care with him. He's not the most... stable man. And so, I have done enough menial, and perhaps not so menial, labor to earn my way up to the near top, where I get to meet the Archcanon, Tholer Serioni. He wants to retire, on the condition I make some pilgrimages to the four corners of the House of Troubles. So, when the temple was starting out, they had to pay lip service to the old gods of the Dunmer, who were called Chimer back then. The Daedra. The Chimer were kind of unique in having their entire pantheon be Daedra, as opposed to most Merrick cultures that worship Aedra. But like Almer, they do agree that Lorcan was kind of a prick for pulling that whole mortality stunt. The Chimer Pantheon were split into two groups based on temperament, the good and the bad Daedra. The good Daedra were the Anticipations, Boethia, Azura, and Mephala. The Anticipations were meant to back up the Tribunal. Boethia is the Anticipation of Amalexia. She was the one who defeated the Adric god Trinomach in combat and ate him. Mephala is the anticipation of Vivek, teaching the Dunmer in trickery and political organization. Azura is the anticipation of Satha Sil. She is who they mistakenly attribute their change from the Chimer to the Dunmer as being a gift. We'll get to that next episode. The other side of the anticipations are the four corners of the House of Troubles. These are Meireen's Dagon, Shigarath, Malakath, and Molag Ball. Fans will recognize why these guys have their reputations, with Dagon and Shigarath in particular earning their reputations in this very questline. 
Malakath is alleged to be Trinimac, although even he himself will admit this is a far more literal interpretation than reality. He represents the ostracized, which makes a great deal of sense considering much of the old Dunmer culture was founded on Veloth being contrary to the Aldmer. Molag Bal, well, let's just say there's multiple stories about Molag Bal learning his title as the King of Rape, in more than one meaning of the word. Each of the Daedra worshipped by the Dunmer make a degree of sense in terms of their culture. Boethia for their martial culture, Mothala for the political guile, Azura for prophecy, Merun's Dagon for the spirit of warfare, Shigarath, Malakath for their history as spurned Mur, and Molagbal for their sense of superiority over other races. So why in the world are we making pilgrimages to the bad Daedra? Well, I can guess a few reasons. The first is that, generally, the temple trusts its upper echelon to be faithful enough to deal with the Four Corners. The second guess would be that the temple only discourages Daedra worship as they don't trust common Dunmer to do it safely. The third guess would be that it is a necessary function of an archcanon to know the Four Corners well enough prior to a situation where he would need to know them, as seems to happen frequently in Dunmer history. Our first pilgrimage is to Malakath and requires the donation of four Daedra hearts, which are actually pretty easy to get in this game. The shrine is surrounded by hostile worshippers, luckily I can just avoid them, and we recite a giant block of text. Basically, the temple was built on a bad foundation, four pillars of trouble, or the Daedra, and yet the Dunmer through faith still served the latter thanks to the temple. Next, we journey to a shrine of Meireen's Dagon, which happens to be at Ald Satha. We have to kill his worshippers this time, and we recite a poem. Then we go to Molag Bal, who's over at Bal Ur, and after clearing out the Nord populace, I hear the distant sound of someone getting hurt, which is pretty damn spooky. This one teaches me a command humanoid spell, which is a slightly overpowered spell if used properly, so thanks Uncle Molag. The fourth corner is Shigarath, and Serioni tells us that we need to renew our pact with him, kind of indicating my third guess as being correct. We have to do this by locating something called the Gamble Putty, and donating it to him at his shrine at Al Daedroth where a giant battle is occurring. Here we get to meet some ordinators, and actually we've been seeing them for a while, I spoke on them last episode. They're the members of House Endoral, serving as the militant arm of the temple. They aren't to be confused with the boy and armagers who work up at the Ghost Gate fighting the Sixth House. Ordinators are the guards of Avec and Molag Mar, and apparently get to go out on a missions such as this one. Ordinators are some of the toughest guards in the game, and particularly notable, ordinators become hostile if you adorn their armor, which is some of the best medium armor in the base game, and will put you on their permanent shit list. This, their terrible attitudes, We're watching you, scum. And their proclivity to summarily execute heretics has given them a bad reputation. But that's the Order of Inquisition. This is the Order of War, who are responsible for fighting Daedra in the Sixth House. They are apparently bad at their job, since to this point their only known mission outside of this one was to recover the Robe of St. Roars, and they failed in that regard. They aren't faring too well here either, being matched in combat by Shigarath worshippers. And mind you, one of the orcs here thinks he's a cat. We manage to meet the head of the cult, who says we're welcome, noting that the ordinators are currently trying to crash the party. I hang around for a bit and then slip and orc some moon sugar, who tells us there's something under his pillow for us, the sugar fairy. Sure enough, there's the gamble putty. Always the first place you look. We give it to the statue and it fortifies random attributes as a reward. Serioni congratulates us on our work and has one final pilgrimage before promoting us to... Patriarch? Not Archcanon? Oh, right, you're part of the main quest, so we can't replace you. His final task is to recover the Ebony Mail. The Mail is an artifact of Boethia, and is located at a shrine atop Mount Asernabibi. This is Levitate 1. And this is Levitate 100. And this? This is Levitate 500. <laughs> I better knock that off before the Xbox crashes. Anyways, we just activate the shrine and boom, free ebony mail, which is arguably the best armor in the game. We even get to keep it and get our promotion to Patriarch. But was that really it? Just climb a mountain and activate a shrine, no puzzle, no intrigue? Kind of a letdown. I have mixed feelings about the Tribunal Temple. On the one hand, it's a well-fleshed out religion that represents the Dunmer well. But on the other hand, it's another quest line with no overarching narrative. Which is sad, after the Seven Graces and the quest dealing with the False Incarnate, I would have hoped that the temple had been a bit more exploratory in some of its big themes, like the secret authoritarian police thing, or its battle with the Sixth House. Even maybe just a quest line where we try to repair the temple's presence in Telvanni territory. 
It's ironic that some of the most interesting aspects of the temple from the main quest aren't featured at all in the actual temple quest line itself. That said, I do appreciate where the game was going with the pilgrimages. I wish all of them were as intricate as the one where you had to drown yourself in a display of faith. The way the final pilgrimage ends, no riddles, no challenges, just activate a shrine and get your reward. There are some quests I didn't do that are combat oriented, including one that is basically a ding dong ditch at Dagother's house, and another one that involves wiping out the head of the vampire clans, one that involves killing the head of a sixth house cult, and a final one that involves killing some Daedra worshippers in Vivek. But I got away without doing them because with how the faction is paced, you'll end up getting enough rep to end up finishing the faction before you're told about them. So ultimately, your experience with the faction can be rather dry since the big combat quests it's building to are functionally optional. The four factions I covered in this section, the Imperial Legion, the Imperial Cult, the Morag Tong, and the Tribunal Temple, round off the final four of the major factions of Morrowind. The Legion, somewhat unlike the Fighters Guild in House Redorn, is a true warrior faction that requires its members don heavy armor. The Cult and the Temple are for Monk players, providing multiple options for meaty religious factions while also being a good fit for mage characters, and the Tong sits as the game's only avenue for assassin characters, although House Hulahu can somewhat fill in that niche. There are a couple more technical factions that bear mentioning that didn't get any coverage. The Twin Lamps is an abolitionist organization with a few quests. To join, you need to free 21 slaves. Many slaves can be found in various smugglers' caves, a few in Telvanni territory, but the bulk of slaves can be found in Hulahu territory. While many Dunmer will give their opinions on the topic of abolition, it seems that either the idea wasn't able to be fully implemented into a full faction, or the implication is that abolition has only recently become a cause due to how recent the Empire's arrival in Vardenfell was. Either way, I think Bethesda wouldn't have had to dance around the issue of slavery so much later on if they had done a proper abolitionist questline in the first place. There are also three vampire clans that are functionally similar, their only difference being their stat alignments. They each only have two quests. I was originally going to work them in, but honestly I realized they would just be unnecessary weight for the analysis. There's a quest line where we get a Khajiit girlfriend, and Captain Vero at Moonmoth Fort has a couple quests where we dish out some vigilante justice in Balmora. I hope that, at this point, it becomes apparent just why I'm so disappointed in the later game's faction choices. Douglas Goodall did a good job of showing how the various factions can interplay and wrote in logical solutions to a few quests. The quest lines are also far less linear, providing unique paths that each repeat playthrough can go down, even so far as having completely alternate endings such as in the Fighters Guild. And the sheer number of them. Three guilds, three houses, two temples, a military, and a cult. And then you throw in the main quest on top of all that. There are also no dynamic quests, as they haven't been implemented into the engine yet. This means each quest is handcrafted, for better and for worse. That said, there are some quests that are pretty boring, but even that can add to the experience and help with roleplaying. Not every faction should feel super high stakes in its conclusion. And one thing I should note that doesn't seem to come off in my videos is that this isn't an example of Morrowind being the perfect Elder Scrolls game, just that I wish it had actually received a sequel instead of a downgrade. The factions, unfortunately, provide little to do after conclusion. This is a problem that is universal in Elder Scrolls. Once you take over, the quest line is over. Another problem is that being the leader of certain factions would provide resolution to certain issues that it doesn't. The Black Jinx quest is a nice example of where that works, but many examples where it doesn't are present in the main quest line. Let's just say that if you do the main quest after completing even one of these factions, you will raise your eyebrow at some point at some of the problems. For instance, being the leader of the Tribunal Temple would resolve some of the stakes in the quest line, but the game cannot account for all the combinations of possibilities. This is likely one of the reasons Bethesda would strip back the number of factions in the later games. For example, it's doubtful that Odril Helvi would ask the highest ranking member of the Imperial Legion to smuggle Ebony, House Tovani would not accept the membership of a prominent member of the Mages Guild, and vice versa. There's a clip on YouTube where the guy that challenges you before entering Sovngarde will respond to some of your achievements in your playthrough, and people are actually impressed that there are voice lines responding to your achievements in a game with five factions. My dream for an Elder Scrolls game is one where these faction combinations would logically play out. I like the idea of exclusivity between factions, and I hate the idea that the main character of each game is also the character that is supposed to have completed those factions. Each faction should require a new playthrough, so that each playthrough can fully explore a different playstyle without having to compete with already built characters. That's part of the reason why I made seven different characters for this analysis. And what I definitely want are factions that you can actually lead. They kinda got close with this with the Arena faction in Oblivion. Where's the ability to create and assign writs of execution, at the risk of angering Mephala? Or handle assignments in the guild? 
or make political decision in the houses. I thought the war conference scene in Skyrim could have gone so much harder into faction relations. If the threat in the main quest line threatens the world, then all the prominent factions should be involved. But I understand it's a lot of work, and it's easy for me to spout ideas on the internet when I don't have much in the way of real experience in game development. Bethesda needs to get back to making good Elder Scrolls games before they can start to focus on improving their formula. Because what I want isn't Morrowind, it's a true sequel. And I think, with all the goddamn money they've made, that it's about time we got one. Indaris had encounters with the Daedra near the end of his journey, so let's see those same Daedra from the perspective of a Daedra worshipper. In between the original release of this series and this complete edition, there was a new character, an orcish warrior known only as Umbra. Morrowind has seven Daedra quests. Rather than including the entire pantheon, only Daedra relevant to the Dunmer culture are worshipped on Vardenfell. These Daedra are predictably the good and bad Daedra of the Tribunal Temple. Let's tackle the good Daedra first. Azura's Shrine sits in the open air at the apex of the island's southeastern shoreline. Despite being the most visible, the shrine is empty, due to its distance from civilization. Speaking with the statue, Azura made a bet with Sheo Gorath that one of her worshippers could live in isolation for a century and retain her sanity. While well, time's almost up and wanting to win, Sheo Gorath has gone and sent a bunch of Daedra to her shack to defraud the wager. You have come here for a reason though you may not know what it is. Now, the quest designer made this nice area where you would fight through waves of Daedra up the hill to the shack, except I would be willing to bet pretty much everyone who has ever done this quest came at it from the east because they traveled to the island from Dagon Fell. Anyways, kill all the Daedra and grab a signet ring of Sheo Gorath. You can actually fail the quest if you go inside the shack, which is a good touch. You get two rewards from this quest, first being the signet ring. Like most things Shea Gorath, it comes with an up and a downside. Upside is a 10 point personality fortification, while the downside is a 10 point willpower penalty. The ring is still useful since you can equip and unequip it dependent on the situation. The other reward is Azura Star, a versatile throwing weapon. Wait, is that right? For you, our thanks and blessing, our gift and token given, come. Take this thing from the hand of God. Take this, and use it wisely. Let's see what you're made of. Okay then. Azura Star is actually a reusable soul gem, which is especially useful in Morrowind because you don't get reliable access to grand level soul gems for a long time. Even in general, the star is useful given the high probability of failure when enchanting. It's also the only soul gem capable of capturing the souls of... Moving on, Boethius Quest. It's an easy quest once you figure out how to start it. Unless you spend a lot of time swimming along the coasts, the only non-internet related way to find the shrine is to meet Maik the Liar and chat with him. Most of what he says is either bullshit or is channeling the rod god Todd himself except for discussion on the shrine. Once you find the shrine at the bottom of the ocean, she'll ask you rebuild her shrine in exchange for a fancy sword. What do you want to be, mortal? My shrine is in ruins. My priests have forgotten me. Will you rebuild my shrine, mortal? Her only clue is to find a sculptor in Caldera, which will eventually take you to the Gorok Manor, an orcish home which happens to house the scamp Creeper, which is fitting since Maik name drops Mr. Mudcrab but not Creeper. Anyways, you meet the sculptor and he says he'll need 2,000 gold in three weeks to build the shrine. He's not kidding, three weeks pass, which I spend doing other quests, and the shrine is complete. The quest really is that simple, as the bulk of it seems to be finding the shrine and waiting the time. It's fitting that all Boethia wants is a new shrine to hand over her legendary sword, Goldbrand. You have done well. The shrine is a worthy one, but my power will again be felt. She doesn't have any other shrines on Vardenfell, and she hands over her only other notable artifact, the Ebony Male, to the Patriarch of the Temple just as easily for being able to treat with the bad Daedra and stay loyal. Ordinarily, Boethia is usually involved in deception. I'm guessing her characterization here is meant to reflect the fact that of the three good Daedra, Boethia has the worst PR. Azura is openly worshipped by the Ashlanders, and Mafala has an entire legal cult in the Morag Tong. Meanwhile, Boethia's shrine has probably sat at the bottom of the ocean since the end of the first era. I mean, 
It's sitting squarely in the channel which was sunk after Red Mountain's eruption during the Battle of Red Mountain. Finally, Mafala. Unlike Boethia and Azura, her shrine is located in one of the faction hubs, which makes sense given her relationship with the Morag Tong. Mafala's secretary tells us that she wants us to take care of a Morag Tong assassin who's been doing some unauthorized freelance work. We have to break into his Balmora home, which doesn't show up on the map without getting within a certain distance of him, and poison his kettle before escarpering. This quest is more dynamic than the average Morrowind quest, although it also has a hefty list of things that can go wrong if you don't do things exactly right. You have done well, mortal. There are some things that must be done to preserve the order, and it will be amusing for me when this business comes to light. I look forward to it. Our reward is the Ring of Khajiit, which gives a beefy 30 second invisibility and fortify speed 10 to 20 points for 30 seconds. Mafala's counterpart representation in the Morag Tong was a collection quest to find a bunch of sanguine artifacts that she had been given out. Mafala isn't much of a character since she speaks through someone else instead of speaking directly to the player, the only danger in the game to do so, but she is the Shadow Queen. This leads into the Bad Daedra. Let's handle this in the same order as the Tribunal Temple. Malakath wants a 4 Daedra Heart donation in the Temple questline while he just wants us to find his shrine at Esurderalapal. This is significant because there are eight different shrines to Malakath and Morrowind. Zerganapal, Kasarari, Shash Pilamat, Ashur Nabibi, Ashur Tartes, Dershuraran, and the Shrine of Malakath we visit in the Temple questline. There's not really any clues which shrine is the one that Malakath is taking calls at, so you might end up killing one or twenty orcs before you find the right one. Orcs love Malakath, and Malakath loves them back. Malakath requests we clear up the matter of a Dunmer hero, Orain Bearclaw, who was falsely credited with the deeds of his orcish ally, and we clear this up by wiping out his bloodline. He actually has two separate intros contingent on if you're an orc or not. Our character happens to be an orc. You have summoned me, orc? Have you come to restore the honor of your people? Malakath sends you to Vivek, which in turn leads to Narmok. Turns out that Fervin Arrain is pretty weak and his bodyguards do the bulk of the heavy lifting, like progenitor, like successor. Even now, the Orains are taking credit for others' work. The helm you get is a really solid heavy helm with some impressive stats to boot. You have killed the false hero and ensured there will be no more to follow. You have helped bring back honor to the Orcish people, and for that, I am glad. Malakath's quest here fits his characterization as an orc fetishist. I'm just trying to get out premium orc content to myself, because I fucking love it, pal, and it looks so fucking good, and I, it's just that, that tight green skin. Oh, ah! Can I just say that I love orcs? One of the books in the game is a story about the king of the orcs, Gortwa Gro Nagorm, who fought a duel against a Breton prince for Orsinium. Except one of Gortwag's supporters taught the prince how to fight in orcish armor so that Gortwag would have a challenge. Apparently, Gortwag believed that Malakath was sabotaging the Orsimer to keep them as a loyal but outcast society, and officially only Trinimac was recognized as the god of the orcs. I mean, he's absolutely right, and it's oh so convenient that his Orsinium fell during the Oblivion Crisis. The next corner of the House of Troubles is Mehrun's Dagon, whose shrine is at Yasemadan. Now, I could list all the Mehrun's Dagon shrines, but we actually came here during the Morag Tong questline to grab one of the threads of the web spinner. Mehrun's would like us to go to a tomb in Malagamor and retrieve Mehrun's razor. Why do you call on me, little mortal? Do you seek your death so soon? I should crush you where you stand, yet you show metal by even approaching me. How ambitious are you, little one? My razor, slayer of man and myrrh, scourge of all who stand before it, lies dormant, stolen by an unworthy bearer, an elf of little courage or consequence. It lies unused, gathering dust in the Alas tomb near Molag Mar. Return it to me, mortal. We only find a rusty dagger, which we return to the shrine, and it's magically transformed into the razor. You found my razor. Good. Can you feel its hunger? Can you feel its frustration? Now I will make it again what it once was, what it shall always be. Draw a line of blood across the land in the name of Mehrun's Dagon. 
You might ask if that is it, and the answer is yes. I'm not sure why this quest is so short. I mean, Mayrun's Dagon is probably busy planning that whole invasion of Tamriel thing, and maybe he just wanted someone to bring the blade back into the fold. But the quest proper doesn't really have anything to do with the themes or character of Mayrun's Dagon, which is similar to the counterpart Tribunal Temple quest line. Even his voice actor sounds similar to a certain other demonic entity in Morrowind. What a fool you are. Perhaps they weren't quite sure what they wanted Mayrun's Dagon to really be. Molek Ball is the third corner. His shrine, the relevant one anyways, is at Yamsiramas. His counterpart quest in the temple took place at Bal-Ur, a more fitting name, and ended with a command humanoid spell. So that's the quest to beat. Molek Ball says that one of his minions, Minta Na, has been obeying the temple's stay-at-home order instead of going around terrorizing the population. Why do you summon me now? I have no time for your pleadings, weakling. The Daedroth is living in a cave in the heart of the Ashlands, and we go off to kill it. The reward is the Mace of Molag Ball, which is a solid mid-tier weapon. I mean, it's the best mace in the game, meaning that it's outclassed by ebony and up longswords. This is a pretty simple quest that is also missing substance. You have freed the soul of Mentana. Torment will be his. Endless agony is all you know until the end of time. The final corner is Sheo Gorath. He had the most developed of the tribunal quests as we were renewing our subscription to Dunmer Sanity. Well, the shrine we need to visit is Ahina Palette, which we cordially visit and subsequently wiped out during the temple questline. Even if you kill all the worshippers, Shigarath is willing to request that we go up to Sheo Gorad, meet one of his guys, and get the Fork of Horopolation in order to take out a giant bull niche plaguing his worshipper. What is it, mortal? Have you come to be of service to Shigarath? That in and of itself speaks toward your madness. This pleases me. This can be a bit of a challenge, especially if you aren't skilled with Short Blade. You just need to land the killing blow with the fork, but it's still a bit of a challenge. Your reward is the Spear of Bitter Mercy, which is not a Shigarath artifact. It's a Hircine artifact that was created by Mehrun's Dagon. Perhaps you've gotten a taste of madness as well? Do not believe madness to be a curse, mortal. For some, it is the greatest of blessings. A bitter mercy, perhaps, but mercy nonetheless. Speaking of Hircine, his artifact, the Savior's Hide, is at Divithfir's Tower, except Malakath worshippers, like with all things, contend that the Hide is actually a Malakath artifact. In either event, its properties were designed to protect the wearer from the Spear of Bitter Mercy. Well, don't worry, because we'll be getting more Hircine content in the Blood Moon expansion. It's interesting how much of a variable the Daedra quests are. It feels like the core of the quests was spaced out to be filled in later, and later only came for a couple of the quests. Of course, there are only 7 Daedra quests compared to the typical 16 in most of the games, for the purpose of filling the appropriate Daedra for the Dunmer culture. Periyte just doesn't fit in. But I feel like getting less than half of the Daedra princes could only be validated if all of the quests were as meaty as, or meatier than, the Shayagorath quest. So let's go on a quest. A real quest. Which doesn't have any journal entries. Let's get a full set of Daedric armor. There are only two complete sets in the game. One is in the possession of Telvanni Lord Divith Fear, who is level 65, has a thousand health, and is wearing said set of powerful Daedric armor. So we're off to complete the set. Starting with the gauntlets, a pair can be found deep in the ancient Dunmer stronghold of Kogorun. This is one of the main dungeons of the main quest, and is full of sixth house cultists. Onto the pauldrons, the right pauldron can be found in the tower of Castle Karstag over on Solstheim. Yeah, there are a couple pieces that couldn't be found in the base game outside of Divithfir himself. The left pauldron is found inside Norarin Dur, a dungeon located in the city of Mornhold in the Tribunal expansion. This one takes the most effort because you have to do about half of the Tribunal questline in order to open up the dungeon, and even then, actually finding the pauldron is difficult given the low light conditions. I can easily imagine a situation where players cleared this dungeon and didn't realize they were missing on some fantastic loot. A pair of Daedric boots can be found in the fortress of Gallum Deus, a vampire stronghold home to Clan Burn. You are guaranteed to visit the clan during the House Tovani questline and can potentially visit it during the Tribunal Temple questline. 
Moving on to the Greaves, there are three potential pairs to get. The first is a reward from Mistress Drotha of House Telvanni, which will be enchanted with a 50-point feather effect. This could help with the immense weight of Daedric equipment. The second option is at Druskathsi, the stronghold of the vampire clan Quora. Outside of typical adventuring, the player is only likely to come here if they become a vampire and either join their patron clan or work for House Telvanni. Then, the third option is at the Dren Plantation, sitting on a shelf behind Kamanatong leader Orvis Dren. A number of quests send you here, so the Greaves are probably the one piece of the Daedric set most players have gotten their hand on. It's not even that difficult to steal, what with this convenient pole next to Dren. The Curus has two options, and only one of them belong to the base game. It's also a reward from Mr. Strotha with its own 50-point feather effect covering about half of its weight. The other option is inside Norn and Dur, next to where we got the left pauldron. Finally, we have the choice of not one, but three different Daedric Helms, called Faces. In order of lowest to highest armor rating, the Face of Inspiration, the Face of Terror, and the Face of God. The Face of Inspiration can be found in three places. One is worn by Galdo Omain, the leader of the buoyant armagers. Another can be found in Mimea, a large sixth house base, and a third can be found in Ibar Dad, a sorcerer's cave that leads into an ancient tomb. The Face of Inspiration is a fitting reward for whichever trial you should wish to face. Being the second strongest face, there are only two faces of terror. One is worn by Enar Drelo, a high-ranking buoyant armager. So as long as you're willing to eat the bounty of wiping out the Ghost Gate, you could take care of two faces in one go. Your other option is at Anna Nabia, which is a Daedric ruin we uncovered during the Imperial Cult questline near Sadrith Mora. As the strongest face, there is only one face of God. In exchange for some Matsi, a Nord in the Telvanni Canton will tell you of a First Age Nord who was buried in Tukashapal, and will provide a key. Tukashapal is an impressive dungeon. There's a maze which is invalidated by Levitate. So, maybe the designer didn't know about the spell when he made the area, except the face is hidden on a ledge requiring Levitate to reach. It's weird, but just go with it. It should probably be reiterated that a complete set of Daedric armor is prohibitively cumbersome. At just under 300 pounds, you'll need 60 strength just to wear the armor, without any weapons or additional inventory. Luckily, our character for this run was strong enough to wear the full set. Daedric armor is pretty unique due to its rarity. Rather than armor being tiered in a vertical progression, it's more so a representation of the characters wearing the armor. Ebony is common among noble, fitting since ebony is a valuable material for crafting equipment. You can find plenty of orcish armor once you start meeting sects of Malakath worshippers, and endoral armor is plentiful if you spend time fighting the law. Glass is the second rarest armor in the game, most easily found at the Ghost Gate, otherwise you'll only encounter odds and ends of the set. Which is generally a shame as the Dark Brotherhood set gets delivered to the player for free. So, moving on, we've got one more big adventure to go on, but first... This is Umbra. Umbra remarks that he's traveled the world, killed many creatures and people alike. Despite everything, he has yet to die, and all he wants now is a warrior's death. His sword is also named Umbra, which is because he figures that given his accomplishments at this point he may as well be named after his weapon. Yagrim Bagarn says the sword was enchanted by a witch to steal souls, but the sword would later be retconned into being a Clavicus Vile artifact. Clavicus Vile's mask is actually in the game, in a random side quest up in Dagon Fell, which is weird because it's one of the best helms for orcs since it fortifies personality. Anyways, Umbra is a powerful two-handed sword. While there are other swords that can potentially do more damage, Umbra will consistently hit harder as its damage range starts at a minimum of 10 damage compared to a Daedric Daikatana's range starting at a minimum of 1. While the concept of the old warrior wishing for a death he's too powerful or too skilled in combat to receive is a bit of a cliché, I find it's a good fit for the Elder Scrolls setting. Umbra serves as an analog for the fate of the player character once you close the game that last time similar to the concept of hollowing from Dark Souls. In fact, Umbra is largely a metaphor for myself, someone who has seen everything the world has to offer. The world is so far as Vardenfell, anyways. Imagine you're trapped playing the same Morrowind character forever. You're probably a good person, and you probably project an idealistic aspect into your decision making. Maybe in reality you don't have the power to make things right, but in a fantasy world you have the opportunity to bring justice to a situation. 
but play long enough and you'll eventually be drawn to a dark side. The number of ordinary people I talk to who casually admit they killed this or that annoying NPC in an Elder Scrolls game for no reason other than being annoying is proof enough of this concept. Regardless of morality and where you end up, there will eventually be a point where the only thing a player character has left to do is die. But hey, at least we aren't simulating pain and hunger for the purposes of making more realistic video game AI and then wondering why God would allow such evils to exist in our own world. Let's steer this philosophical nightmare back and discuss vampirism. There are three vampire clans on Vardenfell and all vampires on the island belong to one of those three bloodlines. Thus, which bloodline infects you determines which type you will become. This is your standard RPG triangle fare of warriors, thieves, and mages, and the clans are exclusive per playthrough since once you get cured, you can't go back to being a vampire. Don't worry though, unlike the great houses, there isn't a wealth of content for you to choose from. Each clan, should you try to join them, will shun you, and will only give you two quests with which to ingratiate yourself into their ranks. I joined Clan Quora, which suited my warrior playstyle best. It should be noted that my joining required meta-knowledge of the game. While all vampires belong to a bloodline, which bloodline is not relayed to the player. So if you're trying to play while using the wiki as little as possible, it's going to be a gamble if you decide to keep your poor fear of hemophilia which clan you'll actually end up being aligned with. Vampirism is a significant change to playstyle. Travel changes completely now that Siltstrider Caravaneers and boat captains refuse to speak with you. I suddenly found myself using the Propylons to get around and complete my goals while I was a vampire. This can be a problem again for the person playing without a wiki since, as I've stated before, the Propylon indexes are fairly obscure and difficult to find. I doubt players without access to the wiki or the Master Index plugin could find all of them. That's because many of them are hidden in plain sight, in the shop you pass by every time you go from the Caldera Mages Guild to Creeper, for example. Would anybody even think to carefully inspect the tent of the wise woman of the Urshalaku tribe to find the index for the stronghold closest to two of the vampire bases? Is this a failure in the system, or is this meant to heighten the difficulty for vampires without making it tedious? I suspect a certain degree of meta-knowledge is expected for vampires in Morrowind because it's meant to cater to players who have already mastered the game to some extent. If you're playing this game just because you're a vampire enthusiast, don't. This is an area where Bethesda marginally improved. If only by merit of not just having vampirism be an afterthought they were obligated to include because Daggerfall also had vampires. Where Bethesda succeeded with Morrowind's vampires was in turning the player into a superhuman monster. The player will see a significant improvement to strength, speed, fatigue management, and a handful of combat and magicka skills. Immunity to paralysis and common disease, a resistance to normal weapons such as iron and steel, and the ability to absorb health. There are downsides, such as losing the ability to regenerate health when resting, a weakness to fire attacks, and taking damage from the sun. Oh yeah, and almost everyone on Vardenfell will refuse to talk to you. Even if you managed to talk to people, you'd be unable to do quests or use services. Now, while I would understand a massive personality penalty, these limitations mean that vampirism is not a meaningful choice for the player. You'll never sit there and go, man, if I become a vampire, then I can finally beat this quest. Which is kind of the point, it's both the curse and a boon of Molek Ball. It's nature changing based on how you interpret it. Sometimes it happens to people against their will. Being powerless as a vampire dominates you and turns you either into cattle or sires you into a vampire. And sometimes people choose it thinking they can control the temptations that come with it. The choice aspect simply isn't there for Morrowind, which is a shame. That said, it is still mechanically interesting. It's the perfect challenge if you decide to eschew city life and just crawl Morrowind's dungeons. So how are the quests? Let's summarize. You'll get one quest to kill someone who's wronged the clan, and one quest to fetch an item that may involve killing someone. While the vampire quests might not be worth going into detail, they are somewhat interesting due to the challenges created by having to relearn how to travel. This is some ingrained knowledge we're talking about here. The most interesting of the vampire quests is ironically a cure for vampirism. It starts with getting advised to track down the book Vampires of Vardenfeld 2. Curiously, despite its rarity, the book is available in a number of familiar locations. Moea from the Mages Guild, Ordoneran from Halau and Telvani, Voss from the Thieves Guild. It seems the player is intentionally meant to encounter the book at least in some playthroughs so they know where to find it. The book details a small piece of Tamrielic lore regarding vampire hunters and ends with a paragraph telling of a buoyant armager who had been cured of vampirism. 
While Galler Rarathi wrote a more detailed account of this, copies of which are found in the hidden archives of Clan Burn, the Sixth House, and the Tribunal Temple, Vampires of Vardenfell 2 actually says enough to figure out the cure. This involves going to the shrine at Balur and requesting Molag Ball Curio. So, you do not enjoy the blood hunger, little leech. Do you miss the warmth of the sun? I'm not sure why his other shrines don't qualify, but I didn't make the rules. Since we've done prior freelance work for Molag Ball before and have a positive rating, we get preferential treatment in the Daedric version of Fiverr and Molag Ball gives us a quest. He has us kill his daughter, Mola Grunda, who's run off with some Atronach. This simple task will see us being cured of vampirism. Little vampire. It was not easy for me to obtain the cure, but I was able to pry it from Vermina after some discussion. We lose most of our newfound power and are given a chance to reintegrate into society. It's just that easy. Again, the later games would improve the vampire experience. Vampires of Vardenfell notes how the cure to vampirism is kept a secret to discourage people from intentionally becoming vampires, but Morrowind makes the cure look easy. Skyrim at least made it so you had to damn someone by soul trapping them to get cured, but because you can be reinfected and cured again, it undercut that theme in the same breath by treating the cure for vampirism like a prescription rather than the human sacrifice it's supposed to be. Umbra will see a return for the Blood Moon expansion. For now, I hope you see that there is more to Vardenfell than just a dozen or so faction quest lines. Umbra was in fact able to carve out an entire adventure out of side dungeons and random quests. Morrowind is a rich world to explore outside of its semi-scripted questline experiences. We are finally shaking the yoke of these black bars and terrible resolutions. I'm using OpenMW instead of playing the base PC copy, partially because the base game is in 4x3. It's a stylized part of the game though, right? Well, no. Unlike a hand-drawn art style, Morrowind is a 3D game. It can afford to fit on my, and now your, screens. So what do we get for playing on PC? Cheats. That I didn't need or ever use. I've had a few quests bug out over the years, like a playthrough where my Telvanni stronghold never actually appeared, or common longer term playthrough issues like Silt Strider guides falling off their platforms, but I've honestly had a pretty stable time playing Morrowind for this series. I suspect this is in part because of the fact that I avoided playing a single character for everything. So because none of my characters got more than 20 hours in game, there wasn't enough time for any game-breaking bugs to happen. Because remember, I was not playing on an exactly stable port of the game until now. I was playing on what should have been its buggiest incarnation. Another perk of the PC is this godly user interface, and one right click and instantly, all the interface you could need for any situation. On the Xbox, there were four separate panels that you navigated with the black and white, or on more modern controllers, bumper buttons. That is because your average Xbox player is playing from across the room, sitting on their couch, and needs to be able to see information on screen, meaning that the smaller text and icons on the PC version won't cut it. Here on PC, if I say, I want to cast a spell, I just right click, no need to switch over to another panel. And the screens are customizable. You're able to change the size of the windows, so non-magic players can diminish their magic menu. You can also sticky one of them onto your screen so you can continue seeing your map while you play. But of course, that convenient and godlike user interface was traded in for the inefficient, divided, panel-based system in all Bethesda games going forward because... console parity. We also get a steady frame rate, the AI will no longer forget what they're doing for multiple seconds, and I will no longer lose button presses into the void of stuttering frame rate. Overall, we're in for an immensely enjoyable experience as I begin to try and break this game in every way I can. I'll be brief, because if you know anything about Morrowind, you know about the Alchemy Snowball. In effect, the effectiveness of any created alchemy potion is determined by a few factors, one of those factors being intelligence. Some merchants in Morrowind restock an ingredients immediately after ending dialogue with them, and some of those ingredients fortify your intelligence. So, grabbing a free set of Master's Alchemy equipment sitting unsupervised in the Caldera Mages Guild, we go to work. The early game will look like this. I repeatedly buy 10 alchemy ingredients until I have a few hundred or so, spam the Create Potion button, sell the byproducts, and profit. Once I have a decent chunk of cash, I go and buy hundreds of Ashiams and Netch Leather, which is used to fortify intelligence, 
Fortify Intelligence increases the effectiveness of potions created and the value of potions are determined based on their effect values, meaning that I'm grinding these useless drain personality potions out and their value is gradually increasing, decreasing the intervals between when I rest and allow Nalkaria to restock her cash supply. And so, Morrowind's market was flooded with useless drain personality potions and my pockets were flooded with cash. You can go farther with this. These Fortify Intelligence potions increase my Magicka by tens of thousands, in a game where a thousand Magicka is close to the normal limit. However, the real draw is for training. While doing this, I gain skill points in Alchemy, then I go train armor skills like Heavy and Medium Armor and a third attribute skill. So every level I'm getting max points in Intelligence, Endurance, and a third attribute like Speed or Strength. Your overall health in Morrowind is determined by Endurance. In particular, however, it's determined by your Endurance at all levels. Endurance affects starting health as well as health gain per level. So, if you have 50 Endurance, you gain 5 health a level. Our goal is to get to 100 Endurance, or 10 health per level, as fast as possible. This comes pretty quick as I strategically decided that Heavy and Medium Armor were not major or minor skills. This meant training was cheap since I was starting at skill level 5. By the time I start playing, I'm around level 20. I have several hundred hit points, Magicka, Fatigue, and high levels in skill in many weapon and armor types, as well as utility skills like Speechcraft and Mercantile. And this isn't even the most you can min-max in Morrowind, but it is pretty close. So let's go a step farther. With a handful of artifacts, we can take our character to the next level. Again, this isn't the most min-maxed build in Morrowind. You can go farther depending on what you want to accomplish. The first is the Apprentice Ring, which is pretty close to where we start inside Anin. This is basic stuff, plus 10 to intelligence and willpower. This helps the early game alchemy snowball and helps us with some magicka issues. Our next grab are a pair of boots. Going north out of Caldera, we meet a woman desperate for escort to Nar Mok. You'll notice she's quite quick, and sure enough, after the escort, she's willing to part with her magic boots. What makes these boots magic are two effects. Fortify speed 200 points, blind 100 points. By default, the boots will make you very fast, and also make the screen look like this. And your game will sound like this. Luckily, there is a resist magicka effect, which works for negative spell effects, but not the positive ones. Meaning that if you were to reach 100% magicka resistance, you could resist the blind effect. But 100% magic resistance must be pretty difficult to reach due to being overpowered, right? Well, no. We're already at 50% by default on this character. We have the Atronach sign, which removes our ability to naturally generate magicka, but we get two times the max magicka and can absorb 50% of hostile spell effects. In addition, we are a Breton, which comes with an additive 0.5 times to our Magicka and 50% Magicka resistance. Long story short, we can resist half of the effect by default, dimming our screen to 50%. In addition, if we can cast a 1 second 50 point resist Magicka effect, then put on the boots, we fully resist the blind. For the rest of the game, and it's a cheap spell effect, because the game never updates to check if the resist Magicka effect still nullifies the blind effect. Our next stop is to the Blood Moon expansion, doing the Tim Vall in the Well quest. It's pretty easy to dodge the higher level enemies given we have 200 plus speed, and Tim Vall is willing to see reason easily, giving us the Mantle of Woe. The Mantle of Woe has a great many effects. It fortifies magic of 5 times, which is additive to our 2.5 times. It also fortifies Conjuration 50 points. In exchange, we have a 20 point weakness to normal weapons, 100 points drain personality, setting it to 0, and sun damage 20 points, which turns us into a vampire. But, 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 we don't need to wear the robe all the time. Which means we can get in fights and access our near 1200 points of magicka, then take it off the rest of the time. One more artifact. The Necromancer's Amulet, which you get from Archmage Trebonius Arturius, resists normal weapons 25%, fortifies intelligence 25 points, more magicka, restores health 1 point on self, and absorbs spells 25% on self. So now we have regenerating health, 75% spell absorption, and a partial normal weapons resistance. Yeah, this build wasn't worth it. This is because Morrowind will rarely rise up to the challenge I've issued, and that's part of the charm. Later Elder Scrolls games bent over backwards to try and balance the big three specializations out. Morrowind was unapologetic and allowed wizards to really shine. The more creative and more able to take advantage of the game's systems you are, the more you're allowed to get out of the game, and it's great. So let's get started with this main quest.
They have taken you from the Imperial City's prison. First by carriage and now by boat. To the east, to Morrowind. Fear not, for I am watchful. You have been chosen. One month after our arrival, we returned to Caius, who had given us 200 gold to start our work. We're now a member of the Blades, a secret intelligence agency working in service of the Emperor. Our first few tasks seem inane, but from the very first quest we're going to be introducing concepts and ideas that are important throughout. Caius will insist you acquire some experience, and I think this is going to reinforce it. Our first two quests will involve going to the local guilds for some information. You know, just in case you haven't joined them yet. It's no coincidence that, as most new players will commonly pick fighter characters, our first task is to meet Hasfat Antibolus over in the Fighters Guild, and ask him about the Nereverine and Sixth House cults. We've dealt a bit with the Sixth House cult before, but the Nereverine cult is a new one. I promised that that name wouldn't come back up, and I lied. Unfortunately, Hasfat doesn't have much info on them, but he can tell us about the Sixth House, in exchange for a small favor. He wants us to get our hands on a Dwemer puzzle box, located in a nearby ruin of Arkanthand. This is a great first quest. In order to find a ruin, you have to pay attention to the directions given. That said, it's also a safe quest. If you get in over your head, you're right next to a legion fort with all the necessary amenities. Meet Snowy Granius, or as I call him, the Bridge Wizard. He's a gear check. If you try to play Morrowind the same way you would play Skyrim, Granius is your rude awakening, and Caius warned you. On the surface, he's little more than a wizard bandit. He's only level 3, he knows some basic destruction spells and can summon a skeleton. But because he is, ostensibly, the main quest's first mandatory combat encounter, he's garnered a reputation. Obviously, he's no match for the monster I've created, but he deserves recognition because if Morrowind had those Dark Souls bloodstains, they'd be right about here. Before we enter the ruin proper, we have to figure out how to open the door. I could be wrong, but I think Hasfat has a throwaway line about it. This crank here opens the door. Arkanthand is an alright little first dungeon. It's basically two dungeons. The first a bandit area, the second a more traditional Dwemer ruin. Our objective, and indeed the only reason you're sent here, is actually right by the door, tucked away in an area not immediately drawn to the eye. You could explore this entire dungeon, reaching the end, a large vertical area, and not find the puzzle box, only to realize it was by the door the whole time. This is owing to the fact that dungeons in Morrowind are non-linear, but that isn't even entirely true. Some dungeons in Morrowind are non-linear, and some dungeons in Morrowind are a single hallway leading into a room. Dungeons in Morrowind are realistic by the standards of the universe, because in what world would the leader of a group of bandits put his living space as far as possible from the door? And in the real world, some people were buried in a mausoleum, and some people were buried in the pyramids. Once we return the box to Antibolus, he gives us some notes on the Sixth House, and recommends we speak with Sharn Gramuzgob. You can read the notes at any time, as we'll be getting them back later. Indeed, Caius's next orders are to speak with Sharn Gramuzgob, a local alleged necromancer working out of the Mages Guild. Again, this is Bethesda subtly pushing the player towards a faction if they haven't already joined. She'll tell us what she knows about the Nereverine cult, in exchange for a small favor. She wants us to visit an ancestral tomb, grab the skull of one Halival Androno, and bring it to her. Read into this. She wants us to defile a local tomb, steal the skull of a native, and give it to an all-but-confirmed necromancer. Yeah, get used to that feeling. She does give us some tools to handle the undead in the tomb, which is a nice introduction to the concept of creatures who are immune to normal weapons like iron and steel, as they aren't going to be going away. I don't have as much to say about this quest as the other one, it's more of the same, go to place, grab a thing. The tomb is much smaller of a dungeon, easier to get to, and more linear. I guess there is something to be said for making absolutely certain players are prepared for the coming escalation in difficulty. We get some notes on the Nereverine cult, and report back to Caius. Caius, as an academic, wants us to corroborate our findings from the last two missions, with a big and complicated mission to collect intel in the big city, Vivek. I don't like questing in Vivek, and yet, I like this quest. First, it matches the theme of the Blades as an intelligence organization, collecting information and doing favors. Second, each leg of the quest follows the same format, but does something unique. Third, each leg is set in a different part of Vivek. Not just different cantons, different sections of the cantons, making them distinct in a way most Vivek quests just aren't. We're looking for three people, Halea, Adhiranir, and Mera Milo. Halea is in the foreign quarter and is about to be the victim of a hate crime before we step in. You can persuade them to leave Halea alone or just kill them. Afterwards, you escort Halea across the canton and he gives you some notes on the Nereverine cult. 
and Hiranir is hanging out in the sewers of St. Olm's. This isn't for fun, she is actually hiding down here, and finding her will entail searching the canton. She's hiding due to a synthesis and excise agent looking for her. We deal with the issue, and she tells us that the sixth house has become a big client for smugglers, but nobody knows why. Mayra Milo is in the library up at the temple. She asks we follow her into the back where it's more secluded, and tells us a bit about the Nerevering cult, and suggests we find a copy of the book Progress of Truth. She even establishes a code word we can use in the event something goes wrong, like this is a proper spy story. The book can be found in a variety of locations, but the easiest is to just buy it at the local rare bookstore you happen to have escorted Halea to. Its rarity is owed to the fact that it has been officially banned by the temple for heresy. If you're curious where this is going, don't worry, we have one more quest before the big reveal. Caius is now interested in establishing an informant with the Ashlanders, nomadic tribes native to the island. He suggests we find and talk to Hassauer Zansubani, a former Ashlander working as a merchant. Caius notes that the Ashlanders have gift-giving customs and suggests we try to learn more about that. We meet up with Hassauer and discuss business with him. We find out that he enjoys reading poetry, and the local bookstore sells three different books that qualify. He already owns all three, but appreciates the gesture and is willing to tell us what he knows. He has some information in the Nerevering cult and on Ashlander customs. Mind you, none of that is really signposted. You don't get the words, buy the book on your screen with a marker pointing to the local bookstore. You have to figure all this out on your own. And with that, we finally learn what Caius' game is. He isn't just collecting information for the sake of academics. We were sent here by the Emperor himself, Big U, a controversial figure noted for certain seer powers. We were released from Cyrodiil City Prison because we had met certain conditions of the Nereverine Prophecy, a prophecy that foreshadowed the reincarnation of Saint Nerevar. Caius admits skepticism at these claims, but as time has gone on and we have gathered information, he is somewhat less skeptical. However, Caius makes an important distinction that separates this game from other Chosen One-style narratives. The Emperor isn't just sending us over because we are the Chosen One, but because there is a need to stop the Sixth House. The Temple is failing, the Tribunal is growing weaker, and Vardenfell is under quarantine for a disease that could threaten the rest of the continent. Whether we are actually the Nereverine or not is ultimately irrelevant. The Emperor is just hoping we can solve the situation, and, as an added contingency should we fail, his legions are entrenched in strategic positions across the island to take over. We are not the only person capable of stopping this crisis. We just happen to be the cheapest at 87 gold. As to the situation at present, there are two cults on the island that relate to the current crisis, the Nerevering cult and the Sixth House. The Dunmer people generally believe in the idea of the Nerevering the same way my country casually believes in revelations. That is to say, your average Dunmer is ultimately unconcerned with the reincarnation of this ancient figure and the imminent apocalypse. The Nerevering cult is more interested in this topic and, in particular, cataloging information forbidden by the Tribunal Temple. At this point in the quest, the motivations for the temple to discourage belief in the Nereverine and punish false incarnates is an unknown. Wow. Caius is hopeful to meet the cult, and is dispatching us to meet its alleged leaders in the Urshalaku camp. This is a rather significant foray into hostile territory, up into the Ashlands in the north of the island. From a story perspective, it makes sense. From a gameplay perspective, it can cause whiplash. We go from our first quest having a tough dungeon, our second quest having an easier dungeon, but then our third and fourth quests are about finding people and figuring out how to get them to tell you what you want. And now we're on quest 5, and it's meant to be an escalation and challenge. Wouldn't it make more sense to start with the talky talky missions, then move up to the easy dungeon, and then the hard dungeon, then the long trek north? Maybe people will get bored. All that said, the Urshalaku camp is one of my favorite quest lines in a Bethesda game. You have to figure out how to work your way into this society, but rather than having victory assured by presence, you have to do so using knowledge of said society. Knowledge that is not told directly to you by the quest giver, but gathered in a prior quest. This is just one of many reasons players who try to play on autopilot don't like Morrowind, because it isn't as simple as walking up to the wise woman and declaring yourself the chosen one. You are the stranger, and no one here has any cause to believe in you until you prove yourself. To earn your way up, you have to take into consideration what you learned about thoughtful gifts. But it isn't as rigid in formula. Other means of convincing people, such as persuasion or charm spells, are still just as valid a means of convincing the residents to arrange a meeting. It's a direct interplay of mechanics and storytelling without any kind of arbitrary restrictions. We're first directed to Zabamund, the second to Sulmatul. He needs to be convinced, and there are a variety of options. You can try to intimidate him, which is dependent on your level. You can try to boast of your deeds, dependent on your reputation. 
You can offer a tribute, or should you be practiced in speechcraft, you can speak of what you've learned on your way here. This is one of the few moments where the writer, Ken Rolston, demonstrated an understanding of just what the text-based dialogue system was capable of in terms of skill checks. Unfortunately, it was underutilized, and ironically, it was Douglas Goodall who criticized Bethesda for not using skill checks and choices in Morrowind, despite himself never actually using them either. But I gotta cut him a break because he wrote enough material to fill two and a half hours of video. Zabamund, once convinced, sends you to meet with Sul Matul. He says in order for him to adopt us into the tribe as a clan friend, we need to pass an initiation rite and recover his father's bow at the Urshalaku Burial Caverns. It's interesting to consider how the ancestral tombs are advanced versions of this tribal burial cavern concept. It's the little details that make this game great. The caverns are a fairly complex dungeon, but you'll eventually find the ghost of Sol Sinipul, who on his defeat drops his bow. This makes us clan friend, and Sul Matul permits us to speak with the wise woman, Nabani Mesa. And so begins a long dialogue with Nabani. She has a great deal of important insight that plays into the story, a bit too much. So much in fact that Nabani even offers to cut to the chase and answer if we are the Nereverine. She figures that we are not at present, but may become it based on some of the qualifiers and the prophecies that she knows. When earth is sundered, and skies choked black, and sleepers serve that yeah, this is way too long for pretentiousness like that. The big takeaway is that there are seven trials, and to present, we've met the first, which is the one described at the start of the game in the first cutscene. We're born on a certain day, which day it is isn't clear, but it's a reference to our birth sign. We're also born to uncertain parents, so the Nereverine is an orphan born under a sign. Trial 2 remarks on immunity to disease. Trial 3 refers to Azura as well as Moon and Star. The fourth trial says that three houses will call us Hortator. The fifth trial says that four tribes will call us Nereverine. The sixth and seventh trials are not particularly clear. And with both the Stranger and the Seven Visions, we have been told all Nabani knows. She remarks that there are lost prophecies that she doesn't know that may be in the hands of the temple. With that, we head back to Caius. Caius takes our notes and informs us he has a new assignment, one he warns is going to be tough. This is another progression in the difficulty, an expectation that the player is supposed to be out and about performing other work for the sake of self-improvement. The reason this works, especially compared to Oblivion and Skyrim, is that even though this is a plot about a chosen one stopping an ancient threat, said ancient threat is as dangerous now as he has been for decades, and we have no basis to assume he's even in the final stages of his plans. In Oblivion and Skyrim, and actually in Fallout 3 and 4 as well, there's a constant drive to go from main quest to main quest. There are rarely lulls in the action that allow you to disengage from the main quest and engage with the world instead. Whereas Morrowind is more masterful in providing multiple opportunities for the player to diverge and actually play the game. So to give an example, in Oblivion you watch the Emperor die in the tutorial, giving you specific directions to go to Wayne and Priory. At Wayne and Priory you're given explicit directions to hurry to Kavach to save Martin. Once you escort Martin to Cloud Ruler Temple, you're given further urgent orders to investigate the Mythic Dawn before they summon Satan and the Four Horns of the Apocalypse sound. I can detail similar lines in each subsequent Bethesda game, the urgency of finding your father in Fallout 3, the urgency of dealing with the dragons in Skyrim, the urgency of finding your son in Fallout 4. Urgency removes agency in an open world game, and it's the mistake that is often made by writers not realizing the storytelling opportunities presented by the interactive medium. Instead, they want to write engaging movie plots that build tension, which means that the world is neglected in the process. You cannot play a character that doesn't have these urgent issues in the back of their mind without undergoing some form of mental gymnastics. But I understand a desire to generate tension in a storyline, and Morrowind begins its dramatic rise with this quest. From here on, it becomes much more difficult to ignore the pressing threat of the Sixth House, which is not a bad thing. What I'm arguing for is simply early stepping off points in the story. Of course, our broken character is more than ready for the situation. According to Caius, a Legion patrol found a Sixth House base, so we need to locate it, take it out, and see what we can learn. We go to meet with Ray Sepulia at Buckmoth, and she tells us that the base is near Narmok. The original party was entirely wiped out, with a single survivor shambling back to the base afflicted with Corpus, barely eking out the cavern's location at Alunabi. Asking the locals in Narmok, we manage to find the cave, and it's a nice place. <laughs>
This is Dagoth Garrus. He's an Ash Ghoul. Garrus tells us that we should go to Red Mountain and meet Dagoth Ur with open arms and that the Sixth House will continue to be at war with us until then. Then he attacks us. He's a tough cookie, a fitting challenge to the rising escalation, but with his dying breath he curses us with corpus, an infectious, incurable disease that will gradually deform us into a zombie. Caius figured this would happen, and refers us to Dr. Fear, the principal researcher of Corpus on the island. There's a missed opportunity to have fast travel services refuse to serve you, diegetically reinforcing the seriousness of this infection with a mechanical inconvenience. Divith Fear is… interesting. He lives in a remote area with his four clone daughters and contributes to society by caring for the victims of and trying to cure Corpus disease. But, well he hasn't cured it yet. What are the odds of him curing it in time to save us? I mean, it'd be a bit contrived. Go down to the Corpusarium, meet the last living dwarf, ask any questions you want, take some levitation potions up to Divith, get a potion poured down your throat, and while not getting cured, the negative effects are removed, rendering us immune to disease. Okay, there's a lot going on. Divith Fear is an ancient Dunmer wizard, hence his skepticism of the seriousness of events. He lived to see the fall of the Dwimmer, the rise of the Tribunal, and the change from Resdane to Morrowind. He's seen his share of wars, occupations, and the occasional Daedra Crisis. We also meet Yagrim Begarn, who claims to be the last living dwarf. He says that while he was out in Oblivion at the time of the disappearance and spent a great deal of time looking for his people, to no avail. Eventually, he was afflicted with corpus and found in the full thrall of the disease by Divith Fear, who restored him to some partial sanity. The corpus affliction, for both him and us, is a bit advantageous. While it causes less than desirable growths all over the body, and mental degeneration similar to dementia, it also stops the progress of aging. This renders its victims effectively immortal, one of the reasons despite Yagram's health he is so long livid. Obviously, there are some questions. No, the treatment we are given doesn't work for others. If you return to Divith, he will remark that it killed the other patients he tried it on. Even if it had, our objective is to stop the source of corpus, meaning that its applications as a reproducible way to become immortal are non-existent. We might have gotten some more info in the years following Morrowind had the Redcon year never happened. As to why it works for us, I'm just going to assume divine intervention from Azura. Just keep this little corpus thing in the back of your mind moving forward. On our return to Caius, he informs us that we're being promoted to Operative. This is the highest rank he can afford us at this time, as he's being recalled to Cyrodiil City for events possibly related to Elder Scrolls IV. But not to worry, Operative makes us the ranking Blades member in Vardenfell, at least to Caius' knowledge. This marks the beginning of our operations as an independent agent. This is one of the big reasons I like Morrowind, because as the Chosen One, we don't have to answer to a boss, like the other games. Oblivion was absolutely terrible in this regard. Skyrim was a bit better by turning our bosses into mentors, but let's be honest, we still didn't have any agency. Caius' final standing order is to find the lost Nereverian prophecies and bring them to Damati Mesa. Our first step, then, should be to meet with Mera Milo and Vivek again and share what we learned from the Urshalaku Ashlander tribe. However, Mera is missing, and in her quarters she has left a note to Amea. Uh, my brain's on autopilot, I don't remember what Amea's supposed to mean. What do? Well, luckily we have the journal. I may hype this game up to be hardcore and require some serious mental firepower to solve mysteries that only smarty pants, big brained boys like myself can do. That's not really true. The designers were generally pretty smart about using the journal to relay critical information to the player. Or you could just be lazy and use the wiki. This creates a near constant sense of dramatic irony, where the player character is remembering and intuiting information that the player might not. I didn't use the journal a lot, but that is owing to my experience with the game. Occasions when I did use the journal were immensely helpful, especially since the player character often notes down directions to places in the journal. One problem I do have that was introduced in a patch for Morrowind is the quest log. This allows you to keep an active tab on all the quests you have at any given time. It's pretty ubiquitous for role-playing games, right? And it makes sense. Finding journal entries for a quest you accepted two weeks prior can be difficult. But I suppose it comes down to a difference in philosophy to me. I tend to play very focused characters, doing quests in order of urgency and often saying no to quests that are out of my way or are uninteresting. Most people seem to rack up a great number of quests simultaneously, accepting every quest that gets thrown at them. So for most people, a quest log is necessary to keep track of all that information. I think it's irresponsible to promise to do quests only to just let it sit in your log for weeks if not months. Are you really going to let that rancher's guar get attacked by mud crabs while you work on your dissertation on the dwarves? 
I think the topic system they also introduced in that patch was a much more effective means as it allows you to find all the information you have kept entries on in one location, giving the player easy access to old information without making it too easy for players on autopilot. Anyways, Milo's missing and we need to find her. Her note is pretty explicit. She's tied up at the Ministry of Truth. She left a few levitation potions for me and wants me to bring some divine intervention scrolls. We also get directed to speak to Alvella Saram, which is one of the door guards. So, where is the Ministry of Truth? Oh, it's the currently crashing meteor hovering above the city. You know, it's a very Dunmer idea to imprison your thought criminals in a giant floating meteor instead of maybe gradually mining the thing out of the sky. This is a stealth mission, as indicated by the stealth equipment Caius happened to give us before he left. Or rather, this would be a stealth mission if anyone other than me were playing it. What do you want? We meet up with Milo, she's one of the prisoners up here, and she takes a scroll of divine intervention and says I need to meet her at the dissident priest monastery Hullo Amayan, and I can get there from Ebenhart through a woman named Blata Heteria. We go fishing with Blata and arrive at the monastery, which is currently closed. The shield guarding Hullo Amayan only opens at dusk and dawn, a reference to Azura, so we wait until it opens and head inside. Mayra thanks us for freeing her and directs us to speak with Master Barilow, who heads the dissident priests. He gives us three pieces of critical information, the Lost Prophecy, the Seven Curses, and information on Kagranak's tools. You might recall during our Mages Guild investigation into the disappearance of the dwarves that Kagranak and his tools had come up? Yeah, they might be important. The Lost Prophecy. I'll let you read it and I'll discuss the big points. The first refers to being born in an ancient family, foreign to Morrowind and Dragonborn. Dragonborn in this case just refers to origins from somewhere in Cyrodiil, not the retconia meaning where the Dragonborn are the universal chosen one format that learn the dragon language. The prophecy goes on to discuss what the Outlander Incarnate will do, going beneath Red Mountain, countering the seven curses, his star-blessed hand wielding the blade thrice cursed, to punish the unmourned, or sixth house. So, what are the seven curses? The note we're given lists them as follows. The curse of fire, of ash, of flesh, of ghosts, of seed, of despair, and the curse of dreams. Fire and ash, it is a volcano island. Flesh is corpus, which we've beaten. Ghosts, seed, and despair likely to refer to curses yet afflicted. And the curse of dreams refers to dreams our character as well as other people named dreamers have been afflicted with. One example being Elvil Vidron from the Temple Questline who mistakenly believed himself to be the Nereverine. One thing I could not mention in the Tribunal Temple section was that being the Nereverine is a potential solution to that particular quest, as you can prove that he is not Nerevar Incarnate. However, this particular solution is rather confusing as it's a very short window where you would actually be able to complete the quest in this manner. Another dreamer is Varver Serethi from the Radoran questline, whom was corrupted by an ash statue into killing his friend. There are also a host of named NPCs in the world who exist as normal civilians who will gradually become dreamers as you do the main quest. What about the blade cursed thrice? This is in reference to one of Kagranak's tools, Keening. He had three tools, Wraithguard, Keening, and Sunder. Keening is probable as the blade as it kills any who wield it without Wraithguard. We gain some additional juicy details. According to the dissident priests, the dwarves disappeared at the same time as the Battle of Red Mountain for entirely unrelated reasons. At this time, Nerevar and Dagath Ur went into the mountain, finding the tools as well as the heart of Lorcan, one of the Aedra who was punished for creating mortality. Nerevar had tasked Dagath with protecting the tools and went to speak with his counselors, whose name may be familiar. Vivek, Amalexia, and Sothasil, or the Tribunal. When the Tribunal, led by Nerevar, went to Red Mountain, Dagath had apparently gone mad and refused to hand over the tools. He was driven off, and the tools were recovered. 
Each swore to never use the tools, but following Nerevar's timely and convenient death, the tribunal went to Lorcan's heart and used the tools to gain divine power. Dagath eventually returned, himself also having divine power, and took control of the heart, Keening, Sunder, and the Red Mountain, and ever since then has fought a shadow war with the tribunal temple. Dagathur is unable to quickly win as he does not possess Wraithguard, and the Temple are unable to win as they can't access the Heart. The Temple thus censors the dissident priests, the Nerevering cult, and the false incarnates, as there is some measure of shame felt for their inability to properly control the situation. However, the dissident priests are not against the Temple, they recognize the real enemy as still being Dagathur. So, with these three pieces of information, we go to Nimani Mesa. This is the beginning of the second act of Morrowind, and it begins with our return to the Urshalaku tribe. We tell the lost prophecies to Nimani until she memorizes them. She then sets us down the path of completing the seven trials. Trials one and two are done, but Sul Matul is the one who knows of the third trial. Before he will share the third trial, he wishes us to pass a warrior's test by journeying to Kogarun, a sixth house stronghold. We are to acquire a Corpus Weeping, a House Dagoth Cup, and the Shadow Shield. Kogarun is an extensive dungeon featuring three separate environments and a lot of monsters. Kogarun is a logical progression of difficulty for Melunabi, being longer, more populous, and far from resupply. I suspect many will have given up on Morrowind long before now. If Elunabi was the final test, Kogarun is the job you get after graduation. It really is a great dungeon. Upon our return to Sul Matul, he tells us the riddle of the third trial. The eye of the needle lies in the teeth of the wind. The mouth of the cave lies in the skin of the pearl. The dream is the door, and the star is the key. I wish I could experience solving this riddle for the first time again. Unfortunately, I know exactly where this riddle ends. The Eye of the Needle is our objective. The Teeth of the Wind refers to a coastal entry point into the island. The Skin of the Pearl is the most obscure part, but it is supposed to refer to a bright rock that can guide you. This quest is one of the reasons I disagree with the sentiment people, including these Skywind devs, have about waypoint markers. In particular, that if you don't like them, you can simply turn them off. The problem with that sentiment is that when games get frustrating, if you suffer through, there is an eventual sense of catharsis at solving a puzzle. However, if the option to have the answer shown to you is always available, then when the moment of frustration arrives, rather than earning that sense of catharsis, you take the easy way out. I know this to be true, because it is something that happens to me as well. I like the game Dishonored a bit. I know it's a non sequitur, but it took me a while to understand why people I knew didn't like the game, until I realized I had made a change in the menu options that most people had not. I was given a good piece of advice before starting the game to turn off the waypoints. This made the game way more interesting, since I was fully exploring the levels and actually finding my objectives, not just following a waypoint. The only reason it works for Dishonored and not other games, however, is that Dishonored is a fairly linear game that also specifies directions to locations in the game, whereas most modern games rely on waypoints because there simply isn't time to do that in development. Now imagine Morrowind with waypoints. A lot of the quests I've described in this line, as well as in the other parts, immediately begin to suffer because of a lack of intrigue, and a lack of catharsis for figuring it out. Not just the big quests like this, where the whole point is to discern a location based on a riddle, but other quests, like the quest to find Tell Fear during the Cure, or how about the quests to find the informants? They become a lot less interesting if you have a waypoint leading you directly to the source. The Cavern of the Incarnate, once found, can only be entered at the hours of dusk and dawn, a staple for Azura. In the dawn hour under Azura's star, the door is opened. Inside is a statue of her, and a ring within her hands. This triggers a cutscene. 
Nerevar Reborn, incarnate. Your first three trials are finished. Now, two new trials lie before you. Seek the Ashlander Ashkans and the Great House Counselors. Four tribes must name you Nerevarin. Three houses must name you Hortator. My servant, Nabane Meza, shall be your guide. And when you are Hortator and Nerevarin, when you have stood before the false gods and freed the heart from its prison, heal my people and restore Morrowind. Do this for me and with my blessing. Sadly, Moon and Star is somewhat underpowered. It's a constant effect that fortifies personality and speechcraft five points. It's meant to signify two things, Nerevar's supernatural power of persuasion and proof of identity. Most people won't care or acknowledge if we wear the ring, and said supernatural power pales in comparison to the power of the bribe. I mean really, you couldn't have afforded the legendary ring of Nerevar to be absolutely ridiculous, like 25 or 50 points fortified, there are random items given to us by previous incarnates who were not the Nereverine with more use than Moon and Star, like these levitation pants. From here on, Morrowind's questline becomes non-linear. The next obvious step in what I did would be to return to the Urshilaku, inform them of what happened, and seek to be declared their Nereverine. Sulmatul grants us this title, and Nabani, although Azura labeled her our guide, only really has some basic information for moving forward, after which we never have to speak with her again. Important to note, however, is that from here on, the temple and house for Doran becomes somewhat hostile, as we are being persecuted as a false incarnate. Thus, let us begin the journey of becoming Hortator and Nereverine. Starting with House Halau, I ask about the Hortator in Balmora and get given a book with all the council members listed, and for a 50 gold bribe, I get directed specifically to Uncle Curio. These Hortator quests are going to have a lot of overlap with the house quests themselves. I enjoy this aspect and appreciate the effort. Whether or not you are a member of one of the houses, or even its leader, has an impact on how these quests proceed. If you are the leader of a house, then you are pre-qualified to be their Hortator. But remember that they are also exclusive, so you still have to experience the other two. I go to meet Crassius Curio and ask to become Hortator. If you have a disposition of 70, something I was just too short of, something I was just too short of, just too short of, what is it, peasant? I am not amused. He is willing to vote for you in exchange for a kiss. Otherwise, it costs 1,000 gold. What I like about the Hortator quests is that it introduces you to the cultures of the factions you're meant to be representing, in a way that is consistent with the culture of the faction. Hello, in particular, will involve a great deal of bribery and political manipulation, something that also happened a great deal to Rethin. One thing I had considered doing for this video, since I was on PC and have some experience with the editor, was making a small mod that put my custom characters as faction leaders who would name us Hortator in order to skip any redundancies, since for the most part the Hortator process is nearly identical to the endgame questlines of each great house. Becoming Halau Hortator will entail finding the counselors and gaining their vote. Drambero will vote for you if you manage to find him, although at least this time we don't have to bare-knuckle cage match his pet Nord. Yingling Half-Troll asks for money, which I oblige him, but Crassius suggested we kill him. The remaining two counselors, Nivana Ules and Velanda Amani, are under the control of one Orvis Dren. This part of the quest will be new material since my conversation with Dren goes a bit differently than Rethin's conversation did. I tell him I want to become Hortator to defeat Dagath Ur, and he attacks me, saying the tribunal betrayed the Dunmer when they signed the armistice with the Empire, and that Dagath Ur had already made him a better offer. You can actually convince Orvis to peacefully support you, but considering Orvis Dren is responsible for a lot of suffering on Vardenfell, and he doesn't recognize that Tiber Septum was as powerful as the Tribunal when they signed the Armistice, my decision was easy. There is no escape! Die. <clears throat> After which, Ulus and Amani are receptive to the idea of supporting us. And with that, Crassius names us Hortator. Something I'll note is that each of these Hortator and Nerevering quests gives a unique magical item, like the Halau Belt of the Hortator that gives a constant 20 point magicka bonus, but a lot of them aren't really notable and I did not use them. Our next stop was to House Rodoran in Aldrun. I know it's kind of late to ask, but is the correct spelling with an apostrophe or a dash? In order to become Rodoran Hortator, we need to figure out if any of the counselors can get our foot in the door. 
Most will be hostile to the idea, but through process of elimination, you will eventually meet Athens Sarethi, who will say that all but one council member will support us, Bolvin Venom. But first, he wants us to rescue his son, Varvar Sarethi, from Venom Manor. This is similar to the Radoran version of events, except I was a lot more violent than Jibindaris was. Sarethi says that if we defeat Bolvin Venom in an honorable duel, that the other counselors will find no reason not to support us as Hortator. These honor games are an important part of Radoran culture, but they are just as willing to commit duplicitous acts. Sarethi certainly stands to gain politically from us taking care of Venom. The other counselors are willing to support us as Hortator, despite everything, because we are willing to fight Dagathur, and thanks to Sarethi's good word. Minor Erebar mentions that there were rumors of us being an Imperial spy, which is simply ridiculous. And so, after gaining the support of the counselors, we confront Venom, and he initiates the duel challenge. This means going out of our way to go to the Vivek Arena, because why would a faction that frequently has honor duels be host to an area to have said duels? And because, of course, this game is going to pit us one last time in the arena. Things go a bit differently on PC than they did on Xbox. Anyways, Sarethi now confirms us as Hortator and gives us a sealed package. The note basically says that while we are committing high acts of heresy, the temple holds that if we are acting in the best interest of Vardenfell and are able to become Hortator and Nereverine, then I can present myself to Archcanon Serioni for a private meeting. Telvanni's Hortator process is a little different from its questline. Like the other houses, the council has to unanimously agree on the appointment. For the Telvanni questline proper, however, Ufereth never actually had to meet the entire council. As is custom with House Telvanni, one potential solution to becoming Hortator, should a counselor not support me, would be to simply kill them. I believe you can do this in any order, but Master Arion is the only unconditional vote, and he's willing to explain the other counselors for you. Master Neloth has an ill temper probably from those muck-based ointments his mouth keeps using. Mistress Taratha hates men, Mistress Thorana is crazy, and Archmagister Gothrin will stall indefinitely for no reason, likely needing to be killed. An outcome Arion admits is beneficial to him. <laughs> I've already said this before, but each counselor lives atop a tower that can only be accessed with a levitation effect, so even without doing the Telvanni quests, you have to engage in this quirk of Telvanni society. Neloth is receptive to us being Hortator in exchange for a 1000 gold bribe and also us going away. Thorana confirms us as Hortator provided we perform a party trick for her. Drotha, even after a few thousand gold and bribes, isn't too receptive on account of our masculinity. 
And with that, Arion gives us the useless Robe of the Hortator, a simple questline, but fully reflective of Telvanni culture. Now we're starting on the three remaining tribes that must name us Nereverine for the trials to be complete. We start with the Ahimesa tribe, who live in the Grayslands near the coast. One of the tribesmen recommends I speak to one of the Gulakans. They pass me up to the wise woman. Apparently, the Ahimesa have no Ashcan, so she speaks for the tribe. She is willing to name us Nereverine. However, the Ahimesa are in need of a safe place. Whenever the Ahimesa have been threatened, she says they would go to Alt Daedroth. It's worth noting that this is a low-key admission that the Ahimesa are Daedra worshippers. But now, a full-time Shigarath cult have taken up residence in the shrine. I am to go to Alt Daedroth and make it safe. What defines safe can actually vary. In another Elder Scrolls game, safe would be the complete and utter annihilation of the current population. All Daedroth, much like in the Temple Quest line, is currently in a state of war between a group of Ordinators and some Shigarath worshippers. I love when the game intersects quest lines like this. It just as easily could have picked another unused Daedric ruin to set this quest. You want another one? Well, one of the later Mages Guild quests has you setting up a meeting with this same Ahimesa wise woman. Here I run into and have to talk with Ordinators who want me dead. What makes this quest interesting is that I can speak with the leader of the Shigarath cult, and he can be convinced, or coerced, into allowing the Ahimesa to use all Daedroth as a refuge. In fact, all these Shigarath worshippers are named NPCs, unlike other games that would simply name them cultists or bandits or what have you. It was post Morrowind and Tribunal that Bethesda went back to using generic names for enemy NPCs. So begins the process of us demonstrating the safety of all Daedroth. Now the ruin is across the water from the tribe, but luckily the wise woman can water walk. Funnily enough, she's also a spell creator, and since I know Fortify Attribute, I cook up a little Fortify Speed spell to make this go by quicker. This proceeds to immediately backfire when she gets distracted by an underwater enemy she can never reach, and goes sprinting off into the sunset at high speeds. After a few minutes, we arrive, and having proven the shrine's safety, relatively at least, Sinemu is willing to make us the Ahomesa Nereverine. Deeper into the interior of the Grayslands is the Zainab tribe. To quote one of their own tribesmen, Our great chief does not stand on ceremony. Indeed, the Ashkan doesn't care as much as others about going through the Gulakans or thoughtful gifts. We met the Zainab during the Halau questline. He's skeptical of the idea of an outlander being the Nereverine, so he dispatches us to deal with a vampire named Calvario. And that's that. More quarrel with you. Open in W. Way more stable than vanilla. Anyways, Kashad is thrilled we killed Calvario and sensing the opportunity to take advantage of an unwitting hero, something I'm surprised didn't happen more often, gives us his most ridiculous request to mind. He wants us to find him a highborn Telvanni bride, a pretty one with big hips, and bring her back for marriage. He suggests I go to the Telvanni lords, well, the ones left anyways, and inform them of the significant political opportunity of marrying off one of their daughters. He wants us to consider the many daughters offered and choose for him the finest, and suggest we consult the wise woman to learn of his tastes. Sonamu, the wise woman, is realistic. No Telvanni lord is going to marry their daughter off to an Ashlander, Ashcan or otherwise. I don't think any of the Telvanni lords are even specified to have children. Instead, and I want you to listen until I say otherwise, Instead, 
we are to go to her friend Seville Amain, a slave mistress at Telarune, buy a slave, dress her up as a member of high society, and bring her back to the camp and present her to Kashad as a highborn Telvanni bride, because he won't know the difference. Alright, you can pause the video and leave your comments now. Of the more morally dubious things we've done in this questline, I'd say this is about as worse as it gets. And it's kind of unnecessary. Of the Nerevering quests, this tribe is the longest, most intricate, and pointless. You already had the Calvario quest, just make that one more complex. I guess the point is that in order to save the day, we have to engage in a little local culture slavery. Anyways, the slave in question doesn't really seem to mind the situation. We get her some nice clothes and Telvanni bug musk, which fortifies personality, and escort her back to the village. She's happy to have nice clothes, and she is technically going to be set free, even if that is into a life of rearing children. Kashad's impressed, and names us Nerevering for our work. I think this is what Goodall was complaining about when it came to Rolston's writing being more grounded in historical parallelism. Generally speaking, Merrick societies have different conceptions of personal relationships and reproduction, on account of their longer lifespans. The Dunmer are the type of culture that would focus on trying to produce higher quality children, rather than a higher quantity like the races of men do. This is also the game's only instance of a non-beast race being enslaved, which is technically canonical. The Telvanni were supposed to keep slaves of all races, even the Dunmer, but Rolston was the one exploring that idea with this quest and the John Hawker character, while Goodall seemed to maintain the idea that only the beast races were being enslaved. Of the four tribes, the Arabinisum are the least plussed about the Nerevering. One of the tribe's people suggests we skip talking to the Ashcan and Gulakans and go straight to the Wise Woman, as the Khans see the prophecies as foolish superstition. The Wise Woman says as such. The Ashcan, Ulith Paul, hates Outlanders, and she says that he is a bad leader. She says that while he is the Ashcan, the Arabinisum will love war and hate Outlanders. So, in order to change things, we need to kill the leadership of the tribe and install Han Amu, one of the more peaceful Gulakans, as Ashcan. I go to Ulith Paul, who makes the mistake of attacking me when I mention the Nerevering prophecies. And so, I'm forced to kill the leadership of the tribe. Then, the wise woman has me go to Han Amu, who accepts the artifacts I collected from the other Khans and becomes Ashkan, and he names us Nerevering of the Arabinisum. What I find funny is the bleed over of gameplay elements into the story. We give him an axe that boosts his strength, an amulet that boosts his willpower, and a robe that boosts his intelligence. And then, boom, he's stronger, bolder, and smarter. That said, this is also the most undercooked of the Nerevering quests. Its simplicity, I suspect, can be owed to the remoteness of the camp, and the general undercookedness nature of the region the camp is in. The only real crossover with the tribe is the Legion quest, where they let a missionary get kidnapped by the Mabragash. And so, in a short span, we have become Hortator of three houses, Nerevering of four tribes. The Hortator quests give us a taste of the houses we represent, while the Nerevering quests introduce us to the value system of each tribe. It's not lost on me that the number of factions in this section is the same as the number of Daedra in the traditional Dunmer pantheon. Three houses, for the Anticipations, and four tribes, for the Four Corners. While the houses are pretty straightforward, I for the life of me couldn't tell you which tribes are meant to correspond to which Daedra. While the synopsis of the section was short, it's important to note that the player is expected to complete all six of the other faction quests completely independently of any specified direction. You have to figure out where to go, who to talk to, by yourself. So for someone doing this for the first time, assuming they aren't using any kind of guide, this series of quests will genuinely take some time. Or, if you're level 20 and have 50 reputation, you can entirely skip this phase. Level 20 is easy, a few of my Xbox characters like Indaris got there, but 50 reputation will require playing a significant number of the factions to reach it. It's actually more work to complete the quest in this way, but it's nice to see the game rewarding general heroics as a potential avenue. Even if it's at odds with my general distaste towards characters who are used to complete all of the content. And so, we start the sixth trial. Kicking off the beginning of the third act of Morrowind, we start by heeding the message of the Archcanon and meeting with Dancil and Dolus, who informs us of a method to sneak into the private quarters of the Archcanon Tholar Serioni. 
The Arch Canon lays out the situation. The temple is duty-bound to oppose false doctrine, and our association with the Empire has hurt our credibility. Yet we have been chosen Hortator and Nereverine, and the temple is now in crisis with Dagathur, failing to protect Vardenfell from the growing Sixth House threat. This is represented by the number of dreamers across the island, and the number of quests and other factions that involve the Sixth House. The situation is bad, and Serioni informs us that the best person to talk to would be Vivek himself, and warns us against encounters with the Ordinators. Keep moving. As you can see, open hostility. Thus begins our conversation with Vivek, and there is a lot to unpack here. He starts by informing us that he is ending the persecution of the Nereverine and the dissident priests, mentioning that it was the zeal of Beryl Sala that led them down that path, a fact confirmed in the House Halayu questline. Vivek will proclaim us Nerevar incarnate to all of Morrowind, and he is doing this whether we like it or not. Second, he proposes to give us Wraithguard, to do with what we wish, under oath we are free to break to defeat Dagathur and preserve Morrowind. Vivek gives us a simplified plan. We go to Red Mountain, we acquire Sunder from Viminal and Keening from Adrosal, take Keening, Sunder, and Wraithguard to Dagathur, the location, find the heart of Lorcan, and sever Dagathur's connection to the heart, ending the blight. To do so, we have to strike the heart at least once with Sunder, three times with Keening, while wearing Wraithguard. Vivek is then willing to host a great deal of questions about Dagathur. For starters, he has seven brothers who share his power of immortality, resurrecting after death at the heart. Dagathur was of the same age as Lord Nerevar. He is highly intelligent, but extremely delusional, able to invade dreams to influence the lower ranks. After the defeat of Dagathur, Vivek will have a great deal to say. For now, he is focused on protecting Vardenfell. However, there is another path that must be discussed. Morrowind has no essential NPCs. This means that any NPC whom you desire dead, or dies by some circumstance, is, well, dead. This can pose an obvious problem if quest NPCs die, but isn't too big an issue because it is an exceptionally rare circumstance that an NPC's life is outside of the player's control. This circumstance I refer to are the two instances in earlier quests where we escorted an essential NPC through a hostile area. When people complain about essential NPCs, I understand both sides of the argument. There's a degree of player freedom that is lost when you're unable to kill whom you choose. This is especially bad when what the player considers a valid choice are told that their choice is invalid because, for the moment, that NPC is invincible. However, the other side of the issue is the more dynamic NPCs of a post-Morrowind Elder Scrolls game. A lack of essential NPCs worked for Morrowind because, again, the player has total control over when NPCs die. This is fundamentally untrue in something like Oblivion, where NPCs are beholden to schedules, or more complicated quests, such as battle scenes. It is disingenuous to make the statement that Oblivion, Fallout 3, Skyrim, or Fallout 4 are better games with one simple fix, said fix being the removal of all essential flags. That said, I will say that it should always be within the player's hands to choose if NPCs may live, even if it functionally breaks the game. I would propose this be as simple as NPCs being unable to be killed unless the player delivers the killing blow. I can already hear the counter-argument. Yeah, but what if the player missed a blow and accidentally killed an important NPC? That's what saves are for. Or you can live with the consequence of being terrible at the game. Besides, such circumstances would be much, much rarer than the current situation of players realizing they lack freedom when an NPC is simply knocked down instead of killed. However, a critical piece of the design that comes with total player freedom is what I will call the Quest of Last Resort. In Morrowind, it is called the Back Door. In Fallout New Vegas, it is the Yes Man route. In Fallout 4, it is the Minutemen. In Morrowind, if an essential NPC dies, a message reads out, With this character's death, the thread of prophecy is severed. Restore a saved game to restore the weave of fate, or persist in the doomed world you have created. This is an effective means of relaying to the player that they have killed an essential character without the hard limitation of stopping the player. However, even if you get this message, it doesn't actually mean you're locked out of ending the game. In order to take the back path, it starts with how much you know or can figure out about how to defeat Dagath Ur. We need to acquire the unique Dwemer artifact off of Vivek's corpse. The information you need to intuit that Vivek is in possession of Wraithguard appears as late as our encounter with the dissident priests, making the back path a possibility, but honestly I consider it a high improbability that anybody actually figured out it even existed without the editor. Anyways, assuming you have killed Vivek and found the artifact, you are not told what to do next. 
Consulting the Chief Dwemer expert, Yagrim Bagarn, is the next step. He will only help you if you have more than 20 reputation and will ask you to grab Kagranak's journal and plan book from two separate ruins inside of Red Mountain. But what if Yagrim Bagarn was the one you killed? In speedruns of Morrowind, you can see people bum-rush Keening and Sunder and using them without needing Wraithguard. If I remember correctly, this works because the deadly part of these weapons are a script that requires you hold the weapon for a certain amount of time, something they bypass with hotkeys. Another solution would be to just have so much health or active healing to mitigate the damage. In any case, should Yagrim fix Wraithguard, the artifact will require a permanent 225 point loss in health, a significant sacrifice, but will allow you to wear Wraithguard without worry. It's actually a glitch. The health loss was meant to be a check to verify the player was an appropriate level, not a sacrifice. Again, this is another basic fix. From here, you will have to figure out the basics of the plan from Vivek's library, in a set of notes in this chamber, that detail how to defeat Dagathur. So from here, both the main quest line and the back door converge into the end sequence of Morrowind. The Citadels of the Sixth House is, unfortunately, where the game ultimately falls apart. The plans involve a series of raids across Red Mountain to assault the Sixth House and defeat the Brothers of Dagathur. In theory, each brother defeated will weaken Dagathur. In practice, the script is broken. Because Dagothur has not been loaded into the game yet, scripts cannot modify his stats. According to the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, you can visit him first, then kill his brothers but there are some obvious thematic and priority issues with doing that. Part of the speculation surrounding this game was the theory that the Sixth House was going to be joinable. This is alluded to in the questline when we meet Dagoth Garrus. If this was the case, it was cut very, very early in development. I suspect originally we were to have met with Dagathur and made a decision regarding our allegiance at some point before now in the main questline. However, because this never happens, Dagothur is never loaded and the script doesn't work. This leaves little reason to visit the Ash Vampires beyond the artifacts they carry. While they are somewhat varied in power, none of these artifacts are so interesting that I'm tempted to drop everything to go get them. The original spirit of the quest, as was written in the dialogue, was going to be a true war with the Sixth House, involving a series of excursions into Red Mountain and complex battles with Ash Vampires. Instead, it is as simple as peeking our heads inside two dungeons, then walking straight up to Dagathur. The failure of this quest ultimately lets down the earlier sections of the game. It is functionally irrelevant for us to be Hortator of any house or Nereverine of any tribe beyond ticking off an artificial box that tells Vivek we are the Nereverine. There is a crippling sense of isolation because not even the Boyan Armagers or Ordinators stationed inside the Ghost Gate help in our quest. We are completely alone. And this crushing sense of isolation, coupled with a complete lack of reward for our efforts, undermines Red Mountain entirely. The entire game. This entire video, I have barely discussed the region that is Red Mountain, and now that we're in the principal part of the Rain Quest, for which this large section of the map was reserved, I have almost nothing to say, because I honestly spent so little time here. In fact, I even forgot to meet the avatar of Tiber Septum that shows up at the Ghost Gate. I feel like I've automatically failed as an analyst for this, yet I honestly can't fault myself because of how disappointing Red Mountain is. If I was to propose a fix, a fix I may well work on at some point, I would start by giving the player the option to go to the leaders of each faction to ask for assistance. You could then assign each faction to one of the citadels inside Red Mountain. This would place a camp for each faction in front of the Ghost Gate and there would be parties at each stronghold. Strongholds would be reworked to be high-level endgame content, and each brother of Dagath Ur would be a boss fight. By getting the help of each faction, NPCs would spawn in the stronghold to fight the forces of the Sixth House, and you may even get companions from each faction to fight alongside you for a boss fight. Killing each brother would also be essential to battle Dagoth Ur, as I would buff him to be absurdly difficult to kill while his brothers still live. I would also rework their artifacts to be more useful. With these changes, becoming the wartime leader of each faction actually has a functional use. These are just ideas, so if any Morrowind fans have made it this far, please propose some ideas for me down in the comment section. And so, we go to the mouth of the volcano to confront Dagoth Ur. Come, Nerevar, friend or traitor, come. Come and look upon the heart and the Kulakan. And bring Wraithgar. I have come to the heart chamber. I wait for you there, where we last met countless ages ago. Come to me through fire and war. I welcome you. Welcome, Moon and Star. I have prepared a place for you. Come, bring Wraithgar to the heart chamber. Together, let us free the cursed false gods. Welcome, Nerevar. 
Together we shall speak for the law and the land and shall drive the mongrel dogs of the Empire from Morrowind. Is this how you honor the Sixth House and the tribe unmourned? Come to me openly, and not by stealth. Welcome, Moon and Star, to this place where destiny is made. Dagothur is a location in addition to a god. Dagothur, the dungeon, is a sad dungeon, functionally being a straight line from the entrance to the man himself. After Arkanthand, Elunabi, the Urshalaku Burial Cavern, and Kogarun, it's fairly disappointing. But remember that lever from Arkanthand? This is what it was preparing you for, an entire dungeon to teach the player to use a lever to open a door. Given this is our only chance to converse in the magnitude of the situation, Dagothur has been given probably the broadest and longest conversation in the game in which a great many topics come up. He asks if we are truly Nerevar reborn. How you answer is up to you and the spectrum of options is represented, from true belief that we are the Nerevarine to skepticism of the entire notion. He then asks for our intentions with the heart of Lorcan. And finally, he asks that, if he had offered to let us join him, would we have surrendered Kagranak's tools? After which, we're free to ask our questions of him. His plans for the Heart, the Sixth House, and the Dunmer. He justifies his actions as a sovereign entity. He shares that he has little knowledge of what truly happened to the Dwemer, and his use of the giant robot in the next room. Once the conversation is over, Dagathur acknowledges us as the challenger, and offers us the first blow. You couldn't even get that right. <laughs> what a fool you are. Did you get the false copy of Morrowind? Dagathur is on the level of some medium-tier NPCs from Fallout New Vegas. It's hard for me to be so blunt about something I like, but it is true. It isn't until you get to Dagathur, with varied conversation response options and having responses to your responses, that the missing potential of the text-based dialogue system is fully realized. There is absolutely no reason that NPCs couldn't have had more dialogue options and responses baked into the game because it is easier to write out dialogue in a text box than it is to voice act it. It is worth stressing that the topics in the dialogue menu are meant to indicate when the player asks something. While you can ask a lot of questions, it is sadly true that the Nereverine, like the hero of Kavach and the Dovakin, are another in a lineage of protagonists who are spoken to, rather than using an active voice. And so, Dagathur is defeated. If it seems strange for me to not comment on the boss fight, it's because there isn't really one. We still have to deal with the heart. Dagathur opens up his console and types in TGM in this section, so we need to focus on getting to the heart and... I guess destroy it. What are you doing? What are you doing? Fool! Stop! This is the end. The bitter, bitter end. Then Azura comes, pats us on the head while downplaying the fact that this was effectively a long-term revenge scheme on the Tribunal for killing her mortal husbando. She gives us the Ring of Azura, with a constant Night Eye and Restore Fatigue effect, which is an actual reward, and so, the main quest of Morrowind is complete. You no longer bear the burden of prophecy. You have achieved your destiny. You are free. The Doom Duemer's folly, Lord Dagoth's temptation, the Tribunal's seduction, the God's heart freed, the prophecy fulfilled. All fate sealed and sins redeemed. If you have pity, mourn the lost. But let the weeping cease. The blight is gone, and the sun's golden honey gilds the land. Hail, Savior, Hortator, and Nerevarine. Your people look to you for protection. Monster and villains, great and small, still threaten the people of Vardenfell. Enemies and evils abound, yet indomitable will might rid Morrowind of all its ills. For you, our thanks and blessing, our gift and token given. Come, take this thing from the hand of God. The Blight is gone, the Sixth House defeated, the Sleepers awoken, and the people of Vardenfell are thankful to us for saving them from Dagothur. And like most games of this formula, nothing to do now that you have won. It's kind of a paradox with these games. 
On the one hand, the main plot should have been done last, a final, ultimate story saving the world you've spent so much time living in. But on the other hand, these main stories are usually so pervasive and urgent you can't rationally justify ignoring them, Morrowind being the exception for reasons I've already outlined. Here's a genuine question. Would you prefer the start of a game that did everything right but blundered feet before the finale, or a game that barely stumbles its way in the beginning but competently wraps up its ending? I say this because I firmly believe if Morrowind had truly delivered in its third act, if it had justified rallying the people of Morrowind by showing them fighting alongside you against the Sixth House, if it had scaled up its difficulty to require becoming godlike in power, and in its finale it drew into question everything you have been fighting for, then I would have no hesitation in calling Morrowind the greatest game of all time. One of the mysteries of the game is the truth behind what really happened to Nerevar. The Ashlanders say that he was betrayed alongside Dagothur by the Tribunal, so that they may seize power from the heart. Vivek says that Nerevar had died naturally, and Dagothur says that Nerevar had betrayed him. This is a solid exploration of the idea of unreliable narrators, and it seems that Dagoth wants to go other routes. He challenges the morality of working for the Empire against what he believes are the best interests of the Dunmer people. But at the end of the day, Dagothur and the Sixth House are so patently evil there is little justifiable reason why anyone would want to go inside with him. It's clear that even in the event that Dagothur had originally been a good man, who had been betrayed all those years ago, today he is insane and his desires are unconscionable. The intrigue of the main quest and the questionable actions from grave robbing to slave trading do not pay off in a reasonable or satisfying manner and that is in part because despite the memes, and despite the dissertations written on the topic, at the end of the day we have to work with what we have and what we have is underwhelming. The saddest part, however, is that Bethesda, secure in their success, have never taken the opportunity to deliver on the vision behind this quest. Rallying the people of the land, undertaking ancient prophecies, and making deals with people to affect the outcome of a war. Not a final battle that decides the fate of the world, an actual war. Ironically, the closest this has come to being realized was in Fallout New Vegas, and that wasn't even a Bethesda game. Originally, I was not going to cover the plugins, and the reason is that I never really played with them outside of the Master Index plugin. But they are official Bethesda content, they're available for free download, and there is some intrigue to be mined out of them. So I booted up my main character back before we fought Dagothur. Two of them, Lefem and Adamantium, just add new armor sets for sale on Vardenfell. Adamantium armor is from Tribunal, while Lefem is original. Adamantium was meant to alleviate the lack of an in-game medium armor set in Morrowind. I mean, Endoral armor is there, but ordinators are scripted to get mad if you wear it, even after being proven to be the reincarnation of the guy it was named after by one of their gods. Both Tribunal and Blood Moon would try to make up for this problem before the idea of medium armor was ultimately abandoned come oblivion. I didn't actually get Lefem to work, so you'll just see some pictures. The plugin was meant to add more armor options for female characters, adding two new sets as well as female versions of Imperial Steel, Imperial Chain, Steel, and Netch Leather. But then the plugin botched it and forgot to actually implement the new models, so Tribunal ended up being the expansion to actually do it. Which is why you might recognize some of these female versions even if you haven't used the plugin before. The two new sets are Domina and Gold Armor. We'll start with Domina, a new light armor set. It falls below glass and the Dark Brotherhood set added in Tribunal that every character ever will have delivered to them in the form of an assassin. So, unless you want your character to look like a Molech Ball worshipper, I'd probably pass on the set, considering its stats. Gold Armor is yet another attempt to fix the issues with Medium Armor in the game, which is admirable, except it's not a full set. There's only three sets of Medium Armor in the base game that come with Greaves, and for some reason, Gold Armor came out from only the waist up. One theory is that it was meant to replace the Endoral chest and helm that get the Ordinators mad, which would be fine, but at that point, you're just wearing the boots and arms of the Endoral set. And it gets better. The guy that's meant to sell it to you won't, because whichever intern they saddled this plugin on didn't set the merchant's inventory correctly. Okay, this takes some explaining. Merchants generally don't have the stuff they sell in their inventory. They instead use a container that they're flagged as owning. NPCs will wear the best armor in their personal inventory, and they won't sell anything that they are wearing, so if you add a character that you want to sell, say, Daedric armor to Sidonine, and you put it in their inventory directly, they will equip it instead of selling it to you. 
What makes this even funnier though, is that one of the goals of this plugin was to correct a previous mistake Bethesda had made with this same character. Cyrolus Sackis was meant to be a master armorer trainer here on Vardenfell, having a reputation as a famous smith from Cyrodiil. But they forgot to actually make him a trainer, and they didn't bundle the fix with the Tribunal, Blood Moon, or Game of the Year edition. But they did take the time to put the female armors from this plugin in, like... What? The final armor-themed plugin is the Helm of Tohan, which was a pre-order bonus if you bought Morrowind from EB Games. Yes, a 2002 pre-order DLC. And all things considered, it's not bad. You ask for the latest rumors up in Dagon Fell, and you'll get a quest to go to Anisaralis. Once there, you meet two brothers who have an argument that devolves into a fist fight. The winner is supposed to come with you, but the quest bugged out and both brothers ended up following me. Noticing a pattern with the bugs? Anyways, you clear out this fairly short Daedric Ruin and find a chest at the end containing the Adamantium Helm of Tohan. The only point of this quest is to give you the key to this 100 point lock. As far as the helm goes, it's a standard Adamantium Helm whose sole notable property is its high enchant value. Higher than even the Daedric faces, meaning that you can make it one of the most powerful artifacts with the right enchantment. The Entertainer's plugin adds the ability to make a small amount of cash from providing entertainment to the patrons of the Eight Plates in Dalmora, which is the same bar where Indaris killed that Halal Noble. Considering the most you get paid is 100 gold and it's dependent on your skills and items, it's a neat concept, but it's not really a standout. Bitter Coast sounds as a bunch of sound files of the Bitter Coast. Area Effect Arrows adds a new shop to Vivek which specializes in enchanted ranged weapons that do area of effect damage, and nothing else. Which will come in handy for the Siege of Fire Moth plugin should you choose to use them. Siege of Fire Moth adds a new island and quest centered around taking back an old Imperial fort that's being held by a Lich. It's a neat concept, but in execution it's a good example of the merits of restraint and level design. You meet Solus Gravius at Sidonine who dispatches you to lead a small task force of heroes across the island chain. Don't get attached, they're all gonna die from a literal horde of skeletons. There are no less than four skeletons per pack. The only challenge of this mod was avoiding the temptation to recall to go get more magicka. Get into the keep proper and you find this room. What purpose this room served before the skeletal takeover is a mystery. Then there's this room with no less than 30 rats all infected with Whitbane. Good thing we caught Corpus last episode. You go through the caves with a ludicrous amount of ebony before arriving at the final boss area. This is an unbreakable force, unstoppable wall kind of situation. The Lich has endless health and magicka pools, and I have an absurd amount of spell absorption and magicka resistance. I can't do enough damage to bypass his regeneration since all my spells were designed to damage over time, and he can't consistently damage me enough to pose a substantial threat. All he does is cast spells which 75% of the time I absorb into my magicka pool I then heal with. Alright, let me break this down. Generally, Morrowind's level design was structured around a small number of enemies who posed a large amount of threat to the player. This was to work around Morrowind's mechanics. Stealth-focused characters are going to be even more useless here than ever before. Spellcasters will run out of magicka fast, and warrior characters will get body blocked by sheer numbers. There's no items in the environment to help the player. No potions, no scrolls, no tools. Fire Moth is only difficult on account of the fact that it's radically different in design from the rest of the game. And it's more of a tedious kind of difficulty where I just started dodging and running around all the enemies instead of fighting them. The end reward of this plugin is the Ward of Akavir, which isn't even a new item. It's just a dragon scale shield with a constant fortify 25 point effect. This whole plugin is a waste of time. No, wait, better. Its primary usage is something that can be pointed to as an example of how not to design a dungeon. All right, now let's turn this around with a plugin that should have been in the Game of the Year edition. The Master Index plugin is a rework of the Propylon system of the base game, which I talked about all the way back in part 2. The original idea of the system was to have a circuit of teleporters activated by keys found in the environment of Morrowind. In practice, nobody ever explains the concept to the player, and most characters are generally lucky to only find a couple during their adventures. The Master Index plugin fixes this by adding a quest that will have you finding every index and creating a Master Propylon Index that can be used to teleport to every Propylon chamber. It's a nice and simple quest line. Fulm's Morel in the Caldera Mages Guild will dispatch you directly to each index's location. He's a little clairvoyant, and the quest could stand to have a little more instances of the player actually having to figure out their locations. My other gripe is that once you turn in an index, it's gone, even after completing the master index. So the old function of teleporting chamber to chamber will be replaced with teleporting to Caldera, which can be a problem for the criminally inclined. This rounds out all the official Bethesda content not included in the physical Game of the Year edition. So let's get into the proper expansion content with Tribunal. We're back to our main character following the downfall of Dagoth Ur. 
I have mixed feelings on Tribunal. When I think about it casually, that's when I have feelings of nostalgia about my time there, but when I think about it more analytically, I start to see the flaws really quickly. The first, which is an endless source of hilarity for me, is the issue with the Dark Brotherhood assassins attacking you literally out the gate when you start at Morrowind. This is actually fixed somewhat on the Xbox Game of the Year edition, where the events will only happen after level 6, but on the PC copy, to this day, it remains unpatched. But we do finally get to answer as to why the assassins are coming after us. It starts with us reporting the attack to the guards, who gives us some vague directions to some guy in Ebonheart. Apelles Mattias is the man, and he appoints to the mainland, being the likely suspects. Though he doesn't mention that the local Dark Brotherhood chapter happened to get wiped out recently. Anyways, we use a teleporter guide person who can transport us to Mournhold on the mainland, and you can get teleported back at no cost. It's a bit of a cheap workaround to get us to the city, but I'll let it slide. The first striking thing about the city is the architecture. It's quite different, and I attribute it to the changes in color palette, from adobe browns to brighter teal greens and maroon reds. You also notice that the city is open air interior cells, something that isn't present in the base game but would become a staple of cities in subsequent Elder Scrolls games. Is Tribunal an expansion or an extension? I think it's a good question. I would say Blood Moon is undeniably an expansion, while some of the plugins like the Master Index or Fort Firemoth are DLC. It would only be a few years later that Bethesda would be trying to sell horse armor and have 13 different pieces of DLC for sale in Oblivion, but is Morrowind just behind the magical distinction? I certainly remember the days when this content was made available physically. I actually had an original base game on PC, and I remember seeing copies of Tribunal and Blood Moon being sold in stores. My current copy is a slightly older Game of the Year edition, but yes, my Zoomer friends, there was an internet before 2007, and yes, the content was downloadable. I don't think Tribunal has a lot of the connotations other DLC carry, even by Bethesda standards. We'll see, though. The entire DLC takes place in the city of Mornhold. City of light. City of magic. Yeah, that. Anyways, the city is divided into smaller districts, the main areas being God's Reach, the Great Bazaar, and the Temple Courtyard. Most of the NPCs have new, unique dialogue. In fact, a lot of people have voice acting relevant to their situations. Vec? That's strange. I suppose it's possible that my master knew this man, but being an Ashlander and my master being of the House of Telvanni, well, if you'll pardon me for being flippant, Sergio, I don't think they would be friends. That said, a lot of people also really only play one part in one quest, barring some of the major players in the city. I didn't really do a whole lot of side questing in Tribunal, so I'll be focusing on the main Tribunal content. And yes, I am aware of the High Luck Wood Elf quest. Our main focus for now will be looking for the Dark Brotherhood, and that leads us into the sewers. One of the immediately apparent problems with Tribunal is that if a quest requires or involves combat in any fashion and it can't justifiably happen on the surface, then it gets relegated to the sewers, and I'll be honest, the sewers are just awful. A detail about Tribunal is, rather than being scaled to Vardenfell, it's designed to be played by people who have beaten the main quest of Morrowind. This has the hilarious knock-on effect of making the people of Mournhold appear to be much stronger than the people of Vardenfell. So, not only are the common enemies on average as tough as some of the bosses in the previous part or even heads of factions from Vardenfell, they're also in a confusing mess of an area. The sewers are dark and enclosed, their layout is not intuitive, often the structured parts break off into repetitive cave networks. It is very easy to get lost, and if something involved the sewers, I would just consult the wiki. Once you do find the Dark Brotherhood hideout and fight through the assassins, you'll encounter Dandrus Volus. Dandrus Volus is higher level and has more health than Dagoth Ur. Let that sink in for a moment. This is an example of vertical progression, where rather than providing more content for the player to explore laterally, it is providing a higher level of challenge for players to go through. It makes a degree of sense considering Tribunal is meant to be played after Morrowind, sure, but it, dare I say this, justifies the scaling system of the later games. Azura, forgive me. Nonetheless, enemies becoming tougher isn't actually a problem. Enemies becoming tougher in conjunction with an ugly area that isn't fun to explore or fight in and is difficult to learn or map out is a massive problem. Anyways, we're done flying blind now as we have found a contract that's marked with the letter H. Guards will direct us to Tyanius Delician, who will admit that it was the new king, Halau Helseth, who ordered the hit and he doesn't really care. The Tribunal questline is a bit confusing. I would say it provides options, but in reality, six of the quests can be skipped just by going to another quest giver early.
early. We investigate rumors surrounding the new king, investigate the temple, investigate the guards, investigate the dead king's widow, investigate some journalists, then meet the queen Baron Zia, who suggests we go up to the temple and meet Fedris Halir. I went through these quests quickly because, and I'll be blunt here, there's not much substance to them. And I actually completed all of them in under half an hour. They don't make much sense to do, considering Delician will blow you off for asking about the Dark Brotherhood attacks. In any case, thus begins the real quest line of Tribunal, up at the temple. Fedris Halir wants us to track down a goblin army being prepared by the king and wants us to kill two war chiefs and their Altmer trainers. This involves going down into the sewer. Our next task involves escorting a temple priest so that he may cleanse the shrine in the sewer. Now we need to track down a powerful lich Berylzar who has taken up residence in the sewers. Seriously, I'm tired of this joke, but we really are tasked three times back to back with going deep into the sewers. The first involving a convoluted maze, the second an escort quest, and the third another ludicrous lich fight. After a period of 24 hours, the main plaza is attacked by strange mechanical creatures. We go to aid the Ordinators and Royal Guards in defending the city, after which the Royal Guards direct us to Delician and the Ordinators direct us to Halir. Both ask us to investigate a hole that has opened in the plaza, inside which is a Dwemer ruin where the new fabric and enemies are battling the Dwemer occupants. This is where a choice is presented to the player, but not really. The issue is in whether you chose to speak to an Ordinator or a Royal Guard. I happened to speak to an Ordinator and was directed to Hilaire. If I had spoken to a Royal Guard and gone to Delician, our next two quests would have been different. This is an awkward attempt to introduce branching quest lines done very, very poorly. It is not a conscious decision of the player which path they want to take, but a chance the player is unaware of based on the costume the guard they're speaking to is wearing. I really hope that Bethesda didn't shy away from writing branching quest lines because of this. Going to the temple has us meeting Amalexia, one of the tribunal gods whom wishes to squash a new cult, the end of times. No, no, you guys are two centuries early. Its leader reveals a path to enlightenment, which angers Amalexia. So she has us use a Dwemer weather machine deep within the newly revealed ruin to create ash storms in the city. Now the Dwemer dungeon is big and pretty alright, but it's a bit of an obvious logical leap for people to assume freak weather must be a subsequent punishment for a minority of people forming a suicide cult. Doubt is forming about Amalexia, however. People in the temple are scared of her, and one of her hands has become frustrated in his wandering god's reach. We have to fight him, and he is a tough fight because he introduces the rarely used concept of NPCs utilizing health potions. And Amalexia rewards us with a choice of three pretty decent abilities. Amalexia, now believing us to be Nerevar incarnate, tells us of two blades, Hope's Fire and True Flame. Both blades were a gift from the King of the Dwarves, Dumak whom Nerevar had allied with against the Nords. Hope's Fire was her blade, and True Flame was the blade of Nerevar. It was lost at the Battle of Red Mountain, but she has found a piece of it. She suggests we rebuild the sword. One piece is at the Museum of Artifacts, and can only be acquired if we donate two artifacts to the museum. The other piece, we're told, is in possession of Karod, one of the King's Guard. We duel Karod. He's tough but fun. Then Halseth asked me to work for the temple to gather information about them? Yeah, this branching questline really worked out, huh? If you're confused, the game seems to think we've just arrived from the courtyard section and is telling us to do the quests that lead to this point where we get the quest to duel Karod. With both pieces found, we find a craftsman. This is a famous city, so one Yagak Rogluck, a master smith, lives in town and he can fix the blade, but he wants to also restore the enchantment. We dive into the ruin, meeting the ghost of Radek Stungenthums, a Dwemer who asks us to get some pyroil tar for the blade. We find some tar off a Dremora Lord deep in the ruin, which was a fun little dungeon. With the tar and blade, we have reforged True Flame, and Amalexia congratulates us. Amalexia then tells us of Sotha Sil, whom she claims has gone mad, is behind the attack, and has become a danger to all of Morrowind. True Flame is capable of killing Sotha, and it's up to us to stop him. We're transported to the Clockwork City, stuck here until we escape. And so begins. The Clockwork City, unlike the labyrinthine sewers or repetitive Dwemer ruins, is actually an interesting dungeon, and a suitable and logical progression and difficulty for a character who, reasonably, will have completed the main quest. This includes the monstrous Imperfect, a giant mech boss fight. Finally, we get to Sothasil, and guess what? He's dead. Nerevarim, here it ends. This clockwork city was to be your death. You were to be my greatest martyr. 
the heroic Nero Green, sacrificing all to protect Morrowind from the mad Sulka Sill. But you live. You live. Fear not. I will tell the tale myself when this is done. I will tell my people how, with your dying breath, you proclaimed your devotion to me, the one true God. Your death will end this prophecy and unite my people again under one God, one faith, one rule by my divine law. The puppet king will lay down his arms and bow to my will. Those who do not yield will be destroyed. The mazed band has allowed me to travel to this place. Here I slew Sothasil. Here I summon the fabricants to attack Mournhold. I will be the savior of my people. I alone will be their salvation. None may stand in my way. Not you, and certainly not Vivek. He is a poet, a fool. I will deal with him when I have finished with you. And so the sill. He always thought himself our better, shunning us, locking himself in his hole. He spoke not a word as he died, not a whisper. Even in death he mocked me with his silence. But I think you will scream, mortal. For now you face the one true god. Her loss of divinity has had a negative effect on her. She's a tough cookie, but once she's dead, we get her sword, Hope's Fire, and use the mazed band of barrels are we got from one of the sewer quests to teleport back to Mornhold. You have done well, mortal. The death of Armalexia is a boon for all of Morrowind, though it may take time for this to be understood. She would have betrayed the Dummer as surely as she had betrayed all those whom she loved. This was her curse and her undoing. Weep not for Sothasil. He shed his mortality long ago, and I am certain his death was no small relief to him. These gods lived with the burden of a power no mortal was meant to possess. Your work in Morrowind is not finished, Nerebarim. Vivek still lives, but I believe his time grows short. Protect my people. Defend these lands. The skies of Moonhold are clear once again. Let these people suffer no longer. Now go, mortal. Embrace your destiny and go with my blessing. Helseth will give us a full set of this royal guard armor for doing the job, and thus ends Tribunal. I posed a question near the start of this about whether Tribunal is an expansion or an extension. Tribunal is solidly an extension, and there's nothing wrong with that. While Blood Moon is an expansion, and we'll get to that. Tribunal is unique among Bethesda DLC as they generally aren't sequels to the main story. Amalexia was the wife of Nerevar after all, so her absence from the base game was somewhat strange, especially considering she tends to be the one that personally handles matters of war in modern Dunmer culture. Part 6 ended on a sour note due to the final quest at Red Mountain. That was purposefully taken out of context of what would happen in Tribunal. Tribunal is a continuation of Morrowind, providing a somewhat satisfying gameplay and even story conclusion that Dagothur and the Sixth House was lacking. However, Tribunal is also reliant on you having played Morrowind's main quest to work. Play either in a vacuum, and they don't function. You can wave away Almalexia calling you the Nereverine as part of her being mad if you haven't done the main quest, but then it's hard to really care or understand Almalexia's motivations if you don't know about the mystery behind what really happened to Nerevar and why she's diminished in power. Without Tribunal, Morrowind just ends. You never get a resolution for two of the Tribunal gods, and you don't really have any activities to complete as Nereverine. Part of the reason I think most who enjoy Morrowind don't have an issue with its finale is that for the most part, Tribunal is the real finale of Morrowind's main quest. Even with that context, however, Tribunal has some fatal flaws. Being limited to the interior of the city means that the area doesn't have a lot of options for places to send the player, hence the many quests that involve going down into the sewers. I think another missed opportunity would have been continuations for various factions from the base game. For instance, how interesting would it be to see some extra quests from Radoran and Halau related to the recent succession of King Helseth? 
or some Telvanni quests where they are the political underdogs. The Imperial Legion and Cult could have had some representation, and there would have been some obvious opportunities for the Tribunal Temple, or a return of characters who left at the end of their quest lines like Jim Stacy and Inu Halau. Or how about some new factions, like an opportunity to learn more about House Dress and House Endoral. House Dress, as Daedra worshippers, would have been a perfect opportunity to explore what would become the reformed tribunal of post-Morrowind, that being Boethia, Mephala, and Azura. I would have preferred getting to explore their culture rather than the Hellseth stuff. He's mostly just here so his mom can pay lip service to Daggerfall anyways, and while that's fine, his presence is just annoying, because he makes at least three attempts on the Nereverine's life and we're just supposed to be cool with it. I get that the idea was that he was being proactive and taking out any potential political threats. Tribunal, however, also doesn't really work without Morrowind. I mean, literally, yes, but for example, you could theoretically just teleport up to Solstheim and start playing Blood Moon. It'd be challenging at the start, but it's possible and it makes sense. Tribunal's linked to Morrowind in such a way that it can't stand on its own despite its best attempts. I think what beautifully ties Tribunal together is that after slaying Amalexia, every NPC in the game is given a topic about her and you can inform them about her death, and even you killing them. And those NPCs, regardless of their beliefs on the matter, will take offense at that. Yes, even Nabani Mesa, an Azura worshipper who denounces the false tribunal, takes offense at the notion of us having killed them. for is a pair of boots. How hard could it be? After playing Morrowind for so long, coming to a more recognizable land of forests with wolves and bears feels alien. And unlike Tribunal, this is an open landmass. Solstheim itself is actually pretty small, the entire island being about the size of one of Morrowind's biomes. Even without the excessive speed I have, it does not take long to traverse the island. Yet it feels like a wild wasteland. There are only three places of refuge, in between all that is a lot of wildlife that is going to try to kill you. However, unlike Tribunal, Blood Moon eases up on the difficulty. It can still be a challenge, so you'll want some experience before you jump in, but Blood Moon isn't expecting you to have beaten or even played Morrowind's main quest. It's perfect for characters who may have just beaten one of the guilds or great houses and are looking for new content. And this is where I discuss expansions. Blood Moon is an expansion. There's a good deal of new land to explore, some new factions to play with, a lot of new items and creative quests, and two separate quest lines, each with branching paths and clear progression that don't rely on random and unforeseen choices. Most of the NPCs in the base game, near the start, will rattle off a rumor about Solstheim. All of them. It can be kind of annoying because the Solstheim rumors will supersede the normal rumors. They'll mention that it's a miserable land and that there's boat transport up in Cool that can take us there. Once we get there, we arrive at Fort Frostmoth. Both quest lines start here and we're going to focus on the main quest line first, which is, in my opinion, the lesser of the two, although it's still a solid quest line. In this line, we meet with Captain Curious, who wants us to uncover the cause of the low morale in his troops lately. Asking the guards, it becomes apparent there's some sort of ban on liquor at the fort, and offering drinks reveals that the issue is that the captain ordered the fort become dry. Carius says it wasn't his decision, the alcohol just stopped coming in. He suspects the priest, who denies having anything to do with it, blaming the captain. Going to the priest's office reveals that he's been stashing alcohol for what he claims to be the benefit of the troops. I tell the captain the truth, and he congratulates us. Next, Carius is worried that some weapons are being smuggled out and sold back on Vardenfell. We have a choice of working with two of his men on the matter, and so I work with Sena Lucius. He's sort of a proto-companion that would pop up in the later games. Anyways, Lucius is useful for the investigation as he makes it easier to solve the case, but he sucks in a fight. We meet with the smith, Zeno Faustus, and he says he overheard soldiers talking about a weapon stash in a nearby cavern. Sure enough, there's some legionaries in the cave who are hostile to us. After a lot of attempts of trying to keep Lucius alive, we get to the smuggler's leader, Galtarius Spurius. What a name. And he offers to leave peacefully. I don't allow this. However, on our return to the fort, we find it has been attacked. Carius is missing, and whichever proto-companion we don't choose asks us to go to the Skull tribe on the north side of the island and ask if they know anything about the attackers. The Skull are to the Nords what the Ashlanders are to the Dunmer. 
This makes them a fairly distinct entity. I meet their leader, Tharsten Hartfang. Like the Ashlanders, he has issues with the Imperials, believing them to be corrupting the land. He sends us to Korst Windai for more information. Korst gives us a copy of the story of Avar Stonesinger, and a map of the locations of the various stones around the island. In order to ingratiate myself into Skull culture, I need to complete the rituals, which involves traveling almost the entire island. This is obviously very similar to the Pilgrimages of the Seven Graces, a quest where I'm guided around the island of Vardenfell and introduced to the custom of the Dunmer people. What I don't understand is why Bethesda doesn't emulate this style of quest more often. I have mentioned the quests in the Forgotten Vale in the Dawnguard extension for Skyrim. The quest cleansing the stones from Dragonborn, however, is a perfect example of Bethesda not understanding why this kind of quest worked for Blood Moon. In cleansing the stones, you go to each of these same stones, except instead of learning about the culture of the skull, you just shout at them and move on. The skull test of loyalty starts with the ritual of water. We touch the stone and emulate the events as they occurred for Avar, following a black horker through a great deal of water until we arrive at an underwater cave deep below the surface. We find the waters of life bottled up and bring it back to the water stone. The ritual of Earth involves solving a musical puzzle inside a barrow, a Nord burial tomb with Draugr inside it. Oh boy, Draugr. The Ritual of Beasts has us assisting the good beast, a giant polar bear, fight off a pack of Reichlings. We either have to heal the bear or set aside it as it heals. The Ritual of Trees has us assassinating a Reichling to acquire some strange seeds, making the four Spriggans escorting the Reichling friendly to us and taking the seed back to the clearing so that it may grow. The Ritual of the Sun has us encountering Grawl, strange ice creatures, and once we acquire a flaming eye from its corpse, we activate an ice wall and free the sun. Finally, the Ritual of the Wind involves entering another barrow to free the winds from the greedy man's bag. These rituals introduce us to the Skull and to Salthsheim in a fantastic way. I cannot understate that. While the quests sound simple, and they are, there are two elements to all of them that make them work. The first is that you have to look at the map in your inventory rather than simply having the stones marked on your regular map. This makes the quest immediately different since it relies on you cross-referencing the general layout of Salthsheim with a hand-drawn approximation of the stone's locations. The second is that you need to read the story of Avar Stonesinger in order to fully understand your objectives. Rather than following the directions of a guide character, or intuiting the directions from a waypoint marker, the point of the exercise is to emulate the actions of Avar by actually reading the story. And this contrasts nicely with the Seven Graces, as well as the quests that introduce us to each Ashlander tribe. In the Seven Graces, they are our enslaved Daedra begrudgingly playing the parts you're meant to emulate over and over. For the Skull, however, it's much more naive and innocent, like the Skull culture, and its circumstances align well enough that you can emulate the story perfectly. You also meet many of the new enemies along the way, see many dungeons and side quests that you can do, and generally become more savvy to the layout of the island. It feels like completing the ritual is genuinely earning our way into the tribe in ways that the Ashlander Nerevarine quests did not. We don't just learn the customs of the tribe and do them some small favor. Obliging these people and performing their rituals shows a level of dedication the other people who have come to this island have not. Which leads nicely into our next quest. Tharsten wants us to prove our wisdom by investigating a crime. Rigmore Halfhand claims that Ingar Icemane has stolen furs from his home. You know how much I love investigations. Asking around, Ingar appears to not have any good motives. The Skull live in a communal lifestyle, and if he needed furs, the tribe would have provided. Risi, Ingar's wife, states Ingar's innocence and claims that somebody may have framed Ingar to disgrace him, possibly Rigmore. Rigmore says he doesn't know why Ingar would steal his furs, although you will find a note in the Ice Main home indicating a short affair between Risi and Rigmore. Tharsten, armed with this information, allows us to choose. We can either exile Rigmore or send him to the wolves. These are Nords, so obviously wolves are the correct option. Tharsten now asks we prove our strength and we meet with Korst near the lake. The lake being on fire, Tharsten believes a Draugr lord is causing this phenomenon while Korst believes it's a sign of the Blood Moon prophecy. You no longer bear the burden of prophecy. You have achieved your destiny. You are free. The lie detector determined that was a lie. We go to investigate and find the Draugr lord, Aeslip. He tells us he was a mage who became a Draugr so that he may prevent the incursion of some Frost Atronachs. 
Don't you mean you became a draugr in service of the dragon priests? He asks us to help and I oblige him. We wipe out the Atronax and we get a cool ring from him before he embraces death, having completed his goal. Korst congratulates us on ending the threat and we return to the Skull Village only to find it under attack by werewolves. We defend the town and upon entering the Great Hall we find the Honor Guard dead and Tharsten missing. Korst returns, informing us that we have contracted lycanthropy and in three days will become a werewolf. How this works considering that whole corpus thing, I don't know. We're banned from the village until cured, and this is a big choice for the questline, and unlike Tribunal, it's rather obviously a choice. If we're cured, we become Blood Skull, and further our relationship with the tribe. If we become a werewolf, we take up working for the Daedric Prince, Hyrcene. Now, while we may have cured ourselves, Umbra has returned to looking for more Daedric work to complete. Outside of taking the other side of the Frostmoth smuggler quest, his early stages are mostly the same. But when he's infected with lycanthropy, he chooses to become a werewolf. This is the main point the player is encouraged to become a werewolf, but you can also get infected by any of the werewolves who start wandering the island after this point. Unlike vampires, werewolves are actually well designed and playable. To start, during the day you are your normal self, but at night you transform into a werewolf with a host of set stats. You are a proper one-man wrecking crew as a werewolf, although if anyone witnesses the transformation then your secret's out. You have to kill a human that night or you'll lose a large chunk of health the next morning. Luckily, Solstheim is rife with plenty of useless bodies to feed on, so it forms a nice gameplay loop. Wake up, quest during the day, settle down in a cave at night, and then go out hunting. Then return to a cave and wake up again. Unfortunately, because Umbra was not cured, we have been exiled from Skull Society. Originally, I didn't have much to say about the first branching quest, as I had played the Skull Perspective. From their side, the quest is just to go into a tomb and fight a bunch of werewolves to retrieve a totem. Go to X, kill Y, collect Z. But for the werewolves, Hircine dispatches us to that same cave, with the objective to stop the Skull Hunters from retrieving the totem. There are over a dozen hunters to stop. They will all search the cave for the totem until they find it and will try to leave once they take it. You can even fail if they manage to successfully steal it. This quest is awesome probably in part because the designers had a reasonable idea of how powerful the player would be due to them being a werewolf. Of course, it's easy to cheese if you just wait until your human form. But let's not. Then we're to perform the rice stag, a ritual to try and curry favor with the skull. A spirit bear has been summoned and we need to slay it and return its heart to Korst before daybreak. The hunting pack makes like a horror movie and we split up, even going so far as to gradually get slaughtered. I may joke, but I like this quest. It's a tad more interesting than the prior quest, where it was literally go to X, kill Y, collect Z. From the werewolf perspective, it's less interesting. You just have to track down and kill a bunch of hunters and then kill the spirit bear ourselves. It'd be cool to see the hunt from the other perspective, as the horror monster that's killing the isolated hunters. Once we return the hard, Korst wants us to investigate another sign of the Blood Moon, a bunch of dead horkers on the coastline. He wants us to go ask the folks over at Castle Karstag what's going on. We make our way over there and the ice castle's locked up tight. There's a back door underwater and we meet one of the people living in the castle, Krish. Krish is a Reichling. Reichlings are the true incarnation of the Old Mary P. This message has been censored by the Thalmor. The master of the castle went missing and another Reichling, Dulk, took over. Chris tried to get a bunch of Grawl to work with him, but they isolated him to the back of the cave. We start by taking out the Grawl in the basement, then go up to the banquet hall. We meet Dulk, who affirms that Karstag is missing. Korst is worried about the situation on the island and gives us a weapon he says will be useful for fighting Grawl, not realizing Castle Karstag was the final time I was going to ever fight them. For Umbra, Hircine sends us to go clear out a bunch of rebels at Castle Karstag. There's not really a good reason for why he cares, unless the implication is that Karstag was a Hircine worshipper before he was a missing person. Anyways, we meet with Dulk, who asks we will wipe out Krish and all the Grawl in the basement. You don't get as clear an explanation for what's going on from the werewolf perspective, probably because the writers assumed most players would align with the Skull first. Kors tells us of the Blood Moon prophecy, the signs of which have struck the land. The first is fire from the Eye of Glass, the second is the Tide of Woe, and the third is the Blood Moon. These signs indicate the coming of the Hunter, Hircine, and his Hounds, and this event happens once an era. The next time we sleep, we're awoken to a bunch of broken werewolves. This begins a long, long, long finale. This area has no escape, no resupply. 
There is no escape. No recall or intervention can work in this place. Yeah, that. Worse, the area is filled with powerful werewolves. According to the UESP, there are 31 werewolves inside the labyrinth, all of them level 70 with 700 health. Contrast this with Dagother's immortal incarnation at level 35 with 300 health. The area is an absolute gauntlet and is very difficult. It is effectively the final gameplay test for Morrowind. To start, we encounter Captain Carius again, who wants to work together. While he serves some use as a companion, those who wish to keep him alive have a much harder time as you have to heal him. The game quickly becomes about resource management. Worse for me, it's a game in Magicka management. Because I can't generate Magicka through resting, and because you have to kill a dozen werewolves every level to even rest at all, I have to carefully manage my Magicka throughout this entire sequence. There are no spellcasters either, and I never got around to learning the ancestral ghost summon thing to cheese some Magicka back. Carefully and slowly, I have to utilize the recharge rates on my enchanted items to survive. However, the worst part is this awful sound. That sound plays whenever armor is broken, which doesn't happen often thanks to this Royal Guard armor. Except there's one piece I've been wearing this entire game that has very low maximum durability. The Boots of Blinding Speed. These werewolves can destroy the boots in a single hit, and it's a chance which piece of armor gets hit, meaning my Magicka, enchanted items, health, and my repair tools have to be rationed as well. The lack of space to operate in, and for this first part, trying to keep Curious alive? Yeah, it's a challenge. And it's great! Eventually I make it to the center. Carius says he's going to stay behind. Tharston's in the next maze and he's willing to work together. He does eventually betray us though, so getting him killed is not exactly a big concern. The big issue of the maze is the cramped space makes movement very difficult. For werewolves, this area is even more difficult. Your stats are set rather than augmented by your affliction, so even though we are high level, we're far too weak to handle the hunt in our werewolf form. But, as a werewolf, we are exceptionally fast and jump really high, so we can actually just bypass all the werewolves since Umbra doesn't really care about keeping Karius alive. Otherwise, you'll have to wait until you turn human again to even stand a chance of fighting your way through the area. So while werewolves get a slightly more disappointing outing in the final quest, their earlier quests are a lot more fun. Luckily, the next area opens up. Karstag's here. He doesn't have much to say to us, just attacks us on sight. Once he's down, Hirstein shows up. So, you are the one. You have escaped my hounds and beaten back the other challengers. I had rather expected the giant to prevail, but no matter. You have proven yourself a worthy hunter, and you have earned the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon a mortal. You are to be my prey. I ask you though, what is it that makes a hunter great? Is it his strength, the speed with which he strikes, or is it his guile, the ability to outwit his prey? Answer me, mortal, and decide your fate. So you have chosen, and so shall be your fate. To face me in all my glory would be less than sporting, so you shall face but one of my aspects, the one you have chosen. We have little time. The blood moon sinks low in the sky. Prepare yourself, mortal, for now you are the hunted. The whole point of this exercise was to try and determine who on Salthheim is the toughest. With the leaders of the Imperials, Skull, and Reiklings down, that leaves us, a foreigner. He wants to fight us now, but not with his full power, instead as one of his aspects. Shame is, I could have likely taken him at full power. I choose his aspect of Guile and got his Spear of the Hunter, which is a cool weapon. Shame I'm out of stuff to do with it, though. The Mortrag Glacier, where the whole shebang took place, breaks up. We tell course of our victory and defeat of Tharsten and Karius is back at the fort. A bit of a mediocre end. The mazes were a great final challenge, but it's a shame they couldn't make Kyrsene more challenging. It's also a bit of a thematic letdown. After the excellent quests introducing us to the Skull culture, the change just kind of goes off the rail and forces us into another prophecy sequence. But I said earlier that this was the weaker of the two quest lines on Sulthheim, and I mean that. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I did these quest lines separately. Rather, they were intertwined with one another and done concurrently. So the Hearsene fight was fairly close to the end of the entire playthrough. 
Back at Fort Frostmoth, when we arrived at the island, I met Carnius Magius, a member of the East Empire Company, who is here on Solstheim to set up a colony at Raven Rock. He offers to let us join the faction, and our first assignment is to escort some workers to the site. It's not too far, but it is through a forest. We meet with Falco Galenis at Raven Rock, who asks we get four samples of ebony ore to give to Carnius in order to convince investors to fund the construction. We get paid in stock, and what follows is an interesting questline. After a few days, Carnius will dispatch us to deal with some Nord who's raving about ruining the land, which is in line with the Skull. We need to remove him. Falco wants us to just knock him out, Carnius doesn't care. If we knock him out, Falco will pay us, and if we kill him, Carnius will pay us. After another three days, Carnius wants us to retrieve a shipping manifest. Falco says the ship hasn't arrived yet, and when asking around, we find out there was some light from the northwest. Checking it out, we find a shipwreck beset by Draugr and rescuing a surviving woman who returns to the camp. A few days pass, and we're given a choice. If we side with Falco, he'll want us to keep Carnius in check. If we side with Carnius, he offers to make us rich. And the choice is signposted. It's not based on something arbitrary like talking to guards. The player also understands the mechanics of both choices, unlike the Skull Werewolf choice. Which one you choose offers a different quest line. I side with Falco, while Umbra, who also happens to be invested in Raven Rock, sides with Carnius. Now, I'll be upfront. Unless I say otherwise, the quest will have gone the same for both characters. First, we're asked if the new settlement should have a smithy or a trader. I ask people and they vote trader, especially since there's already smiths on the island. Yes, that is a quest, and yes, I think I have found some Hearthfire and Fallout 4 DNA in here. Falco says that a ship captain's demanding extraordinary payment to ship our ebony ore to the mainland. We need to convince him to keep his side of the deal. Barrow here mentions his fellow ship captain Elberoth, apparently unaware that Elberoth crashed up shore and had his ship attacked by Draugr. Speaking with the village bicycle I rescued from said ship, she gives me Elberoth's saber. I confront Barrow with the saber, Barrow's shook by my intimidation, and he backs down. He seems like the type to double-cross us mid-shipment, but that's the company's problem. Someone stealing ore from the mine, oh no. The most interesting part of this quest is that said thief, after being caught, ends up committing suicide in their cell after our conversation with Carnius. This is the first big departure between Carnius and Falco. Falco had us discover who was stealing the ore, while Carnius wants us to help steal the ore. We start by removing evidence from the thief's house, and then distract a guard so he can steal even more. And after a few days, wait, let's talk about that. A fair few of these quests require real time to pass between them. I initially tried to do both quest lines at the same time, and I only got to the part where the quest branches before I had finished the main quest of Blood Moon. It is kind of like a more advanced version of the Stronghold quest from the base game, but for an entire quest line. I actually like this, even if it leads to my character just standing around for a few days. Most of my playthroughs ended with me becoming the leader of a faction in less than one month after joining said faction. Hell, the Nereverine went from immigrant to incarnate in two months. I think if done properly, it can encourage people to branch out and play other content as time passes. If you don't use the wait function and actually go out doing dungeons, you'll probably visit most of the island by the end. People focusing down quest lines can just wait through the time, people roleplaying can explore other content or fill in the time doing generated radiant quests between bigger missions. Anyways, enough stalling. Falco says someone in the bar has been picking fights in Raven Rock. The guy's wife is outside, she asks we don't hurt her husband. He attacks us, gets tired out, and begs us to kill him. I don't. I'm not as heartless as you might think, but I am obligated to say I was compensated well for not killing him. Unlike Falco, Carnius is still willing to pay if you kill the old man. So, turns out we dug too deep and have discovered a barrow. We need to consult some local expert about some impenetrable ice entombing one of the bodies. The, uh... The expert doesn't really care for us until an Imperial assassin attacks. For our help, he pays us with an ancient Dornic pickaxe and asks we bring a sample of what he calls Stalrim back to him. We do, and he offers to create us armor and weapons from the material. I kind of already have a pair of legendary blades and the Royal Guard armor, but this is a nice opportunity to allow players who are playing Blood Moon independent of the main quest and tribunal to keep up with the escalation and difficulty. Carnius' decided quest is a lot less complicated, instructing us to go and kill the Stalrim crafter and his apprentices, and take his Nordic pickaxe. This doesn't mean you lose access to Stalrim weapons and armor, but as no one else is experienced in working with the material, it will take twice as much to get the items. This unfortunate consequence is unavoidable and seems like an unfair punishment. Really, the whole concept kind of flops as we're being presented with access to Stalrim very late in the expansion. Ideally, you'd want players finding and collecting Stalrim as they clear dungeons from the start. 
But I'm sure many people just sat confused at this random material they couldn't collect because they weren't smart enough to give the player the pickaxe earlier. Our next task is to deliver a report to Carnius, and I only have five hours to do it. And if I fail, I'm permanently expelled from the East Empire Company. What we have here is an interesting quest idea and absolutely no way of integrating it into the storyline in a way that makes sense. What about this enterprise requires a report be time sensitive? I divine intervention back to the fort, but oh no, Carnius is out, uh, walking along the beach, and his new assistant activates a trap that's supposed to slow me down if I hadn't absorbed the effect. It's a clever use of magical mechanics. Carnius is in one of three random locations. This is a fun little quest, but again, it doesn't make sense, unless the intended message is that Falco's working with Carnius to cut me out of my stock option. Carnius' side of the quest is interesting as it involves staging the murder of a messenger from Falco to prevent his critical message from getting out. This is the return of Heraldar, who is confirmed to have used a recall ring to escape us last time we encountered him. Anyways, Heraldar can manipulate wolves to make it look like the messenger was killed by nature. In turn, Heraldo gives us a note from Carnius, who requests we now eliminate Heraldar. I wonder if all this double-crossing is going to go anywhere. Go to X, kill Y, Spriggans, find Z roots, and poison them. If I sound exacerbated, it's because it's like the fifth time I've had to run to the bottom of the mine and then back up to the top again. Next, we need to hire some guards for Raven Rock. This involves asking everyone in town. I find three volunteers, and after a few days, they're equipped. I actually appreciate this quest more than Spriggan Quest, despite spending less time talking about it, because A, I don't have to go to the back of the mine again, and B, it involves interacting with the people of the settlement. There are lots of opportunities to do this, like when we figured out if we wanted a trader or a smithy, and it's interesting to see how the characters have changed with time. A for Flaccus says that mining isn't really for him, so he's willing to try out being a guard. Garnus Uvalin says that his ambitious attitude has gotten him this far, and he figures it can get him farther. Gracian Corellius says that he was talking tough about how someone needs to protect Ravenrock and is willing to take responsibility. These characters progress, change, and maybe it says a lot about how NPCs were generally static in Morrowind more than it has a mark of quality for Blood Moon, but it's the little things like that that elevate what would otherwise be in a mundane questline. After a few days, Falco says someone's trying to kill him and asks us to protect him. Not long later, a group of Nords attack. While we prevented the assassination attempt, Umbra was assigned to take down Falco. We take position in a tower and draw a bow, signaling a mercenary to run up and distract the guards. Then we use the special arrow to kill Falco. Days after that, Falco says Carnius has received silver weapons, likely due to the recent werewolf threat, but isn't delivering them to us. Upon our return from the fort, the settlement has apparently been attacked by the Skull and the forces hold up in the mine. This is in line with the Skull, who have complained of Imperial influence on the island, but it turns out that none of them are recognizable from our encounters as we clear out the mine. We find a note indicating they are actually mercenaries. Falco has us take this information to Carnius, who confesses and attacks us. Carnius, a businessman, has more health than Dagothur. That's all I have to say on that. We kill him in self-defense, and Falco promotes us to Factor of Raven Rock, leaving us in charge of the operation. In Umbra's case, we're tasked with supplying a merc group with weapons to appear as Skull. We head out to deliver the goods and pass out the equipment, only for them to betray us and attack us. Carnius wants us out of the way. Unfortunately for him, Umbra is a lot tougher than six mercs. We return, and Carnius, surprised to see us, fights us. That's it for differences. We get made Factor of Raven Rock, and it's all the same from here. Now in most games, this is where it ends, but we have one whole quest as leader, and it's literally just deciding where we want a house to be built. A house we aren't going to live out of because this is the last piece of gameplay I played for this series. Looking back, the way I describe the quest line makes it sound boring. Raising a colony from nothing in a pre-scripted fashion sounds boring compared to the dynamic and radiant settlement system of Fallout 4, but on the other hand, the pre-built quest line and time investment involved, including an actual stock investment that ranges in value based on how you've managed the colony, makes Raven Rock far more interesting than any of the settlements I could not possibly name for you from Fallout 4. I also like that in these two pieces of DLC that are steeped in prophecy and divine metaphysics, a long questline exists where you set aside the time to participate in an entrepreneurial venture in a land that everybody else dismissed. I suspect the same way I found the royal palace quests and tribunal more interesting than the temple quests is indicative of the sort of person I am. It also says something about the main quest of Morrowind. The primary quest lines of tribunal and blood moon pertain very little to the remainder of the content in their expansion. Your status in Raven Rock, or how much work you've done for Hellseth, ultimately has no bearing on the world compared to the Nereverine story. 
Most of the minor factions and storylines in Morrowind play some part in its Gwen quest line, perhaps a small part, but a part nonetheless. You could say there simply isn't enough material in Tribunal or Blood Moon for this to be the case, and I'd have to concede. Bethesda was more concerned on being a launch title for the seventh console generation than going all out on post-launch Morrowind content. For instance, there is an entire faction of raiders living in Solstheim that I didn't mention, and I know some people might have an issue with me not mentioning some of the more notable quests from Blood Moon, such as the Thirsk Mead Hall. Some of this content was the work of one Emil Pagliarulo, who got his start at Bethesda with this expansion working on side quests. Side quests that include a reference to Timmy and the Well, Beowulf, and Cocaine Santa. Still, we're nearing the end of the conclusion of this series here, so I have to give some credit. Like Tribunal, Blood Moon features a great deal of unique voice acting. The ambition of having multiple paths, even if those multiple paths are centered around the same scripted events just in reverse, is still impressive. And so ends part se- oh shit, I forgot about the werewolves. Right. Werewolves get an additional quest for being cured of their disease. It starts with a rumor located near the dock at Fort Frostmoth, a common travel point on the island, so you're guaranteed to run into it. The note simply mentions that witches have come to Solstheim and have been spotted at the Altar of Thrond. Sure enough, they have. A raven speaks with you offering to help cure your lycanthropy, which you can refuse. She'll set you on the right path, and even if you kill her, she'll drop a note detailing the ritual. First, we need to get a flower which grows atop the highest peak on the island. Then we find some ripened belladonna berries. Finally, we have to sacrifice an innocent Nord and take out her heart, cast a spell, and put the heart back in. The Nord will transform into a werewolf that, when killed, marks the end of our curse. From then on, the player's only option to be a werewolf will be Hircine's ring, which we recovered from Tharsten. However, because werewolves are weaker than high-level players, this is ultimately a novelty for role players and really not much else. So we're finally here. This has been a long time coming, both in runtime for first time viewers and for the subscribers who've stuck it out since the beginning of the first parts. Originally this was going to be my break, a quick little series on a game I know and love well and then I would get back to trashing console games. I didn't anticipate how much of a time investment this project would become. What's funny is that at points it started to sound like I didn't like the game. That's because it's a lot easier to write negativity than positivity, and negativity sells. That's the sad fact of what I do. Is Morrowind patrician tier? Well yeah, I mean what have we been doing if it wasn't? If Bethesda had made a true sequel to Morrowind, improving on the formula instead of stripping components away to broaden appeal, then I probably wouldn't think so. In that timeline, Morrowind would have been a unique little oddity that paved the way to a generation of greater games. Instead, Morrowind is best symbolized by a Dwemer Ruin, a sign of something that was once great that ultimately usurped itself, paving the way for lesser successors to come along and wonder, in between bouts of bashing each other over the head with their clubs, just what it was that made them so special, and why did they go away? The answer is more complicated than simply saying that Bethesda got greedy, that Bethesda kneecapped their vision for the sake of achieving the highest valuation possible for a future sale. When you hear Todd Howard talk about Morrowind, it means something special to him. That's because Bethesda came very close to the edge when making the game. Howard is a driven person, his persistence is what got him a job at Bethesda, his desire to improve the system made him a leader. He stole Julian Le Fay's series and transformed it into one of the most recognizable gaming franchises. And he probably did it because he didn't want the employees under him to ever have to deal with what Bethesda of the late 90s and early aughts had to deal with. In a sense, a compromised vision is preferable to sustained crunch periods and the looming threat of failure leading to unemployment. I spent over a year working 70 to 100 hours a week, gained about 50 pounds, and had turned into an obnoxious vitamin D deficient zombie. My health and sanity were failing. I became someone I didn't like. Douglas Goodall. We've been through, again, a lot of people here have done it for a long time, so we've been through every type of crunch uh, you can imagine, and yeah. long ago, some ones that were very, very difficult um, for a lot of us, you know, personally and your time and your health and things like that. So let's take this section by section. Morrowind's combat is clunky and awkward, but really, only in the beginning. It relays a true sense of progression to go from struggling to fight wildlife to one-shotting powerful foes on the hardest difficulty. But from an action perspective, it leaves a lot to be desired. 
This isn't a problem of mechanics, it's a problem of tuning. Tune the formula to make hits just a little more frequent. Each percentage more frequency is 10 critics who wouldn't have noticed the system in the first place. Morrowind's stealth is similarly badly tuned. Pickpocket's impossible, stealth difficult, and the one thing that worked about it, real-time lockpicking, was replaced with a minigame. Morrowind's magic system is amazing, as long as you're prepared to spend a lot of money training to unlock its full potential. Yet another problem that a variable in an equation being properly tuned might fix. Not having the time and resources to finish tuning the game is the source of all its faults. Are the vampires and abolitionists underwhelming? Well, there's not enough time to finish the content. Not enough options in the dialogue? Well, the writer had too much other work to finish before he could flesh that out. Is Red Mountain a mess? That's a cost-benefit analysis. How many players are even going to get that far? Better to nail the lead-in and have players interested in buying Oblivion than nail the conclusion and be a dead company. It's honestly amazing given the circumstances that we got a game as intricately woven as Morrowind. Every single questline has intersections and connections to other questlines, at least at the surface level. I've given plenty of examples in this video. Even the mechanics are woven together. Strength and endurance may be the hallmarks of a warrior, but then agility is important to hit stuff, and willpower helps with stamina management, and personality is important once you get back to town. And then suddenly players are growing and developing themselves in ways they didn't originally anticipate because maybe they want to get better with a new weapon, or use a new mechanic they originally thought they wouldn't like. I really don't have to explain this because it's the series central mechanical conceit, the concept that your character isn't being ramrodded into a preset class, but rather developing in a freeform way. The game also presents a unique aesthetic. There's a reason my profile picture has always been a Morrowind character, even an abstract version. Something about the early 3D low polygon style of characters, it's not a beautiful aesthetic, it's rustic, reflecting the rough world of Vardenfell. It's why I'm always bothered to see people using mods that turn characters into dolls. Actually, no, that's a pretty good metaphor for standing down the edges of Morrowind. Vardenfell has some pretty striking scenery as well. Mushroom trees are the obvious go-to. It would have been nice to see more lava in the open world, since everywhere it shows up looks really nice, but they couldn't really do angled liquid surfaces yet, so no flowing lava foyadas. They probably also decided against it since the foyadas tend to be central pathways around the island. Maybe at the start of the third act, you could have had Red Mountain have a minor eruption and filled the Foyadas again, making a sudden navigation obstacle for the player. Speaking of things Bethesda couldn't do yet, model levels of detail. Now, of any game, Morrowind was the game to do view distance fog, since most regions have a decent excuse for low visibility, like foggy shorelines and ashy wastelands. But it's hard to appreciate Red Mountain outside of the imagination when you can't see it. While the overworld adventure and sights that can be seen can be impressive, there's a lot left to be desired once you start to notice the repetition in interior design. Now, I'm not going to be a pleb and leave it at that. Morrowind's interiors are made up of many parts like Lego pieces that can be put together in a variety of combinations. The system was created like this because originally Morrowind was going to procedurally generate much of its world, but then Howard saw the workflow potential of having an easy system for designers to make content in. It's literally so easy a child me could use the complimentary construction set that came on a disc with the game to make a dungeon or a house. Except for the scripter, that abomination can suck off a shotgun. Morrowind's storytelling is fascinating. It's a shame that the possibilities of a purely text-based system were squandered due, once again, to the nature of the game's development. What's interesting is you can very easily tell the divisions and writing responsibilities based on what quest you're playing. You can even tell if it's Rolston, Goodall, Nelson, or Howard writing the quest based on how they approached certain ideas. For instance, Rolston experimented heavily with using greetings and goodbyes in the Imperial Cult questline, and would also dramatically page break dialogue using the continue function. Goodall's quests were much simpler from a script perspective, but would intertwine characters and plots, which is one of the perks of having one guy writing so many questlines. Since Goodall was the writer of the Thieves, Fighters Guild, House Halau, Morag Tong, and more, he could easily intersect all of them with a character like Orvis Dren. That would also be possible if each faction had a different writer provided there was a lead writer making those connections, something missing from the later games. That's why later factions felt like independent puzzle pieces rather than a connected pattern of storylines. Todd Howard was responsible for finishing the Imperial Legion. It suffers the most from that faction distinction problem as the Imperial forts feel like isolated sections of the world. There is the odd crossover where you can tell Goodall made the quest, like the one to investigate the Ebony Smuggler from the Ahasuelu questline. 
but otherwise I've already detailed the oddities of Howard's writing. What I haven't mentioned is that Howard is also responsible for the tutorial. That thing I praised heavily? Yeah, Todd Howard is the man behind it. I'm not sure if his part in that ends when you walk out the door of the census office or if he is also responsible for the broader sight and Ian tutorial. Douglas Goodall did say that Mark Nelson was responsible for Fargoth. Mark Nelson is also responsible for the Daedra and Vampire quests. He used the least dialogue and traditional writing and used the most voice acting for his quests. Bill Burkham was apparently a tester who also did one of the better Fighters Guild quests. And speaking of old interviews, let's go over some promotional material. One of the reasons Mike the Liar jokes about multiplayer is the inordinate number of times Bethesda got asked if Morrowind was going to be multiplayer. When discussing guilds, Rolston says the Dark Brotherhood was going to be joinable when actually quite the opposite ended up being the case. Actually, Rolston talks a pretty big game in this interview, despite the fact that the 10 to 15 promised factions hadn't even been written yet, given that their writer started at Bethesda six months after the interview. He also details a group of quests called the Grand Council Resolution Quests, which sound like an awesome idea and are nowhere to be seen in the finished product. The area and even the NPCs for such an idea are all present in Ebenhart, but it never got made, likely because it was far too ambitious for what they were capable of. In another interview, he states that they are going to reveal the origin story of vampires, which wasn't true. Now, in fairness, Bethesda at the time were trying to sell the game to both gamers and purse holders, so it's not really that unreasonable for them to sell a big game. Howard also spends a lot of time explaining how combat was going to work, which is all present in the game. The chop slash thrust system is in the game, and the reason I didn't talk about it is that it's completely and utterly irrelevant due to one factor they apparently didn't anticipate that there was going to be an objectively best category for each weapon. There was even an option patched in to just use the best option for every swing. What's funny is that this isn't a bad idea. It works for Mordhau. They just decided it wasn't worth developing and dropped it. There's also this picture which floated around every promotional article. Let's just take a second to admire this. First, Magica is called Spell Points and it has a green bar while Fatigue is blue. Player name is in the game at all times, naturally. Top right says the spell name as well as showing the icon. At least you can tell that's a picture of a guy walking on water. Bottom left says the cell name and has an auto map which isn't accurate to the area and actually gets reused in other screenshots. Bottom right is the inventory, which besides some quality passes is actually pretty much the same as in the release version. And the dialogue window. They certainly didn't advertise how much reading there was going to be. Services and Persuasion are actually tabs in the release version, they're just more subdued. Shulky Ashin Bobby is an NPC in the release version, and they are indeed a merchant in Nisus, although they didn't keep their gender. I'm not sure what building this is, it doesn't look like anything in the game. I mean, barring the actual merchant is a street vendor, this interior is way more complex than the adobe structures in the base game. Very interesting. Overall, while the interviews are interesting and provided some insight on the development process, Howard and Rolston tended to keep their cards close to their chest when asked questions. They did expose on occasion that they were promising ahead of their development, but I wouldn't say there were outright lies and deceptions in Morrowind's marketing. Is Vivek visually much more complex in the promotional material? Yeah, and I've already explained why the original vision of Vivek wouldn't have worked back then. Morrowind even had a six-month delay. It was originally supposed to be released in the winter of 2001, but got delayed to May of 2002, with Tribunal coming in November of 2002 and Blood Moon in June of 2003, and finally the Xbox Game of the Year edition in October of 2003. Tribunal and Blood Moon are interesting creatures in their own right. They represent a Bethesda still following the schema of Morrowind, but having learned lessons from the original game. They also feature some experimentation for ideas that would become part of the core design of Oblivion. But for reasons I'll explain when you're older, they learned the wrong lessons. So we've reached the end of this video. There's only one thing left to do. Near the start of the game, we found some scrolls called Icarian Flight that will throw you across the map. I figure it's fitting we step off the dock we helped to build and leap off into the horizon for a new adventure. This has been a long project, so forgive me for adding this little personal section at the end. For everyone who made it here, here's your reward. If you want, you can subscribe. 
This video isn't going to be standard on this channel. In fact, I'm not even entirely sure I'll never do another project as long as or in depth as this video. This really was a product of passion. I want to thank some folks. First, I want to thank Bethesda, specifically everyone who had a hand in making the game I spent so long covering. Thank you. I know for some of you there was a point where the process was difficult. I can only hope you enjoyed making the game as much as I and many others have enjoyed our time with it. A big thank you goes to the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages. Seriously, if all I had was Elder Scrolls fandom, I probably wouldn't have been able to finish the video. I cannot understate how much of a gold standard the UESP should be for game wikis. Thanks also go out to the guys working on the OpenMW project. Even if it straddles the line of adding convenience features, you guys are doing good work. If you are curious, I was using version 43. I think they're on 46 now. The software plotter was crucial to structuring the series out. Go check it out if you do any kind of creative writing work. I would recommend it. Finally, I want to thank the Elder Scrolls community. Some of you guys, anyways. Some of you have got terrible taste. From the hardworking modders, the people who compile information in easy formats, the people who write an essay's worth of material and lore conversations that are considered casual, and the artists who create beautiful art rendering the world, reimagining the music, and making great memes. Seriously, if any fanbase deserves to be catered to, and deserves a true sequel, it's the Morrowind fandom. I hope my video has been a worthwhile addition to the community. I suppose a final question comes up, is this my final playthrough of Morrowind? At this point, I may have finally drained everything out of the world. My original plans were to continue on to Tamriel Rebuilt, but I decided I would probably be too harsh on those guys. It's an ambitious project, and I'm looking forward to its final release in 2121. Then I was going to cover the Dragonborn DLC, and go on to Skywind eventually, but no. You'll have to wait until the day I cover Skyrim for that. I wish the Skywind devs luck with their project. Like a lot of luck. Seriously, finish the fucking thing before the Microsoft acquisition finalizes and you get a C and D. I also wanted to talk about the Red Year, how it felt like an angry writer trying to get revenge on the evil xenophobic Dunmer. And of all the Telvanni to bring back, why did Bethesda choose Master Neloth? I know Divith Fear is controversial, but Master Arion was literally the perfect candidate. Neloth isn't leaving Vardenfell just because the island exploded. And I was going to cover the Morrowind DLC for ESO, but that would require playing ESO, and I'm not thrilled at the prospect. Alright. Silence. I'm out of things to say, so I guess it's credits time. The footage you're seeing was some videos I recorded of character resolutions I wanted to include but failed to finish, so they fit in here. Firstly, music. Jeremy Soule's Morrowind soundtrack was of course used. I also used the Oblivion soundtrack during the Tribunal section and the Dragonborn soundtrack during the Blood Moon section. I used the song Escadian Idol from ESO just to make a point and two songs from Skywind, their rendition of Nerevar Rising and a song titled Zaffir Bell Bay. I also used a couple Young Scrolls tracks as well as the song Dagathar Fanfiction. On to art, yeah, I'll be honest, I just raided my Morrowind meme folder, I have no clue who made a bunch of this stuff. I guess if you want to take credit for something, contact me and I'll post it in the description. Not that anybody will read it, anyways. I do know this map of Daedric Shrines was made by someone named Stuperstar. The animation of Yagrim Begarn and Divith Fear is titled Heart, and it's by Zilconum. There's also going to be a bulk of archive links in the description. These all go to the interviews and articles I used for this video. They aren't in any order of appearance, but they are titled. I only take sourcing half seriously, and I started doing that much halfway through this project. Death awaits. I have... 